In the heart of Central Asia lies the ancient city of Samarkand, Uzbekistan. Landmarked along the Silk Road, the spirit of the past still echoes through its ancient buildings and monuments. But today, modern-day warriors from all corners of the globe descend on this historical place, each vying for four of the most coveted titles in chess. And a handshake, Magnus Carlsen gets the double. Before the calendar's turn, the year closes out with six days of intense battles. He flagged! Brilliant strategies and unparalleled excitement. He's blundered! Magnus has made a new queen and now it's a huge turnaround. Will the experienced prevail? Or will a rising star defy expectations? Let the games begin. This is the 2023 FIDE World Rapid and Blitz Championship, and it starts now. We return to Samarkand, Uzbekistan, home of day one of the World Blitz Championship. You see the city in all of its glory, the ancient city of Samarkand, a pivotal spot along the Silk Road. The point of trade amongst many different cultures are in Samarkand for the World Blitz Championship. Yesterday, we crowned winners in the World Rapid Championship and the Women's World Rapid Championship. Congratulations are in order to Magnus Carlsen and Anastasia Bondra, who will undoubtedly love this city for many years to come. I'm Robert Hess. Alongside me is Grandmaster Peter Lecco. Peter, yesterday we crowned champions at Rapid. Today, we start anew. It's the Blitz. Yeah, hello, Robert. Hello, everyone. Super excited to be following another Blitz action. But yes, yesterday we crowned two champions and it was a fantastic spectacle. It was indeed, and there's only more spectacle to come as we start the Blitz today. So let's remind everybody what's at stake as we set new terms and regulations because this is a different format. It's a, everyone has a new chance and there are a lot of money, a lot of dollars at stake in this event with four world championship titles on the line. There's the Rapid for the Open and the Women's. We saw those titles go to Magnus and Anastasia. And in the Blitz, we will see other champions or potentially repeat customers if Magnus and Anastasia can get the double. And as we've been talking about Magnus Carlsen, much congratulations are in order for him as the World Rapid Champion. He took down the field. He had a little bit of room to spare. A draw in the last game secured his a first place result as Vladimir Fedoseyev took an early draw himself and the women's was much more dramatic. Uh, we saw Humpy Kaneru take on Anastasia Bodnaruk and it was Anastasia who outlasted her opponent winning on time in what was a quite a messy game. So Peter, we have to again shout out these players. They did such an excellent job in the rapid, but it's almost like that was a whole year ago as we approach the new year because today it's a completely new event they're going to have to forget about yesterday's affairs. Yes, uh, that's one of the key issues. I believe that uh, the reason why Magnus keeps on delivering the double, because uh, once he wins the rapid, he's so comfortable. Yeah, he feels that yeah, everything is going his way. So it's going to be very interesting to see who might be able to challenge him in the blitz section. Uh, but uh, looking back uh, yesterday and the uh, last couple of days, Magnus outclassed the field. And from Anastasia, I feel like she outfought the field. Yeah, so it was very interesting. A big contrast between the two different uh, sections. It was a hard fight indeed, and it was a long battle for Anastasia. She made it through, and we are going to get a different format for the World Blitz. So for those of you expecting these slower paced games with time uh, to build your clock with 10 seconds per move, none of that here in the World Blitz because while the women's section has 17 rounds, the Open will be 21 rounds. It's a marathon and a sprint at the same time because each and every game is three minutes with a two second bonus with every move made. Uh, Peter, how do you sort of contain yourself in this format when there are so many games happening each day? Yes, uh, this has a different dynamic. Uh, also, I think uh, the players are more happy with this because the breaks are shorter. There isn't any game which will get the 10 second bonus and can go on forever. Uh, it will be much more dynamic and uh, 
how do you cope with losses? How do you keep your emotions in check? Those are the big challenges, also a part of the big struggle over the board. And normally we tell people to slow down, to think more. Here, you have to speed up, think less, use your intuition. So today, December 29th, is day one of the World Blitz Championship. And the whole tournament does not finish today. We will see the first nine rounds of the Women's Blitz Championship and the first 12 rounds of the Open. Tomorrow, uh, the events will be decided in round 17 for the women and 21 rounds in the Open. So, uh, Peter, there's no rest for the weary. Each and every game has an impact but the good news when you're playing 17 or 21 games is there is time to play catch up. Unlike in the rapid, if you lose your first two games, you might feel out of it. Even if you lose your first two in the blitz, you can still come back. Exactly. I'm also so happy to see 21 runs in the open section because there are so many incredible players. The more runs, the more clashes, <laughs> and uh, that's more action for us. We are treated, we are delighted, and we know some of our clashes to start because the pairings, they're out, the players, it's one of those rounds that they can actually prepare for if they saw their opponents in advance. And we see some of the matchups on screen here. Lea Garifulina, who was very close to joining that tie for first, had she beaten Valentina Gudina in the final round. She plays Lei Ting Jade, the number one seed. We have Ju Wen Jun taking on uh, a lower rated opponent in Pecheva, but these ratings, Peter, they can't always be trusted. Absolutely not. Yeah, these are very tricky uh, situation. The players might have not played enough uh, Blitz games to really reflect their strengths. You shouldn't be relaxing. Anyone playing in this field is already very strong. And if I'm not mistaken, on board six here, we have Elvira Berend, who's been uh, one of the best female players for a very long time. So there is potential for upsets. Sometimes you we focus on the youngsters, the teenagers who haven't quite been able to obtain their best rating in these quicker time patrols, but there also are the veterans who at any moment they can strike. Yeah, actually surprisingly to many who would assume that, yeah, veterans, older people have trouble playing Blitz. No, it's often exactly the opposite that then they don't have those dots, they just rely on their intuition, their big knowledge, and just play absolutely freely. Now, one should never underestimate anyone. And we see this matchup here that looks like Jan Nepomnesi on screen here, getting ready for the first game. Definitely not going to underestimate his opponent in Alexander Rachmanov. And you see Magnus Carlsen will be on board one. No surprise there. Taking on Sergei Gregorians. And of all these matchups, I see Dennis Maknov, who is playing Fabiano Caruana. Dennis is like 3,000 on chess.com. So some of their over-the-board blitz ratings haven't caught up with their online ratings because there isn't as much access to over-the-board blitz events. But Gregorians, Peter, I wanted to single him out because he played such a great event in the rapid he was playing all of the top guys so magnus that will not be a walk in the park for him not at all sergey is a very tough customer i checked out his uh, rapid performance yeah there is the handshake that sergey grigolens there taking a seat with the black pieces faces none other than magnus carson but one catch is there that sergey has the class to adjust to his opponent he had made a 27 73 performance in the rapid Facing one top star after another, finishing, I believe, in plus three uh, stellar performance. It's going to be very interesting. It will. And Magnus Carlsen had a slow start in the rapid. He drew his first game. So it's not like he wins every single game he plays. And for Gregorians, he's battle tested from the rapid, now heading into the Blitz. Also, one of the finer Blitz players in the world. Not afraid of these opponents because he's taken them down before. Yeah, I also remember that uh, I have already commentated in one of uh, these clashes in St. Petersburg 2018 when Sergei Grigorans was just moves away of sealing a victory, but Magnus saved a terrible Queen endgame with a stalemate trick. So there is some history between these two gentlemen. <laughs> and will history repeat itself? That's all the question that will need to be answered. And we will have a ceremonial first move, and Magnus says, eh, choose which move you'd like to play 
and we see it held. I always, I always like this. It's nice to get some of the local community involved, and you see the handshakes with both the players. And Gregorian's almost looked confused. He's always like, wait, I get a handshake too. It's not just the Magnus show here in the World Blitz Championship. And the handshakes and the games have begun. And E4 on the board. Okay, E4, E5, Knight F3. You're going to see a Spanish. Yes, Knight C6, great. Bishop out. And we have, instead of a Berlin, we have some of these classical main lines with Gregorians on the clock, not making a move just yet. Yeah, it's actually Sergei's trademark that he's not rushing. By the way, our uh, board got tricked by the ceremony of first move 1d4, but now it corrects itself. And sometimes that does happen, moves coming quickly all sorts of boards but the action it's uh, just getting underway here in Samarkana. i'm really excited peter i know it's the first game we're just settling in but i love the world blitz championship because you get so many games so many different opponents different styles and honestly a lot of flagging and that can be exciting to watch yes but flagging in a sense that uh, there is a logical flagging because there is the extra two seconds increment so the pieces are not flying all over the place uh, and that's what we love to see and now we have moves being played where Magnus's bishop kicked to the rim of the board. Uh, so first, the light square bishop was kicked around on the queen side. Now the dark square bishop on the king side. But it's one of these pivotal decisions, Peter, where uh, there's a pin on a knight. Do you strike forward with your king side pawns? Because if you do, your king won't have the greatest shelter when it wants a castle. Yes, uh, on one hand, on the other hand, uh, bishop on g3 is often then stuck. Yeah, if uh, black will play the timely g5, bishop g3 it leads to very double edged positions. Black usually retreats the bishop first to b6. I believe also this is what Sergei has done. And just to keep it safe and sound in the event of a strike in the center, and it's Sergei Grigorian's on the clock, and he is spending quite a bit of time here. So he is. Trailing, Peter, that's not a place you want to be against Magnus, especially in a position that hasn't opened up yet. Yes, exactly. On the other hand, he had to make a decision that does he go for G5 for all those complications against Magnus, or is he finding a strategical solution to the problems? And he opts for Bishop E6. It's often the strategy that Magnus himself uses. And so far... Really, not that much tension on the board. I'm um, just keeping an eye on the clocks for both players, making sure that uh, you know everything looks right. Magnus, his position looks very healthy, and the clock situation here, that's what's really getting to me the most, is Sergei. His clock keeps ticking. He's under, uh, over a minute, excuse me, behind Magnus, and that's just not good for him if you're going to try to stabilize and fend him off. Yeah, this is very scary. It's, it's just that after the rapid, it's so difficult to adjust. Yeah, that as you highlighted, the most important thing to speed up, yeah, not to slow down. Wow, okay, this is, this is scary. Going under a minute in an opening phase against Magnus Carlsen. Okay, short castle played. Do you think there's a little bit of hangover from the rapid, Peter? Sometimes it's hard to switch from a slightly longer time control to a shorter one in just a day. Yes, exactly. Also, yesterday we have seen the woman playoff. Yeah, all those dramas and everything. It was connected with the fact that Humpy was somehow, I think, not yet feeling that it's only two second increment. Yeah, she was burning time. She went down to a couple of seconds and then often she ran out of time. And that's what lost her a potential world rapid championship was the time. And it waits for nobody. And it's a something you all have to keep an eye on. And I'm looking at the clocks here, Peter. I mean, really not that much has happened. And yet, Sergei, he keeps ticking lower and lower. Yes, okay. His problem is that uh, when and how do I play g5? And the move king h8 clearly indicates that he wants to go rook g8 and g5. That's uh, one of the ideas, I believe, Paco Vallejo has introduced in one of the World Cups. Uh, very... Very creative idea. It also shows the incredible class of Sergei. Everything is fine. What he's doing, just do it faster. It's exactly like what was happening yesterday with Humpty Canero. He's playing well, but 
perfect can be the enemy of the good because if you're spending too much time finding the perfect moves, you won't have time to spare. So we're still early stages. Not a single piece has been traded, Peter. Not one single pawn, although any moment A takes B5 can happen. Yes. Uh, on the other hand, yeah, Magnus might try to keep the tension on the A file. I don't know exactly why would he. Uh, but uh, also one other question that how white progresses in this position yeah that is he going for a slow knight f1 knight e3 plan is yeah that's what we're gonna see and knight f1 rook g8 on the board and that is hinting at g7 to g5 no knight sacrifices there for white anymore with the rook covering the square so we did see our first trade of the game on the b5 uh, pawn and then I think the knight jumped out to e3 and black just decided to strike with g5 so I can see it on the camera uh, the moves are coming they have to for Sergey Gregorians he can't sit and wait any longer absolutely he, he, he basically his last two moves king h8 rook g8 has also signaled that he's ready to go g5 I'm a little bit worried the moves are not coming in let me make those moves myself yes, g5 bishop to g3 and I see a, I think a queen on d7, the bishop on yeah. c2, really working hard here uh, to get those in. And then there's a black knight on g4. Oh, but yeah, wow. all sorts of captures in the center. I'm very confused. So there's a white pawn on d5. It's, I'm sorry, everybody, hard to catch everything. Hopefully the board catches up. Yes, certainly. Uh, queen d7, bishop c2 makes a lot of sense because white wants to break with d4 and he has to make sure that the e4 pawn is protected. So that makes perfect sense. Yes, on the board. But what happened after that? I think Maybe this case we have to zoom in. We have to zoom in. The Sergei is down to 10 seconds. <laughs> Sergei, he's got to make moves. Apologies, everybody. Just you know, early stages here. Opening round of the blitz. But moves are coming in. The players, well, white wins. I, I think uh, it's uh, one of these. <laughs> everything's coming in at once. Yeah, ED5, 97, yeah. Suddenly, we don't have access to the camera. Magnus breaks in the center with D4. Sergei has no time. It's a very critical situation. E takes D4, Knight takes D4. No way of uh, surviving this for Sergei. Be careful. Black King is in a lot of trouble. Knight G6, Bishop F5, game over. Blunder, oh. Sergei blundered the piece. That's what happens with few seconds on the clock. Yeah, the bishop comes in, hits the queen, hits the knight all at once. So the moves, they flooded in. Uh, seems like the relay is coming in in batches. We apologize, everybody. But Magnus Carlsen will apologize to nobody because he wins game one. He starts his quest to retain his World Blitz championship with a win. And a nicely played game. And I think it was all about the clock, Peter. Sergey did not leave himself enough time. Yeah, and also the smartness of Magnus, yeah, he knows that Sergei is a very classy player and then with this Bishop G5 pinning him, asking uh, asking some annoying questions, uh, that that was too much to handle because the clock was ticking and he, he made some bad decisions finally. For sure, and well, uh, we appreciate everyone's patience. Uh, we are dealing with some technological stuff, so we will take a short break. Magnus Carlsen gets a first win. We will likely be back very shortly so we can catch all of the action. Oh, oh, we do have moves, okay, my apologies. We are not going to break. Uh, you're seeing it live <laughs> live show here. And Peter, in this position, it looks like Fabio Caruana in big trouble with the black pieces. He's trying to establish some kind of blockade, but he's down material. Yes, okay, the good news was that white had to step out of the pin. Now the e4 pawn is hanging. White wants to go e4, e5 himself. You called it. You told me that this Denis Makhnov is a very dangerous player. You know him well. Well, he plays so much on chess.com. He is a speed demon, an absolute beast. And this is one of those positions that can go either way. You see the e4 pawn is targeted. Light square control for black, dark square control for white. And, oh, there's a knight hopping in. An exchange sacrifice for some past pawns. Black's king in worse shape and that healthy pawn chain. Oh, looks good for Dennis. Yeah, Fabi is fighting, but it looks uh, hopeless with those incredible powerful pawns. Oh, this is, you can't stop these pawns. Oh, a rook trade though. Not with two pawns going up there. D7 is the key. And then getting a check, that's it. That's game over. White gets a queen. White wins the game. Dennis Maknev, told you, Peter, he's dangerous. Yes, absolutely. Amazing performance. Beating Fabiano Caruana in the first round. 
Yeah, those those are the blitz sharks. And let's go to the game between Jan Christoph Duda and Lucas Van Forest because that's a tough first round pairing if I've heard one. And look at this material imbalance. It is a bishop and rook versus a queen. The evaluation bar is going up for white. That must mean that there's a pawn break at some point on the king side. If you can get g5 in and go after the black king, there could be some danger there. Yes, in, in a blitz game, I don't believe that you can hold it. I'm not even sure that you can hold it in a classical game. It's just that white has so many dangerous threats. But Lucas is doing well, fighting. I... Oh, just Ooh. at the moment. Curse of the oh. commentators, blunders a rook. Yeah, he was doing well. He puts his rook to attack the knight, but loose pieces drop off. That check wins the rook. So, uh, Peter, happens all the time in blitz. You're playing well, defending well. So many moves. It's tough. You're nervous. And there goes that rook. Yeah, absolutely. So we can jump to Arkemi. I have also another blitz wizard playing against Nikita Petrov and the Epon Queens. And we tune in at just the right moment because the game is over in Artemiev's favor. He did what Magnus Carlsen could not do against Nikita Petrov, a very tough opponent, but one that Artemiev took down. Oh, what? how did... Well, no, I... this, is, this, this is over. This is finished. It's just an absolute demolition. The White King out in the open, losing material. And, oh, look at this. Peter, you've been saying it. Yeah. I always say it. <laughs> Wrong colored bishop with a rook pawn. Exactly. This is a theoretical draw. It's stalemate. Thank you very much. In fact, it ended in a draw immediately. It was very stylish to play A2. Bishop takes A2. And it's stalemate already. Love to see it. And we can see on our screens some of the results on the top boards. Fabiano Caruana is the lone uh, top seed to go down, but he was playing an underrated Denis Makhanov. And here we see Anish Giri with the white pieces. Uh, he gets the win against Dishunju. And if I'm not mistaken, Peter, if Anish Giri wins the World Blitz, it's still somehow not enough for him in the circuit. Is that correct? No, I think that he needs to win. It's not enough for him to get a medal. That's not enough. But if he wins it outright, then I think he can still make it. Okay, appreciate the correction there. So Anish Giri has a lot to play for. And in a 21-game event in Blitz Chess, he can do it. And he would make his way to the candidates. It's a little bit strange that by winning a Blitz event, you make a classical candidates tournament. But so be it at this stage. That is the FIDE circuit. And we see... Uh, that board that looked like it was going to be a draw. So a lot of action happening. Uh, we are trying to right this ship. So Peter and I will take a quick break. But when we return, it's round two of the World Blitz Championship. Do not go anywhere. You will not want to miss this action. See you soon, everybody. We'll be right back. Another one of the VIPs from the Chess Kid National Festival. We have the OG Papa Bear here. I am Danny Wrench, and he's going to be starting a very innovative concept. What do you got? Yeah, I'm going to be facing off against Women's Grandmaster Jennifer Shahadi in our first ever Puzzle B. We've actually been excited about doing this for years, and I think it's going to become something special. So solving puzzles against Jen, let's go. And what Danny doesn't know is that we actually have a new prize. We have a golden Peshka. We've been working on this and the winner gets this Peshka. I wanted to hold that guy. Oh Whoa, God. yeah, it's real gold. What is it's, going it's, on? It's real gold, my friend. Was this in the budget? I don't know. So it's worth a lot. Come find out who wins the very first golden Peshka. Anyone who has played even a small amount of chess, especially online, is familiar with the concept of an opening trap. We've all fallen for one at some point or another. In many cases, a failed opening trap will leave you with a terrible position, but not always. We've compiled 10 opening traps that are not only guaranteed to work, but if your opponent doesn't fall for them exactly, you'll still have a decent position. Number 2. Legal's Mate this opening trap, if your opponent cooperates, can lead to one of the most beautiful and famous checkmates in chess. 
Named after Sire de Legal, it dates back all the way to the 18th century. It occurs in an Italian game, and in this position we play knight c3. Black might play bishop g4, pinning the knight to white's queen, and we can play h3, forcing black to make a decision about the light squared bishop. If they retreat with bishop h5, this allows the brilliant knight takes e5, where a free queen is offered. If black takes the bait and grabs the queen, can you spot the famous mate in two? That's right. Bishop takes f7, king e7, which is forced, knight d5 mate. So, if our opponent does not take the queen bait, is this a dubious position? Not at all. Black's best response is knight takes e5, allowing white to win the light squared bishop with queen takes h5, and after black takes the bishop on c4, white can win the piece right back with a queen check on b5, picking up the knight on the following turn, no matter what black's response is. White is up a pawn with control of the center, a great place to be out of the opening. Of Central Asia lies the ancient city of Samarkand, Uzbekistan. Landmarked along the Silk Road, the spirit of the past still echoes through its ancient buildings and monuments. But today, modern day warriors from all corners of the globe descend on this historical place, 
each vying for four of the most coveted titles in chess. And a handshake, Magnus Carlsen gets the double. Before the calendar's turn, the year closes out with six days of intense battles. He flagged! Brilliant strategies and unparalleled excitement. He's blundered! Magnus has made a new queen and now it's a huge turnaround. Will the experienced prevail? Or will a rising star defy expectations? Let the games begin. This is the 2023 FIDE World Rapid and Blitz Championship, and it starts now. We are back with round number two upcoming in the FIDE World Blitz Championship. This is Samarkand, Uzbekistan, the lovely site, the home of these Rapid and Blitz Championships. It's rich in history, it stands in all its glory, and it is a sight to behold, as is the Blitz Chess we are going to see today. I'm Robert Hess, alongside me is Grandmaster Peter Lecco. Peter, we saw some of the results in round one. Magnus Carlsen gets it done, Fabiano Caruana upset. I put it in quotes because I know Dennis Makhanov, he's 3,000 plus on chess.com and has been for a while. So the over the board ratings don't always catch up with the player's strength. Yes, this is a very good point and it's very nice that you have all the insights. Uh, I will be relying on your information. I'm very excited to see all these young players who have already tons of Blitz experience online and now they are finally also getting the chance to show it over the board. Well, I rely on your style and your fashion. You can rely on my knowledge of chess.com rating. Seems like a fair trade-off, but uh, we see the results. They have trickled in from the open section. So we know that Magnus Carlsen won. We saw that. And then we saw Fabiano Caruana lose his game, but Artemiev, he gets the job done. A draw between Rachmanov and Napomnesi. Now Chistov Duda gets that W against Lucas von Forest. There was a material imbalance and a late slip. But Levon Ronin, he wins the black against Bai Jin Shi. So some of the top players, Peter, they get the job done. But we will see tons of upsets. And I put that again in air quotes because on paper, it's an upset. But in Blitz, anything can happen when strong players play against one another. Yes, exactly. And also in just one single game, anything can happen. The favorites usually, I think, approach every single game with the desire to win that game at all costs by not necessarily underestimating the opponent, but just assuming that it's logical that they're going to win. And then they, they are sometimes in for a very nasty surprise. Like Dmitry Andrekin, it was a nasty surprise. He played Stepan Zilka and lost his game. So uh, Grandmasters are on all these boards over here, and there are going to be some draws, as we see Yu Yangi against his compatriot, uh, Zhang Chongcheng. But otherwise, the top players, by and large, they've done their job. They get the wins uh, with several upsets in between. So it's going to be more action in the open. You see Anish Giri, very importantly, gets the win because Peter, of all the players who are in this tournament, Probably none wants to win more than Anish because it's not just about this world title. Yes, it's about uh, eventually a potential way of qualifying for the candidates through the FIDA circuit. I believe that uh, winning the event uh, is enough for Anish. Uh, we might be waiting for some confirmation, but I also feel that for the top guns who did not uh, succeed so well in the Rapid, it's so important to start well in the blitz section. So Shakli Amamedyalov starts with a win. Alexei Sadana, we haven't heard of him in the rapid section as well. And Alexei Sarana has done so well through the Champions Chess Tour, uh, the Chess.com Global Championship. All these online events have helped him over the board. You've seen him thrive in the European individual championships, in classical chess, in rapid chess, and you know in the team chess. So he's been a great force. And you see Magnus Carlsen, he leads the way with all the players with one point. Familiar names, some probably lesser known names, but I'm gonna shout out Sal Salem Saleh, the amazing player uh, who is a blitz specialist. I mean, it's hard to call anyone specialist when they've also reached nearly 2,700 in classical, but he is known for his prowess in the quicker time controls. Peter, it's hard to pick a single name. Yes, Salem loves uh, Blitz very much. A very good friend of mine. I'm rooting for him. The Rapid didn't go as well. And that's uh, what I have been highlighting, that who was not satisfied with it, Rapid, he will be incredibly determined to make things right and to make this uh, long trip to Samarkand worth it. <laughs> and that's the 
tall task ahead of some of these players. And for Anish Giri, winning the Blitz is enough. For Arjun Aragaisi, it is not. So uh, there was a path to the candidates for either of those two players by getting gold. And for Arjun Aragaisi, it was only the rapid for Nish Giri. If he wins this war blitz, he can make his way through to the candidates. So a lot at stake for him. But a lot of players, they see this as a big opportunity because while Magus Carlsen, he's often the favorite in blitz chess, as we're saying. Individual upsets happen all the time. And we saw that very clearly in the Women's World Blitz, that first round. Those top seeds, they did not have a field day because if you look down on board six and on board four, you see upsets in favor of the lower rated players. And I circled Elvira Barron's name, Peter. She wins the black against Alexandra Goryashina. Yeah, wow, that's, uh, that's a sensational result, a fantastic result for Elvira. And on the other hand, look at this. Bibi Sara, the, the, the winner of the last two World Blitz Championships, starts with a win. She just wants to confirm that, yes, uh, whoever wants to win this uh, World Blitz has to challenge me first. And you see more results. The chess queen, Alexander Kostenyuk, wins with black. But Jennifer Yu, who was really exceptional in the Women's World Rapid, uh, she even tweeted about it. She says, I was hoping not, just not to lose all my games and all my rating. She continues to shine. She beats Humpy Canero with the black pieces. And there are more upsets all across. You see uh, in this event on board 10, Maria Muzichuk loses with the white pieces. On board 9, her sister Anna Muzichuk lost with black. So, I don't know whether to call these upsets because so many of these players are just criminally underrated. But the household names, Peter, they're not winning their games. Yeah, not at all. Okay, it might be also that they need some practice. Yeah, they need a couple of warm-up games uh, before finding the rhythm and then they will be shining. But uh, the start is rough. The start is rough, but it, for the women, 17 rounds. For the Open, 21. There is plenty of time left. Nobody has to uh, lose their mind at this early rounds because players are going to lose. It won't be a surprise if Magnus Carlsen loses a game or two in the early ones. But let's look track back let's go through the history of this event because it's a world championship title at stake and it's not always magnus winning even though he typically uh, is the favorite previous world blitz winners include liam lay in 2013 the vietnamese superstar took home a title in 2014 it was magnus carlson not a surprise to see him there in 2015 the legendary alexander grushuk a three-time world blitz champion 2016 was Sergei Karyakin. He played the World Championship match against Magnus in that year. Magnus Carlsen won in 2017. And it's going to see a familiar face in 2018 as Magnus won again. In 2019, Maxime vacher Legrave takes the World Blitz. I thought he won in 2021, but my memory is failing me, perhaps. Magnus Carlsen uh, took it in 2022. So uh, Magnus, his face is the one that you will see most often as the winner. Uh, but others have been sprinkled in there. Yes, you were absolutely right. Uh, there was a mistake in the graphic because uh, indeed Magnus has won 2019 and uh, Maxim Vachelgab has won in Warsaw 2021. That's correct. Oh, okay. So Maxim, then Magnus and question mark in this year. But we have the matchups in round two. We have Vakidov against Magnus Carlsen. And considering this event is in Uzbekistan, Peter, I think there will be extra eyeballs on that first matchup. For sure. Vakidov was also one of the players who outperformed in the rapid section from the local boys. Uh, because uh, we have been expecting some incredible result from Yakubuya, for example. But he, he didn't really have a successful event. Abdusatulov was not satisfied with his performance. Clearly, he wanted more at home. And uh, Vahidov was the one who outperformed. And I see an Armenian contingent there. Levon Rodin now plays for the US. Uh, he's playing Robert Hovhanesyan, a friend of his, a longtime uh, teammate, and Heik Martirosian on board five. And I see Vadim Zvagensev. So that makes me happy. Uh, Peter, someone from the uh, older generation, but someone with such a unique style, putting his knights on the rim and Sicilians and all sorts of funny business. <laughs> yes, uh, Vadim Zvagensev was a prodigy, a youngster back in uh, 1992. I remember that there was a legendary match between the very young Vadim Zyagintsev and Peter Swidler that who is the best junior player in uh, in their age category back then in Russia. So mm, a lot of history. He has been a fantastic player throughout. 
and we see Daniil Dubov getting the white pieces. I mean, Tabata Bai taking on Yanchis Abduda in the third board. So we just have so many excellent matchups, so many great players, and it continues down the list. Mamajarov is a player you mentioned. He gets the white pieces on board nine against Maxine Chigayev. But look at Anish Giri on board eight. He is playing down. And again, I put that in quotes because he's playing Super Grandmaster, Sanan Shigirov. So it's not like this is a, a playing down. He's not playing someone 300 points lower. He's playing another Super GM. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Sanan Shigirov actually worked for Anish Giri for the mm -hmm. 2020 candidates, I believe, because I catched him in Vaikanze. He was hiding as a second of Anish Giri, but I catch him in the supermarket. I asked him, now, <laughs> what are you doing here? And then Anish appeared and then we all smiled that, okay, it's revealed. Yeah, so you are, uh, you, know, you opened the vault there. I saw Sanon at breakfast actually in that Vikings day. So maybe after you saw him out in the wild, they were able to eat together. And look at these pairings. Pragananda plays Mohamed Muradli. That's a tricky pairing for Prague because Mohamed Muradli, another great blitz player. He plays on chess.com all the time. Pr v Pranav, a great example of that. He is 3,000 plus in blitz and bullet. Really great when there's minimal time. We see handshakes between Magnus Carlsen and Javakir Vakidov. Yeah, all lies on this battle. The local hero, Vakidov facing Magnus Carlsen. I can imagine the excitement there in Samarkand. The people and in all Uzbekistan, I, I believe that the whole country, the whole nation is following this tournament very, very closely. Yes, Jakangir Vakidov, such a strong player, a very important part of their Olympiad uh, gold medal winning team. So for Vakidov, he gets the white pieces, the first move advantage, but it's blitz chest. You just need to keep your nerves more than anything. And Magnus, he looked like he was smiling there. Uh, he's just looking out into the ether. And we see Yanchis Duda. He's met by Amin Tabatabai. I mean, gets the white pieces. Another matchup where I don't really think there's a clear favorite. Yes, Yanchis Duda is higher in classical chess and has had great success in the quicker time controls. But I mean, Tabatabai is also just a blitz beast and gets the white pieces. Yes, for sure, uh, Tabatabai is great, but uh, Yanchis Duda is a monster. I recall that uh, word blitz in uh, 2018 in St. Petersburg where when Magnus was winning, 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 and who was chasing him? Jan Shishtov Duda also winning every single game. A very interesting pick up Now we see Levon Aronian and Robert Hovanesian on the screen. And the games have started. Who knows? No, this is probably the first opening. No, it's not ceremonial move. All right, we have action. Yeah, we have handshakes here. We have the clock started in Magnus against Vakirov. And just the first moves are being played. I see... Uh, a bishop come out from Magnus. So I'm guessing this is in English just by the hand motion. I know we, we can't uh, see exactly the moves on this camera angle, but it's great to see the players coming. Yes, it, indeed it was an early B4 from Vakirov. Peter, you liking what you're seeing from the opening? Yes, I'm liking. I always like bishops and uh, the white bishop is reaching the long diagonal with bishop B2. Queen is seven played. Yes, queen is seven played by Magnus. Knight f3 will follow, yeah, putting some pressure on the e5 pawn. Very important. Well, Knight c6. You told me you love bishops, but do you also love pawns? Because I feel like those double pawns on c5 and c4, those are really ugly. And I wouldn't be too fond of them. d4 was just played by Vakirov. Magnus quickly snaps that up. And we're seeing a trade of knights on d4. And that means those pawns are going to be really bad for the rest of the game. I see the bishop and the queen lined up on the battery. So, Peter, how do you evaluate this? How would you assess it? Who's better? Who would you prefer to, to play with? Well, I'm not an expert in this line, so I'm relying on the players. And if Magnus uh, is blitzing his moves out, probably he believes that black should be fine. But I'm also liking what I'm seeing from Vahidov, that he is kind of keeping up with the pace. He believes in his position. He actually played the move queen e5, a very interesting move. Magnus takes, there is pressure on the c7 pawn. And king to d8, so we are seeing the moves on the board even before the camera. It seems like things are going back and forth with who's winning the race between camera feeds and PGNs. But either way, the black king did just slide over. We saw Magnus place his king on d8 there, protecting the vulnerable c7 pawn. Bishop takes f6, check, g takes f6. We're going to see 
bad pawns across the board here. But I like the tension that black has in C5 because if white takes on B6, and great decision, I would say, by Vakitov not to take there. After A takes B6, the rook activates on its starting square. We often think we need to move our rook to activate it. No, sometimes it can activate in its corner. Yes, I need to figure a way out to slow down the action, yeah, because sometimes, yeah, the, the moves are coming in way too fast. Yeah, it seems like on the camera feed, the move C5 was just played, but oh, we see Levon Ronin, he was pulling up his sleeves, and usually he pulls a rabbit out of a hat. He is a really great player. We'll catch up with Levon in a bit, but for now, we have the game between Magnus and Vakita, the white king on D2. This is a pure end game now, two rooks per side, uh, you know, same color bishops. White does have the better pawn structure now, Peter. So uh, open files for black, better pawns for white. I think that the chances are good for a big fight at this stage. Yeah, it, it looks like uh, things are under control. Uh, Bishop e6, for example, can simply be met by king c3. I don't know if I can already reveal those moves. I'm looking at the camera. Bishop e6. I'm expecting king c3. Okay, so king c3 makes... Per I see think the king is on c3 right now. Yes, and there's a white bishop on d3. And what move did black play now after bishop d3? Oh! Look, hb8. No, cannot be. It's it's impossible that Magnus blunders bishop e4. This is some transmission error. No, 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 it's oh, not. I, I see the board. Wow. The, the, that rook did go to b6. In fact, Vakita went rook to b1, rook a to b1. He missed bishop e4. How, you don't expect Magnus to blunder in this way. And then Magnus goes rook b6. Vakita takes on h7. But he could have won that rook in the corner. And then he would have had an extra exchange with all the winning chances in the world. Instead, he takes on h7. Peter, can that bishop get trapped? Yeah, well, now we are seeing that he's trying to open it, but I'm not liking it. And the reason why Magnus... Wow, but Magnus captured on b1. I wanted to highlight that the reason Magnus played this rook hb8 was to get that rook on b6. He got it, but then he trades. Wow. He, tra he trades on b1, rook to h8, just played it on the camera feed. Uh, and after bishop takes f5, which is you know, probably the only move, isn't white up a pawn here and i see the counterplay we just saw the rook take on h2 the white rook go to g1 uh black has counterplay in terms of activity but white surely is better you're just up a pawn yes on the other hand probably magnus believes that uh, with activity with d6 d5 coming and after c takes d5 king d5 the king is also black's king is close to the king side pawns black's rook is very active king d3 okay white is trying yeah magnus immediately goes active and there is a black king in the center. So it uh, looks like the camera catching up to the board now. D5 was just played on camera feed. King takes D5. And we see the centralization of the black king. And I'm looking at the clock. Great zoom in here. Magnus up almost a minute on time. The position isn't that difficult for white to play. But I think it makes it difficult for white to win when you don't have time to calculate. Yeah, especially this king C3. This is, uh, th this is not a good move. This is a move to make sure that you are not going to end up in any kind of trouble. But with pawn up, I believe that he should have played king e3 and start pushing his king side pawns with g4. Uh, and after king c3, Magnus will have enough. I think he should have enough compensation. And Magnus, he just dips below 1 minute 30 seconds for the first time. We see him fiddling with a piece over there, as players often do. And he just pushes c pawn. I can see uh, that hand gesture and that's a pass pawn of its own so the white king has a lot to deal with and that black king it either can go to stay where it is protecting the pawn or come on over to the king side to win the f pawn at some moment so as we was locked in on the live board the physical board vakitov hand in the air he's got to find a plan yeah it's not easy to activate the rook yeah black's look on h2 is very annoying hitting both pawns yeah finally vakitov decides to activate the rook Ah, okay, sorry. Uh, the, the, the move has been already appeared on the screen, but not on our camera. Peter, you're the last person who owes an apology. I mean, when things are changing every single round, it's very difficult to keep up. So please don't apologize. But we do appreciate everyone's patience with us as we try to keep up and keep everyone fresh with what's going on. So Rook on the seventh rank, Rook D7, white down to five seconds. The pawns are being traded at this stage. So for Vakitov, I think I would just take a draw, just start taking the pawns liquidate 
and simplify because I don't want to blunder with five seconds. Exactly. Yeah, it's a professional relation. Magnus also kind of signals that, yes, I know it's good. What? Okay, oh, he plays with two second? seconds. Okay, oh, but it's a draw. It is still a draw, but he barely got those moves off. And what he's forcing Magnus to do is calculate. There's a black rook that can take a pawn, but that means the rook and the king are on the same rank, and white would be able to force the rooks off with a check along the fifth rank. Now, it still should be a draw because white has an A pawn, but something you not need to calculate. You can't just assume it's a draw. You need to calculate move by move, and as we bring the board up, we can just draw an arrow. Rook takes F5, rook A5 check. The king has to protect the rook, but once those pieces get traded off, the c8 square is where the black king will get back to in time, and that means the king is in the box, and the a-pawn doesn't help. Yeah, and okay, Magnus finally goes for it, says thank you very much. I was suffering in this game. Draw is a good result. A draw is a good result for Magnus Carlsen. Can't win them all. Uh, it was a well-played game from Vakirov. Meanwhile, I saw Artemiev one with black against Brunello. Uh, why don't we hop into maybe the Levon Aronian game? Just because uh, it is a matchup between uh, players from the same country. Now Levon plays for the U.S. But, ooh, we see... Wow, and Levon in trouble. Levon in a lot of trouble. Bishop E1 check coming. The H4 pawn is falling. Yes, h4 has fallen, and it's same colored bishops is very important because if black had a light square bishop instead of a dark square bishop, you wouldn't be able to kick that bishop out of the g3, but it seems that with an extra pawn at the moment, black will be able to convert this. Yes, he should also just walk with his king towards d5 and then break with c5. I think this is what we're going to see. King e6, king d5, c5. Make sure that you get access to some other weaknesses in, yeah, on the board. But a very good decision from Hovhannis Jan to bring his bishop to h4 to make sure that the white king can't help out. And here comes the black king, as you said, c5. That will be a pawn break at any moment now. There it goes. Okay, it seems like they're making moves very quickly. The... Maybe, is this that easy to win if uh, white can set up some kind of fortress or attempt to set up a fortress? I guess, oh, there's a handshake anyway, so yeah. the board what was behind. No, because simply the beastly pawn is falling. Yeah, that's why it's so easy for black. Yeah, just king before king takes b3. The players discussing. What a win for Robert Hovhannisian. Yeah, probably a bittersweet win as he respects Levon as, you know, Everyone in Armenia has idolized Levon, but let's uh, head on over to the Anish Giri game if we can. I think that one is particularly interesting, although it's nearing its conclusion. And as soon as I say that, I think Anish is completely winning and has won. Yeah, he has won. He has won. I think here we still have live action in uh, Cristobal Henriquez's game against Alexei Sarana. Okay, so let's see what's going on here. The White King is making a mad dash for the Queen side. Uh, the black king perfectly safe for now. That white king cannot go back to b1. Don't do that. You get checkmated. I guess you stay in the center. Everything's protected. Yeah, it's uh, it's terrible for white. Yeah, white is pawned down and has uh, all the big dark squares. But it's not so easy to win such positions. Yeah, white is relying on a, a light squared blockade. And the king is now making a mad dash back to the king side. Left and right we go. No checkmates that I see. Black yeah, is and... a pawn ahead, but queen trade still would be a draw because of the opposite color bishops. Yeah, and Black does not have enough time to think about winning plan. He has to keep on moving. And, well, it says zeros. I don't think that lost on time there. Here come the moves right now. And the Black King, it's entering the party on g5. Where is it going to? Queen g2 check forces the queens off. Yes, this is not a theoretical draw. The queen trade happens. What is Alexei relying on? He's, he, he needs to create two, connect, uh, two different pass pawns, but those a7, b6, c5 pawns are not really moving. White's bishop is beautifully blocking them. I don't know if I would allow the black king to come on over to the queen side, so that's why the white king stepped to e3. But if the black king ever goes to d4, let's say, the f5 pawn is vulnerable. So this is a position where, as you said, Peter, you need to create a second pass pawn, but with the bishop on d3, it's covering any hopes of black achieving that. Yeah, but with this time control, of course, it will be always very unpleasant to be defending such endgame, even if it's objectively draw. 
Black has all kinds of winning chances. Oh no, a line king d4, uh -oh. you called it. But here comes the pass pawns. And now we have two separate pass pawns, but perhaps the white king is in the perfect location. But is it? I mean, c4, c3 happened so fast, Peter. Yes, it looks like it's a, it's a win for black. Why is this a draw? I, yeah, that's it. It's king not. King fc3. It's over. I don't think it was a draw anyway. I mean, the white king was a bit overworked on that side of the board. Yeah, well, it was Actually, then a study-like draw if it's a draw because of uh, very little time. You know what it could have been, Peter? If we just go back a move, I think this could be maybe a little instructive, is that the king won the wrong direction. Direction. So like, let's say you get the king to... Um, you play like king e1. And black plays pawn c3, as this game is concluded. And then you play king d1. And only yes. when black plays f3 do you bring your king back to e1 and you chase down that f3 pawn. Wow, okay, yeah, but this is this is kind of insane, yeah? That No, but this also should be... Okay. This was the point. I, I did the wrong move order, but this is what I was aiming for. Yes, okay, just to highlight that. Yeah, it looks like it's game over because you cannot uh, stop both pawns. But then apparently you just step with the... And here the h5 pawn comes handy because usually the setup would be bishop e3 and then c2. But now I can always destruct that bishop uh, with h6. Bishop takes h6 and then king f2, picking up the pawn. But how can you find this with five seconds on the clock? No, I, you know, this configuration is so difficult because it looks like black is just promoting. But that h5 pawn did come in handy. But a win for black, impossible to find this with just seconds on the clock. So that's why the game concluded. So... All right, we see some of the results coming in. It feels like Magnus Carlsen making that draw with Black. He's not going to be displeased. It was just a solid game from Vakitov. We saw Anish Giri win with Black. He's going to be thrilled because he beat his second, or former second, I should say, uh, Sanan Shigirov with Black. So some good results all around. Peter and I are going to head for a quick break. When we return, the third round of action continues in Samarkand, Uzbekistan. This is your World Blitz Championship. Do not go anywhere. More fun to come. Thinking about your New Year's chess solutions but don't know where to start? Don't worry, we've got you covered in your year in chess. This new feature brings you every stat you need. See your legendary streaks, check out your global passport, and tally up those wins. Relive your greatest triumph and all the unforgettable moments that defined your chess journey in 2023. Check it out now at go.chess.com slash year in chess. Look at that chess kid subtle branding sticker on the table. I forgot. Danny played this against me and he won, so I'm yep. sure you're in good hands. Yep. I think it was an accident. I think I, was, <laughs> I, think I blacked out for those first two games. <laughs> I love you, Scrap. I don't know, are we in my prep? Yes, if, you're prep. If we're in my prep, I'm, I'm really scared because you... you He's don't, moving with such confidence. He, he doesn't seem concerned whatsoever. It's like, <laughs> it's like really concerned. It's extremely concerning. I don't understand. This is secret prep. Your prep? My prep? Actually, I think, yeah, this is actually prep. Or maybe I just figured it out. Or maybe it's a bluff. This, um, this is not my prep, actually, but like... So I have an option to take that pun. I want to Wait, Tony, is this legit prep? I have a suggestion, Tony. Why don't you take none of my puns? I just take none of them? Just not just don't take any of my puns. Okay, I won't take any of your puns. Okay. It's a deal's a deal. Um, I'll first them to be taken. Um Wow, this is actually crazy. Well this position? No, actually, yes. Yeah it is. Like actually. 
Okay. I mean, this prep is praying off. Wait a second. Uh -huh. Wait a minute. So yeah, this was what I was fearing when I actually. You guys are played. playing this a little too focused here for me. <laughs> are we supposed to be like more goofy? Supposed to. Kind of D7. Why did I think about that move? Like I mean, this is all prep. I mean, look at this. I watched a video of you today uh -huh. before I was coming here. I'm really sorry. And I it was, was about a Mac that's destroying everybody, yes. right? Were you inspired? And he, yeah, I was inspired. And he hanged the pawn, or not hanged, he sacrificed the pawn in the opening, mm -hmm. first game. Um, and he sacrificed the pawn to have major counterplay. Okay. And I'm inspired by this. So I'm doing exactly what he did. But you're giving me way more than Am I mated? Yes, you are. <laughs> Am I really? <laughs> yes, you are. Oh. Wait a second. Wait. Oh my god. Yes, you I think are. I'm missing my wallet. It's not a good thing, everybody. Yay. <laughs> Yay. Everything wow. worked out. <laughs> <laughs> that was, that was that an was, epic that was, game. Oh, what right. are we doing? We, we, can't, we can't be awkward. We gotta oh, yeah. do this one. There you go. <laughs> We're gonna be one of those like epic, like, oh my gosh. <laughs> That, that was, was so casual. So that, <laughs> that was just like this whole time. I was like, ah, oh, my king is safe.
In the heart of Central Asia lies the ancient city of Samarkand, Uzbekistan. Landmarked along the Silk Road, the spirit of the past still echoes through its ancient buildings and monuments. But today, modern-day warriors from all corners of the globe descend on this historical place, each vying for four of the most coveted titles in chess. And a handshake, Magnus Miss Carlson gets the double. Before four, the calendar's turn, the year closes out with six days of intense battles. He flagged! Brilliant strategies and unparalleled excitement. He's blundered! Magnus has made a new queen and now it's a huge turnaround. Will the experienced prevail? Or will a rising star defy expectations? Let the games begin. This is the 2023 FIDE World Rapid and Blitz Championship, and it starts now. We are back for round three of the World Blitz Championship in Samarkand, Uzbekistan. Uh, the lovely city of Samarkand has been host to the World Rapid and World Blitz Championships. We're on day four in total because our first three days were the World Rapid Championship where Bagus Carlson won the Open and Anastasia Bunner took the Women's Rapid Championship. Now we're in the midst of the Blitz Championship. I'm Robert Hess. Alongside me is Grandmaster Peter Lecco. Peter, only two rounds in, we've seen some of the favorites get cut for half or even full points. Yeah, that's uh, just the nature of Blitz. Yeah, there are, however, 21 rounds, no reason to panic or whatsoever. It's very important not to get affected by any kind of setback like this. Yeah, just keep on doing what you do best. <laughs> keep playing your best chess and then start winning the games. At least online, they call it tilt, and you want to avoid tilting uh, in this kind of event. You lose one game early on, you lose two games early on. It doesn't matter so much time to regain your footing. And we do have the standings after two rounds. Magnus Carlsen's name will not be found in this graphic because he drew his second game. So, Peter, Dennis Makina won his second game as well after beating Fabiana Caruana. Any other names here standing out to you? Well, we are seeing many Blitz specialists like Alexei Salana, also there, and many, many young players, yeah, like uh, Moroda Murcin, there with two out of two, but also I'm very happy to see some older guys like Rajabov there also with two out of two. And we see Maxim Saruk takes on Magnus Carlsen, and Saruk is just 18 years old playing Magnus on the first board. Magnus stays there even though he drew his game, but Artemiev against Cheparinov, Shimonov against Duba, Predke against Report, Anish Giri against Ruslan Panamaryov. That should be a fun one, as well as the Battle of Generations and Murzin against Mabajara, but we will have our eyes on the women's prize, the Women's World Blitz Championship, Ju Wenjun on the top board, and we see Bibisar Asabayeva, the two-time reigning Women's World Blitz Champion, she's black on board two against Mai Narva, whereas Ju and Jun takes on Nomin Erdin, and we are seeing handshakes. Yes, the handshake is on. The game is on as well. E4, C5, Knight F3 played, and let's take a look at Bibisar in action. Yeah, because Bibisar has won consecutive crowns. She's still a teenager, I believe, or has she finally exited her teenage years? Either way, she's a young star, and she has won consecutive World Blitz Championships. And here, with the black pieces, Bishop B5 check with, met with Knight D7. To me, that indicates she wants to fight. Yes, this is her style. This is the spirit. And the good news is that suddenly I feel that there is a sink between our board and the live camera feed. Yes, hurrah. <laughs> we made it. We did it. Thanks for everybody for remaining with us. And I was correct. I quickly looked it up. She is just 19 years old. So imagine having two World Blitz titles to your name by the time you're 19. She can make it three by the end of tomorrow. And Peter, I, I like this style of play uh, from both sides here. The Bishop B5 check, just seeing what your opponent has in store for you. And we will see a strike with D4 in the near future. Yes, also now white is blocking black's uh, queen side. Yeah, it's a very lovely a5 pawn. Black nevertheless might push b5 anyway in order to break free there. Yeah, we are seeing this. And that means black is saddled with an isolated pawn, but gets 
clear activity and compensation on the queen side. And you see the queen take back on b6 and the rerouting of the knight to d2. This is a lovely idea. Get that knight to c4. It also frees up the bishop to develop because b2 will be protected. Yes, and often also white is going for some b3, bishop b2 setup. Uh, that, that's why you also need knight d2 not to run into any kind of tricks with knight takes e4 and then the bishop on g7 hits the rook on a1. A lot of finesse is here. And knight e5, f4 is the tempting move to attack that knight on e5, but then c4 check comes in, so you have to properly assess uh, this continuation because the pawn on d3 will be captured, suddenly some trades will occur. It's going to become more tactical, especially with that king in the queen's path. Yeah, I don't want to touch anything on the king side. I feel like white should aim for this b3, bishop b2, small little development, relying also on the beautiful pawn structure. Okay, hd also makes a lot of sense, guarding the g4 square just in case if white decides to go f4 later on. That's a good move. The f4 is tempting, but you want to correctly play it. And now bishop b7 aiming towards the center. That is a very logical choice. I'm still looking at f4, but I understand c4 check. Uh, can be annoying. And there it is, F4. She has no fear, does my Narva. Yes, but you called it. And I'm very happy to play C4 check and then include C takes D3 on the board, takes, takes, and then the knight can go back to C6, eventually jump to D4. Yeah, Bivisa is playing very nice chess. And it's not like White has done anything wrong. She has rerouted her knight to c4, but her position's a little looser. At some moment, knight h5 could be very dangerous. You're pointing at knight d4 as well to get rid of that light square bishop. Uh, there's just all these juicy dark squares that Black can try and take advantage of. Yes, on the other hand, uh, the reason why White does not really worry about this kind of things because she got her setup. Bishop is on e3, knight on c4, eyeing the b6 square, setting up beautifully this uh, construction with let, let me just highlight it yeah it's uh, black has harmony but white is also happy yeah the bishops are placed quite nicely you have the correct highlights uh, where all of white's pieces feel defended and on safe squares and black is a little bit passive not a single piece past her own third rank uh, that said this can open up at any moment and it's the white king that's going to be in more danger if the position does in fact blow open yeah, kind of clearly Bivisa is trying to break with d6, d5. I would have expected the other knight to go to d7 to guard uh, some other squares on the queen side, but uh, she wants to break out. And d5 is the way for black to break out. And then maybe knight coming to f5 as well. So the knight goes to a5 for white. I like this idea going after the bishop. It's giving an X. I don't think it deserves it. It seems like a perfectly good move, especially in blitz chess. And then d5 is played, striking in the center. Yeah, we can also see that both players are actually playing rather quickly. Yeah, that's why there are also maybe some inaccuracies, but this is just part of the game. It is. And in Blitz Chess, you don't expect perfection. We know that Magnus Carlsen, in his World Rapid Championship run just yesterday, throughout the last few days, he did, in fact, have like 95% accuracy. But in Blitz, that takes a nosedive. It's not about being super accurate. It's often more about being fast. Exactly. I feel that uh, Maynarva is a very nice strategist. The big question, how she will handle the complications when the clock ticks down and Bibisara, with her trademark, uh, creates counter play some mess on the board. And we have some imbalances, right? There is no longer a light square bishop for black, but white should be feeling nice and safe for the moment. The bishop on f3 really does help white, but black's activity is very clear all of a sudden. Yes, this was a nice move, b4, stabilizing, cementing that bishop on c5. Also, black has a weakness on a6. However, black has knight d7, hitting the bishop and opening up the pressure on the knight on c3. Great bishop on g7, and we'll see how this continues. e takes d5, that was not a move I was expecting. And can you, I'm trying to think if you can somehow capture this knight, a uh, bishop, excuse me, on c5. Pawn takes e6 is made by queen takes b4. So I do think that that bishop on c5 can be captured. Yeah, knight takes c5, so probably I have to take back b takes c5. And can I get away with rook takes c5? I'm playing with fire, I know it, Peter, uh, but I'm just yes, trying to take advantage I might, of this. I might have the intermezzo with d4 then. In any case, black captured on d5 first. The bishop is not running away. Black can capture that bishop in any given moment. 
And sometimes you play around the bishop because it's not uh, able to get back to the other side of the board. And we see Baby Sar bring her knight to f6 for that reason. But the a6 pawn, that's a target that white should probably go after. Yes, I, I don't think that uh, black should have kept that bishop alive. This was a strange decision. Somewhat surprising. She probably was worried about her knight on d5. It was pinned, but she could have exited that pin after capturing on c5. But instead, we see the rook come up to a5. And I think she went queen to b8, if I'm not mistaken. She's aiming for the f4 pawn. And white just can now grab the a6 pawn. And she does. Yeah, but black will have come to play with knight e4. Yeah, on the board, bishop takes e4, rook takes e4, the light squares. Yes, white is, has an extra pawn, but let's not rule out any kind of counterplay. Rook c8, bishop h6, rook e2, Wait, now queen b5. Queen b5. Hits both rooks at the same time and down wow. goes d4. This, this kind of reminds me of the game between Badnaruk and Humpy, uh, that game where there was the back rank checkmate. It seemed like one side was in control, but easier to play for the side who previously was down material. Yeah, and uh, this is what I was worried for, for May Narva, that she played a great game, strategically all correct, but with little time on the clock in the tactical Ooh. complications, Bibisara seems to be faster. But she just hesitates. She brought a rook to c2, grabbed it back, and now plays rook c2, and the white queen steps up to f3. That is allowing the pawn to push to d4. That's a great choice. And we just saw it on the camera feed. That's a pass pawn, and it's running up the board. Yeah, and Black is Magnus. winning a pawn. And Magnus Carlsen won his game with the Black Pieces against uh, Maxime uh, Sarok. Excuse me. So good win for Magnus getting back uh, to the winning ways. And here we see that White's blockading the pass pawn. And Black seems to just be in the driver's seat. Yeah, but look at this. Now both players down to the last couple of seconds. Okay. Well, this is going to be anybody's game as both sides have passed pawns. The Black King, nice and safe, with an extra pawn in front of it. Peter, do you think that Black will, in fact, take this game because of that extra pawn? Yes, I, I think so. But objectively, it's not easy. Not easy at all. I think that White needs to blockade that pawn. You can't allow it to push further. So the Queen stepped in front of it. And it looks like both sides are doing well to stop their opponent's passed pawn. And... What is happening here? I see the white queen on a6, and suddenly it's starting to look scary for black. The pawn on f5, Peter, that opens up black's king to some attacks. Yes, exactly. I felt like even maybe the black king should evacuate to h6. All right. We got some trade. At least things clarified. This is a tactical position now. But this does give some winning chances. Uh, the queens, I believe, are just coming off after rook d6, queen b1 check. The queens were swapped on d3. It looks like the black king is already out on e5, while the white king has stepped to f3. So this is a theoretical draw, but sometimes theoretical draws are lost because of the lack of time on the clock. Okay, usually h4, g3 is the... Wow, she blundered the Ooh. rook. It's like a mouse slip. Rook b3, rook takes b3. Oh, no. We saw a mouse slip over the board. I didn't even know that was possible, but she put her rook opposing Black's rook. And usually that works online because your opponent's hovering over a piece. But when you have to physically make the move, rook b3 was just captured. That's game over. That's Bibisara Asabeva continuing her perfection. Yeah, wow. I was highlighting that just intuitively. Okay, push h4, g3, make sure that you stabilize everything on the king side. And then exactly at that moment, uh, me and Narva blunders the rook, rook bc, rook takes bc, and it's game over. Okay, so let's stay on in. Uh, which game have you pulled up? Is this... Well, let let me tell you... Yeah, okay, we still have live action here in Artyamia versus Ivan Chepalinov game. All right, it's another rook end game. Oh, and mistakes are being made, and that's what happens in Blitz. So can Black get this c7 pawn? That's the big question. Wow h, wow, h4 was possible, but this is what happens when players have no time. And this is a theoretical draw, everybody. It's really difficult to prove, especially without proper time. And the white king has gone up to g4. Now the black king is being pushed back. Uh, this is not easy for Cheparino to hold. Not at all. This is, uh, this is a game that can last forever. You just keep on. Okay, white goes for the direct h6 idea. Don't take that pawn. Don't even think about it because the king pawn endgame will be lost. 
So black is hiding behind that h6 pawn and relying on a lot of checks with the rook. And what white will eventually do is give up the h6 pawn. And then it's unfortunate for black in a way that the king is uh, going to be in a bad spot. But the pawn has been captured on h6. If Ceparino holds this, amazing stuff, knowing his theoretical rook endgames. Yes. Well, also there is a tremendous pressure on Artemiev. Yeah, he does not have time. He goes with the flow. He uh, listens to his intuition, which, and then he has given up the h6 pawn immediately. And it looks like actually the white king has gone to f8, and the black rook gave a check, and he blocks with his rook. So Cheparino, you saw that nervous. Uh, it's hard to see because in their wow. resignation. Our loss on time has happened, but there was so much happening. The board, unfortunately, couldn't keep up. And, of course, now we're probably going to get all the moves after it's already done. The rook blocked the check. He hesitated between rook a7 and rook a6. The white pawn went up to f7, and Cheparinov had a lost position. Yeah, because this is the trademark position that if the white pawn reaches the seventh rank, then it's a win. And uh, with few seconds on the clock, poor Cheparinov here has given the wrong check because you should just play the move rook a8, making sure that the white king is not able to reach the eighth rank. Yeah, and after rook e6, of course, yeah, this is correct. Setting up the trick after rook a7, check king f8, and there is no way stopping because after check, white already intercepts the check with the rook move, rook e8, follows by f7, and there is no way stopping that pawn. It looks like we saw also Anish Giri and Ruslan Panamara leaving their board. They drew their game, but this endgame, very instructive, could go into Devretsky's endgame middle. Who am I kidding? It's already in the manual, so go brush up on your endgames. Cheparinov, he tried his best, but without time on the clock. It's like Rook and Bishop versus Rook. You know, With 30 minutes on the clock, you still might lose the game, but you have much greater chances. Without time, you're going to lose this game more, much more often than not. Yes, exactly. It's so easy to lose it with two, three seconds on the clock. And then you might end up in a book and you have to explain everyone, come home. But when I had this position, I only had two seconds left. Not easy to accomplish uh, when you have no time, but a good win for Artemiev, who we know can win this World Blitz Championship. He's so fantastic in the quicks of time. Just, he's got this boa constrictor style. He loves end games, and he can mix it up when he has to. So I'm just looking across the results here. Uh, we saw Volodar Murzin beating Shakriar Mamajarov. Uh, that's a big win for the youngster who proved his might in the rapid. Alexander Predke wins over Richard Report. Daniil Dubov wins the black over Shimonov. And Artemiev took down Cheparinov, as we just saw. So uh, some great results from some of the top players, but also from the youngsters, like Murzin, as we see the standings fly in here. Uh, it looks like we have... Is that Anton Smirnov with 3 out of 3? So first of all, I haven't said that name in like two years. Where have you been, Anton? You're such a strong player. Yeah, he's been someone who's also 3,000 plus on chess.com, and I'm glad to see him back in action. Yeah, very nice. The same applies to Johann Sebastian Christiansen, the Blitz Shark, uh, starting with a perfect three out of three score, taking down David Anton Giharo. And Gukesh, perfect three out of three. Jordan Van Forest, the former Tata Steel champion, and Tamor Rajabov. Uh, he had that tough loss a day ago against Puyedani, which took him out of contention in the Rapid. Here, he's three out of three in the Blitz. So uh, all our, our results are trickling in in the women's world blitz championship we did see bibi Sar win with black on board too but ju and june she keeps her perfect streak alive three to three she wins with white kostenyuk winning with black we also saw anna matnazi beating nino batsiashvili so that's a battle of georgian players although anna matnazi uh, lives in spain and has played for the spanish federation elvira berend her run has come to an end she's won two games with black Peter, maybe she wishes she had black a third time in a row because she lost with white to Gune Mamadzara. Yes. Uh, okay, you can't play all your games with the black pieces. You have to get out of that circle. Uh, but yeah, she had a wonderful start with uh, two consecutive black wins. And we have to appreciate Paulina Shuvalva winning her game. Uh, she won the I Am Not GM Speech as Championship. She's a mainstay of the online circuit. And we see the standings here. Uh, we have some familiar names. With three out of three, I see uh, Divya Deshmukh, very popular player who won the Tata Steel India a Women's Rapid event. Uh, we also see Atusa uh, Porkashian, who now plays for the United States from Iran, uh, streaming now. Uh, and you know, she and Hikaru, very public relationship. Uh, we have 
a Tokyo Nova, but not the one that I was gonna think. Uh, Begum Tokyo Nova. She plays for the United States, but Holkar, three out of three. So some great names at the top of the standings here, including Alexander Kostenyuk. But uh, also uh, we have some lesser known players who are shown that they are a force to be reckoned with. Yeah, on the other hand, we highlighted that, yes, it's a marathon event. It's important to have a good start, but it's not all. All the other players who had a slow start, they will have plenty of time to catch up. And that holds true for players like Katarina Lucknow, who's at two and a half out of three. She's on the right-hand side of the graphic, but plenty of time left to not just catch up, but to take over and dominate in such a long marathon of an event. It's early goings here. So Peter and I will step aside. The players are relaxing as best they can. The next games will continue after this break. So do not go anywhere. We'll be back soon. December, they are back for one more round. Chess GPT. I'm already liking this bot. It's such a big troll. Dead lost. Grandpa Gambit. Decides to get a bit crazy because he sacrifices the queen. Frank and Isla. And everyone's favorite kitty, Mittens. Well, if I go here, it's a fork. If I go here, it's, a, it's another fork. So I guess the only safe move is this. I didn't even see that. Oh, that is so sick. That's actually sick. Oh, sh there is 95. Oh, my. Play them again while you can on chess.com. Hello, Manakam. Manakam. So, this is where the magic happened happens and this is where all the magic has already happened. Yes, that's a good way of putting it. That's my world junior. 87. I, I, 87. It's difficult to tell you how many doors that opened for me and uh, what, uh, what historical moment it was and when I got back. The chess Oscars, very nice, these five of them. Five of them. The Wanderers. Five and there's one on top that is the sixth one. So since he had already got five, they didn't want to give him the same trophy. So they gave him a trophy of a king with the world in his hand. Yes. This is Anand's first ever mention in a newspaper. Oh. So this is his first ever when he was mentioned. V. Anand achieved a national record by winning all the nine rounds to notch That's a right. maximum of nine points in the Sub Junior Championship. But imagine now T.S. Ravi's daughter Rakshita is part of the West Prajanan <laughs> Chess Academy. I mean, it's so beautiful to see how you know life uh, comes around. So, World Rapid Chess and Mind Champion. So, this was uh, NIT gave me this nice. Uh, so why do I get the feeling that Arunal knows all the trophies and why you won better than you remember it, Anand? <laughs> Because I cleaned the red Because it's true, because it's true. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have a favorite? Thank you so much, Anand. I feel this is extra motivation for all the youngsters, this opportunity to actually come here and witness these achievements and spend time with you in this stunning room. Anand Arunal, thank you so much for this.
the heart of Central Asia lies the ancient city of Samarkand, Uzbekistan. Landmarked along the Silk Road, the spirit of the past still echoes through its ancient buildings and monuments. But today, modern-day warriors from all corners of the globe descend on this historical place, each vying for four of the most coveted titles in chess. And a handshake, Magnus Carlsen gets the double. Before the calendar's turn, the year closes out with six days of intense battles. He flagged! Brilliant strategies and unparalleled excitement. He's blundered! Magnus has made a new queen and now it's a huge turnaround. Will the experience prevail? Or will a rising star defy expectations? Let the games begin. This is the 2023 FIDE World Rapid and Blitz Championship, and it starts now. Round four of the World Blitz Championship coming your way from Samarkand, Uzbekistan. You see the sights, they are a delight. We are delighted to bring you coverage of this World Championship Blitz Tournament in Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan, they're the gold medal winners at the latest Olympiad. I'm Robert Hess, alongside me is Grandmaster Peter Leko. Peter, we are just several rounds in thus far. Some players, they're showing that they bring their A game from the Rapid into the Blitz. Other players that we saw at the top of the Rapid tournament, not doing quite as well in the Blitz. It's a different type of show, and it's a different event. Yeah, completely different. Uh, we see that the Blitz specialist immediately adjusting uh, to, to their rhythm. Vladis Vladislav Artemiev, for example, doing extremely well doing Artemiev things. Very happy to be seeing him in top shape. I like how you phrase it, Artemi of things. And well, as we look across the standings, let's start with the Women's World Blitz Championship uh, because there are some familiar names up at the top, but as we're highlighting, some lesser known names as well. So you see Ju and Jun on the left hand side, Alexander Kostenyo, Bibisar Asabieva, and eighth through tenth over there, all three out of three. So uh, these players with perfect scores, including on the right hand side, an 11th, Valentina Gunina. So Peter, it's funny to me because I was looking at the top. Oh, wow. So some surprises there, some familiar faces, but there are those top players still at the perfect score. Exactly. And we have been seeing uh, Bibi Sara, how quickly she is always controlling the action with little time on the clock. She has the perfect vision, perfect overview. She will never make blunders like her opponent did. And when that uh, blunder appears, she's ready to capitalize on it. And I'm not trying to skip over Ju and Ju, but on boards two and three, we have Asabayeva against Gunina, Kostenyuk against Shuvalova. For me, those are some highlight matches of the round uh, because Asabayeva, the two-time defending champion, takes on Valentina Gunina, who could win this event uh, anytime she plays. And Kostenyuk and Shuvalova, these are two players who are very experienced. And Kostenyuk has been the world champion. And for Shuvalova, she's won the I Am Not a GM Speeches Championship, very uh, commonly found in Title Tuesday. She is a frequent guest at some of the highest tournaments. She can beat anyone on any given day. Yeah, perfectly agreed. Very interesting matchups there, very experienced players. I'm also very happy seeing Alexandra Kostenyuk there because she's a force to reckon with. And if she starts winning games, it's not going to be able to stop them, uh, stop her. We saw her win the World Cup in 2021, and she seemed unstoppable. Uh, had not the best showing in the Rapid by her lofty standards, but she's back here in the Blitz. And in the World Blitz Championship in the open section, uh, we have seen Magnus Carlsen have an early draw, but there are other perfect scorers. And Anton Smirnov at the top of the list. Peter and I are both thrilled to see him back in tournament action. We know what he's capable of. He's played in Tata Steel in the Challenger section. He's been over 2,600 feet. Day. He plays online. He's at 3,000 plus. But he's gone quiet for a while. But he is not quiet in the World Blitz. Yeah, now he will be facing Vladislav Artemiev on the top board. It will be very interesting. 
it will be indeed. And we see the players seated behind the standings there, the matchups. Magnus Carlsen, he's on the honorary board one, but he doesn't have a perfect score. And Peter, that's actually a fun matchup as well. He plays the Thunder Holt, Conrad Holt, who did so well at the start of the Rapid. He's also doing well in the Blitz. Darnock, as he was known on ICC and continues to play on Chess.com. But Smirnov versus Artemiev, that's going to be a fun battle. Artemiev is in great shape, Peter, as you said, but Smirnov, he likely will give him a tough test. Yeah, I also feel that it's absolutely correct if we use the moment uh, to jump on some other players to focus on them more, because I'm pretty sure Magnus will be catching up. Uh, but yeah, let's give credit to, to the le other leaders like Anton Smirnov and Vladislav Artemiev. Yeah, I also seeing some incredible matchups there. Uh, on board four, Tsidipov, the Blitz specialist, against the other household name Alexei Sarana. So a lot of action all around. All the way down on board eight, Johan Sebastian Christensen, the Norwegian who has the best score amongst Norwegians in the field. He takes on Gukesh. That's going to be a fun one. So Magnus Carlsen, he gets the eyeballs, he gets the attention, but he's actually not the highest scoring Norwegian at the moment. And that's a fun note that we should mention. Absolutely. Pragnanda also perfect score facing Alexander Pretke, but all lies on Anton Smirnov and Vladislav Artemiev. The and handshake is there is in and Artemiev, he's such uh, a gentleman, always respecting his opponent. You see the handshake, he meant it. He stood up for it a little bit. And we have what seems to be a Spanish game coming our way. And it is looking like, I saw a knight come out to F6, but is, did he include A6 is the big question. That's the big, no, actually it's knight G7. We got fooled. Oh, okay. I have to say, Peter, I love the decision. Yes, uh, getting out of the familiar positions, going for some murky, not exactly entirely sound uh, variation, but it's blitz. It's about surprising the opponent, getting out of familiar waters. Very interesting to follow this. You called it murky on sound. That's my style of chess. So I'm a big <laughs> fan of the opening plate here. It's not going to be theoretical. And right now, the white knight can jump to f5. And I believe uh, that's often played. But wow, he trades on c6. I feel like this is quite accommodating. So Vladimir, uh, Vladislav, excuse me, has had a very successful opening. Yes, the knight on g6 is so much more preferable than the knight on f6 in this structure. We often see that knight from f6 starting the journey, knight g4, knight e5, eventually landing on g6. It landed immediately. And so knight takes c6 was not the most challenging line from Smirnov. And here for black, it's coming up with a plan. I think rook e8, just getting your rook to a semi-open file seems about right. I wouldn't rush this pawn push to d5. I know a lot of people are tempted to play in the center and... Artemia plays in the flank with pawn to a5, gaining a bit of space. Wow. And Anton Smirnov going for queen h5. I feel like uh, Smirnov is playing and treating this position very much like the four knights coach. Uh, and I have played only one time against Anton Smirnov in the Batumi Chess Olympia 2018. And believe it or not, what it was, it was four knights coach. <laughs> so you have memories of him in that opening and look at Artemiev. He hasn't uh, done anything too drastic, but he's playing perfectly. And as you're highlighting F6 in the near future, maybe Knight E5 and there's some Bishop G4 ideas or Knight G4 ideas. So I, I feel like White's pieces are a little bit all over the place and Black centralizes his Knight and goes to E5. I prefer hit Black's position for sure. Yeah, Black has a very flexible structure. Black hasn't determined his pawn structure like typically in the uh, Four Knights coach that we are referring to non-stop with D D7, D5. This is a much more flexible one. Black has this structure that even he can go for endgame and he can hope to try to outplay Black. Yeah, there we go. F7, F5 played. Challenging White's E4 pawn. Eventually after the trade, Black will beautifully develop that bishop from C8. Black has taken over the initiative. And these double pawns on the C-file, they're actually not a bad thing. They're often criticized in endgames, king and pawn endgames in particular, but we're not really in a pure endgame just yet. So many pieces on the board, and the semi-open B-file is favorable for Black. I think bishop d4 right now, Peter. Just put your bishop on d4, hit that knight on c3, maybe even take it to ruin white's pawn structure. 
Yeah, there are many tempting options. Uh, this is the only problem. If you play a Blitz game, it's so much more preferable that you only have one good move. There you have it, your move on the board. It's a great choice because bishop takes d3, pawn takes e4 coming. Bishop d4 earned an exclamation point. I love it. I don't actually see how white deals with all these threats because, as you mentioned, a4, c5, rook b8, all sorts of options available for black. White doesn't have a plan. Yeah, well, I think that uh, good or bad, uh, this bishop probably should be targeted. Another typical way of going knight a4, but that uh, isolates the e4 pawn. And this is, again, the problem we are seeing. That's a horrible weakness. And Artemia, every single move he plays, you can see it. He just picks the piece up, gently places it down. But all of his gentle moves are strong ones. And the advantage is in Black's favor. Uh, just trading the right pieces. And now this knight can hop on over to c4. And it's played. And b2 is just in huge trouble. Yeah. It's, uh, it's the Artemia uh, style. To perfection look at this construction the knight on c4 beautifully blocking the double pawns black is also threatening to enter to the first rank pinning that bishop on the board already i'm looking uh, to my side and i was wondering is this a hundred percent accurate i think it's 99 percent accuracy from black so maybe there was one moment where a move was probably slightly slightly better but everything that artemia has done is with purpose there's a pin along the first rank the rook can double on the b file the knight on c4 it just stops the dark square bishop from developing and covers any sort of e4 e5 pawn push so i think just make left for your king with h6 and then take this pawn on e4 Wow, he just goes after the A pawn, but yes, it's a good call. Just, just in case, open some Luft, create something not to eventually blunder any kind of Rook F8 checkmate. Yeah, H3, H6 are played. Rook F4 on the board. Yeah, yes, now it's on the board. Okay. Eventually hinting at E5 and opening up the fourth rank. What a move. It's funny, though, because E5 is an idea and Black still plays D5 and says, ha, you got me there, and I just push through it, and everything is under control. I just feel like White has no plans whatsoever. It reminds me, very different uh, pieces on the board, but a game that Magnus won against Fedoseyev, where it just felt like White was completely restricted. Yes, very much uh, the same. Also, I, I feel that RTMF style is so similar to Magnus. Yeah, he loves this positional game. His moves have perfect harmony. It's almost like a music uh, watching his games when he gets his structure. What he's lacking, I think, is a little bit opening knowledge. If his openings would be better, he would be clearly a 2760 guy. And he was there when he was younger and then he dropped. But I'm with you. I think sometimes he even plays B3 on the first move and he just plays to get a position where he can outplay his opponent. Here he's done just that. Anton Smirnov had no chance in this game. Uh, this is, I see the feature chats coming in Artemi of doing great. This isn't great. This is perfect. I really believe that this has been an exemplary game that I want to study now because White was just a little bit slow out of the gates and didn't come up with plans. And this is how you get punished. Yeah, and look FF1 will be met by Knight X A3, I believe, that we can just well, use the game. Yeah, he, he resigned. That's it. Peter. Total domination. He went Rook F1 and Knight takes A3 and then said, I don't want any more because the bishop takes the knight. You trade uh, the rook on e1 is hanging, so you don't even get to take that piece. Uh, the a pawn will go to the other side. Uh, this is a beautiful, beautiful game from Artemia. Yeah, fantastic. But the game also ended quite quickly, which probably gives us the chance to join in. For example, let's join in in Magnus's action. I'm pretty sure that that game is still on. Let it me is. pull up that game. Here it is. What do we see? The bar is all the way up because of this exact maneuver. The knight came back to b3 and hits the rook. If the rook moves, the bishop drops. So the c2 pawn looks dangerous, but you're losing material for black. Yes, that's the problem. Yeah, first I was also trying to orientate. What do we see here? But yeah, Magnus is winning material. And do you see that move bishop e5? He could have taken the rook, but that rook is trapped in its place. So only after the bishop retreated did he take the rook. And now his, he has centralized his dark square bishop. Yes, he rerouted it. Uh, the bishop is already in perfect position. I wonder, yeah, Magnus just goes for it, takes, takes, eliminates the c2 pawn and gets, uh, gets an easy technical win. 
I love that transition. Very instructive from Magnus. He had an extra exchange, but there was that annoying pass around C2. Now, instead of being up a rook for a minor piece, he's simply up two pawns, and they're two separate pass pawns. Here's the A pawn going all the way up to A7, then a G4 and H5, and get a nap past H pawn. So domination in terms of the bishop's uh, coordination and perfect game from Magnus. Yeah, and it's, uh, yeah, bishop E1, look at this. Still trying. Rook takes F2 would have been checkmate. <laughs> it's always fun to see players come up with unique tactics. There's a resignation. Magnus Carlsen wins the game, and you see him analyzing with Conrad. I mean, there's a lot of respect to Conrad Holtz. Magnus knows him very well from the online uh, sphere, but Conrad, he couldn't withstand the pressure from Magnus Carlsen today. Yeah, let me pull up Dubov's game. Is there action? Yes, it's still live action there. Daniel Dubov against Alexander Injic, the Serbian chess wizard, but he's in a lot of trouble here. Yes, it looks like white is up. I can't even count two pawns, uh, but it still looks a little bit messy, except if these queens come off, the game would immediately be over, and it looks like the A pawn can't be stopped. Yeah, and the bishop on b7, the long dagger. Okay, knight d5, great trick, but it's not enough. It was a hard attack for Dubo for a second, but uh, nothing is changed because of the pin. And the queen just was captured, so that probably will result in a resignation. You see the handshake. Injic was like, oh, maybe he won't see that my queen is on pre. He takes it. <laughs> the players discuss a little bit, but Dubov continues his winning ways. Yeah, very impressive play by Dubov. I also see that Tsilipov has stopped Alexei Sarana. Pragnanda has beaten Alexander Pretke. Tons of, tons of resulting games. There's a Caruana game still in session against Sanan Shigirov. Can you imagine being Fabiano? You lose your first round of this event, and then you know you get a couple wins, and now you still play a Super Grandmaster who's underrated in Blitz. And look at this position. Fabiano has the white side against Shigirov, and Fabi is in a losing position. Yes, it looks very bad. He has a powerful passer, but unfortunately, he's facing two incredible passers himself, and there is no way fighting them. One of them, Queens. Game over. So Shigirov beats Caruana uh, with the black pieces. No easy games in this field. Uh, Peter, I don't know if any other games are still ongoing here, but I just want to note that Johan Sebastian Christian beat Gukesh. So there is a Norwegian with four out of four, and it's not Magnus Carlsen. Yeah, absolutely. It's incredible. Johan Sebastian has beaten none other than Gukesh. There is still some action. Is it still on? Hans Niemann against Alexander Rachmanov. Yes, and it's like a study like look at game. Look at this. White is two points up, but the computer says that it's a draw. Could it be? I'm puzzled. I, I think so, because well, I'm wondering if I give you a check on h7, you have to go to g1. And then do I have a waiting move? That's the big question. Can I like rook? Oh, he blundered as soon as we tuned in. And they both are making mistakes. Yeah, OK. This is such a crazy position with 10 seconds on the clock or with five seconds. You just can't play this perfectly. Oh, but look at this. The black king just keeps following the white king. Yes, but how long can you do that? You can keep doing Oh, because the pawns are wow. not connected. This is amazing construction. Amazing construction. What a save. And it's three for repetition. You just can't According go anywhere. the computer, but the game continues. <laughs> because the players, they're not taking notation. They don't know when the a game should end as a draw, but the black king should slide back. Instead of, there's no checkmate, the white rook will come back down to b1. But if the king comes to d4, Peter, I think you're hunting down the pawns. Yes, you are hunting down after rook e6, king c3 will be six times the same position according to the computer. But uh, I, I wonder, there was an episode, you know, when the game finished, and somebody lost, but then he claimed the draw based on the repetition. And uh, the arbiter, I think, approved. Yeah, there are all kinds of craziness, but yeah, he already the game ended. No, it continues. <laughs> We're getting to move 100 very shortly. Or no, we're already on move, what does it say, 105. So the, this, this position must have happened like eight times at this point. No, not this one. The king on c3, king c1, yes. But this is still a fresh one, but nothing really changes. <laughs> 
<laughs> this is a uh, you know when little kids are running around and you know they're just following each other but not really accomplishing all that much so they're running in circles at this point the black king now will go gobble up the f pawn and the game still continues peter rook and pawn versus rook yeah but this is the field of position everybody knows it you can relax even two seconds are enough and draw agreed there is no tension here well rachmanov he uh, played this super well in the defense. There was apparently one moment where he let the draw slip into a win for White. But when you have mere seconds in your clock, it's going to happen and it's hard to prove. So uh, for Rachmanov, a good hold against Hans Niemann. Both players moved to three out of four. Yeah, it's uh, just all these episodes with all the repetitions. It comes to mind that there was this Grishchuk against Mamet Yalov game. I believe I, I was there. It was historical that there was a claim uh, but the arbiters made a mistake. The claim was disapproved. Then the game continued. Then I believe Grishchuk lost the game, but later on the game was anyway uh, given a draw because the claim was in fact correct, you know? Total madness. It's always nice when things are so clear like here. It's true. It's nice to have uh, clear-cut things. And I just want to bring our attention to the game between Johan Sebastian Christensen and Gukesh because that game was clear and it was domination by the Norwegian. And I'm purposely being a bit ambiguous, you think, or talk about Magnus. No, it's JSC, Johan Sebastian Christensen taking down Gukesh. And Peter, on move, if we go into around move 20, I think we can uh, dial it back a little bit. This was the final position with a Queen G8 checkmate uh, up next. There are all sorts of mating plans, but this started as a composition. And here we go a knight sacrifice on G6, and it only got more adventurous from there. Yes, takes, takes, bishop takes g6. Clearly the queen is joining the party, the attack with queen h5. And we know Johann Sebastian, just give him an attack and he will checkmate you. He's an incredibly dangerous player in attack. Bishop h6, all the pieces are coming towards black's king. Bishop d7, rook fe1, knight e6. Bishop c2, the bishop retreats, so white is getting ready to deliver some very unpleasant check followed by queen g6 king h8 queen takes f6 so black has to react black plays the move queen e8 bishop g6 back okay some back and forth white picks up the pawn knight g5 f4 the pawn comes to life kicks that beautifully defending knight away knight f7 bishop g7 the stunner <laughs> it's such a pleasure to be playing a move like this especially in blitz when you you know don't have all that much time to say my intuition and calculation are so good and so fast that i if you take my bishop on g7 queen comes into h7 with check and the king has to go to f8 and then when this knight is captured on f7 you can't take this bishop but your king gets mated because the rook on e1 now has the fully open line your king cannot escape to e7 that is check that is mate and that is a nasty attack from johann sebastian christensen Incredible, brilliant. It's a miniature. Uh, I, I still feel like Gukesh does not know what hit him. Yeah, this was so shocking. And the last few moves were just desperation, giving up the bishop. But even if there wasn't checkmate with queen g8 next, you see that white is up three pawns. So what a demolition. And I agree with the chat that two brilliancies in one game, and those are deserved brilliancies. This was not just like, oh, I made a simple move that I could see anytime. These were some sacrificial tactics delivering a nasty checkmate. Yeah, and uh, basically we can understand why Johann Sebastian is there with four out of four. In Blitz games, with all his tricky, thing, his tricky lines, with his uh, incredible will to go after the enemy's king, is uh, paying off. What a game that was. What a tournament that Johann Sebastian Christensen is having thus far. If I'm remembering correctly, Peter, in the Rapid, he's one of the players who lost to that super talented eight-year-old. And now he's saying, I don't want people to talk about me losing uh, to these young kids. I'm going to beat everybody in my path. And he beat one of the biggest talents that chess has ever seen in Gukesh. Absolutely. It's also so nice to see Johann Sebastian doing these kind of things which we know he's capable actually i'm referring to that uh, event in riyadh i faced uh johan sebastian there it was i think the tournament the event where he broke into the elite nobody knew him before at least not me and i got beaten by him so i know what i'm talking about really strong player who is capable of such electric victories so let's 
look at the results from this previous round. We know that Johann Sebastian Christensen won the Hunter, the Thunder Halt, Conrad Halt. He was halted by Magnus Carlsen, who wins with the white pieces. Artemia played a beautiful game. I almost forgot about it. It feels like forever ago, but that was nice execution from him. Dubov wins. Uh, Sidipov, he moves it forward for beating Alexis Serrana. Pragnanda also with the perfect score. And Murzin, he beat uh, Mamajarov a round ago. Now he draws Rajabov. So Volodar Murzin, that's a name to please everybody. Make a bookmark about that kid. He is so talented. Yeah, very talented and steadily keeps on improving. Yeah, we haven't been seeing him yet in elite events, but I think in just one, two years, and we'll be seeing him playing against the very big boys in classical events as well. And you see that Johann Sebastian Christensen's name is so long, we have to call him JS. But no matter what you initials you give him, he gets the W. He beat Gukesh in a demolition. Shamsidin Vokidov beats Jordan von Forrest. Panamarev loses with White to Duda. Amin Tabatabai takes down Maxime Vashe the 2021 World Blitz Ship. And so here are standings, Peter. Only six players remain completely unscathed. Perfect four out of four. Which names stick out to you amongst the bunch? Well, all of them, yeah. Whoever gets four out of four in this field, it's, uh, he should be very proud. On the other hand, he shouldn't be leaning back and enjoying himself because the action is just heating up. Uh, all the other players are trying to catch them. So much action ahead, but I'm just very happy for all these guys to have such a good start. Yeah, there is no leaning back when right behind you is Magnus Carlsen, Yanchez Abduda, Anish Giri, and the rest of the trailing bunch. And in the Women's World Blitz, we have four rounds in the books as well. And, well, some players, they just continue their winning ways. They cannot, will not be stopped unless someone plays a masterpiece of a game. And I think on board one, you see it clearly, Ju and June wins with black. And Bimisar Asabayeva, the two-time reigning champion, will she be dethroned? She lost to Valentina Gunina, the super talented player who plays in every single women's speech championship event. Uh, she wins with the black pieces, and you should be happy, Peter. Alexander Kostenyuk, she wins. She takes down Paulina Shavala, keeps her perfect score. And Anna Matnazi, a lesser-known player amongst the general public, but well-known in chess communities as a player and organizer. Uh, she is a great chess obviously and she's having a great performance beating Divya Deshma. yeah wow it's uh, incredible stuff yeah four out of four for Anna very happy for her I played in the same team for Barcelona chess school in 2018 when I played the Spanish league very happy for her and she is one of the players the perfect forward for six players here have that score she's at the top and then in the trailing bunch there's only Katarina Lakno with three and a half out of four that's quite rare to see only a single player on a score group that isn't first place yeah that's kind of shocking but it also shows uh, Katarina's incredible uh, skills yeah that she's up there she won three games and managed to draw also one making one kind of a draw we have seen it from Magnus as well it's part of the plan you can't be winning it all it also means that you are playing according the position, according the situation that you get. If you have to defend, you have to defend. And sometimes surviving tough positions is one of the skills that it's required to finally win an event like this. And Lucknow speed backfired in the final round of the rapid against Humpy Kaneru. She's playing really quickly, but got a dubious position. Her speed will pay off in the blitz. And while the players, they head on for some rest, maybe some relaxation, some refreshment, we are going to join them for that. And in the meantime, enjoy the break. We'll be back shortly for more from the FIDE World Blitz Championship. Don't go anywhere.
What's the best way to follow any chess event from the Champions Chess Tour to the Candidates, Speed Chess Championship, Title Tuesday, FIDE World Championship, and so much more? Chess.com slash events has all of the top chess tournaments played both over the board and online. Analyze and review games from the world's greatest players with live commentary, cloud analysis, opening explorer, and table bases. Find all the key event information, including schedules, prizes, results, news reports, player bios, tie breaks, and more. Even compete by voting for your predicted results. Explore chess.com slash events today on web or with our iOS and Android apps and experience chess like never before. Welcome to How to Reassess Your Chess, the fantastic book that was written by the late Jeremy Silman. He recently passed away, but he has left a legacy of the concept of the imbalances that he elucidates so very well. This concept is really a game changer. Once you hear it, you can't really ever get it out of your head. A 1500 player didn't like to just attack, 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 but Silman, beat it into his head. Listen, you've got to attack when the king is stuck in the middle of the board. Looks like he might be able to take it back, but he said, no can do. Black decided to play bishop to c3, dropping a queen sack on the board. What kind of move is that? We see a mate threat that cannot be stopped. And of course, if you take the queen, rook takes and mate on a stick. This is how Jeremy Silman's students play. Man, that's the kind of teacher you want to have.
back to Samarkand, Uzbekistan, where the best players on the planet are competing for a World Chess Championship. It is the FIDE World Rapid and Blitz. We already crowned our Rapid Chess Champions in Magnus Carlsen and Anastasia Bondarev. They would like to win a second title, but it's not going to be easy. I'm Robert Hess. Alongside me is Grandmaster Peter Lecko. We have seen our Norwegian go 4 out of 4 in the World Blitz Championship. And it's not Magnus Carlsen. Peter, we're very impressed with Johan Sebastian Christensen. Yes, and very happy for him. And for all the Norwegian fans there, I'm pretty sure that people are rooting for him. And we're going to see an incredible clash between Pragnalanda and Johan Sebastian Christensen in the fifth round. We're treated to so many excellent matchups in these events, and they happen one after another. All these games happening in just a single day, 12 of them in the open. And then we have the first nine games of the Women's Blitz today. But let's go to the matchups in the Women's Blitz section, because there are six players with a perfect 4-4. Four four. That means they must square off. Uh, we see that Merit uh, Kamalinova takes on Ju Wen Jun. Wait a second, Ju Wen Jun has paired two different times here. We will fix this for you all. Uh, but Ju Wen Jun does not play black and white on consecutive boards. She is very talented. I don't think she could handle that feat though, Peter. Yeah, that's the so-called Basque system, yeah? When you are playing on two boards, but usually against the same opponent. Yeah, this, uh, this does not really work in Blitz like this. No, it does not, but she is at a perfect score, is Ju Wen Jun. So no matter what battle she faces, she is the one who has come out on top thus far. She would like to make it five out of five, not going to be easy. And in the open section, as we await the uh, pairings in the women's blitz, we know that Magnus Carlsen stays on board one, even though he doesn't have the highest score. He gets the black pieces against Tamar Rajabov. Artemiev, a perfect score against Sidipov, also with four out of four. Kirov, Dubov, and Pragnananda, Johann Sebastian Christian. We see the handshakes behind the matchups, but that one will be one to watch for sure. JSC against Pragnananda. Yeah, this is an Air Classico, but we are now with, uh, with the new generation. Pragnananda against Johann Sebastian Christians. And, and there you go, the trademark stuff. Johann Sebastian is not going for the traditional classical lines. He's trying to mix things up. He goes for the D6, H6 g6 bishop g7 position so he's just having fun over there on the uh, king side he has fiend his bishop later if that knight moves out the way f5 will be an idea for black and white has already expanded on the queen side that's over and done with but this could get king's indian style over on the king side yeah it's a very special pawn structure yeah white was rushing with his pawn all the way to a6 it did not impress or surprise Johan Sebastian at all. Look at his clock situation. He has blitzed out all his moves. And some of his moves are not especially difficult, but the knight a5, I'm not sure I love that decision, Peter, because if the pawn pushes the b4, that knight could get trapped. So we are seeing a position that's getting tactical all of a sudden. The knight on a5 stranded over there. I, I think he's going to regret not putting on e7 rather than a5. Yeah, it's a mysterious kind of stuff, but yeah, he's trying to break out from that uh, box on the queen side. Yeah, he's using the moment. Yeah, b5, c5, the knight might retreat to c6, and he will get perfect harmony in a classical Spanish spirit. And that a6 pawn, it's kind of a liability. Don't take it yet, though. If the bishop takes on a6, pawn b4, nets white a piece because they're two in a row, and the bishop on a6 is not defended behind the knight on a5. Yeah, I feel that uh, it's probably time to go back to c6, but there's also some argument to be made for, to play c5, c4, yeah. Okay, uh, Johann Sebastian sticks to classical ideas. Knight bd2. And Will we given, see? Given a question mark, which seems especially harsh, I think that white probably was better suited striking with d4 in the center, and this is maybe a little bit too slow. Yes, I want to highlight that this pawn on a6 does an incredible job hindering black's typical development. Eventually, the bishop can't really move to b7 like in the, the typical classical Spanish structures. Clearly, now white is going for d4. Also, that bishop eyeing the a7 pawn eventually after a lot of trade on d4, we might be seeing a problem with the a7 pawn there. 
And that's why the Black Queen went up to e7. It protects the pawn on a7. It wasn't the best move, but it makes perfect sense. The advantage in White's favor all of a sudden. I think d5, maybe pushing that pawn forward is the right way, but Black will hop with the knight to b4 and Peter. That a6 pawn, I think eventually it can be gobbled. Yes, White has to be careful because White senses that this is a golden opportunity. There are chances. There are also ideas to play in Magnus' spirit. D takes E5, D takes E5, Knight B3, going after the C5 square. That's also quite tempting. And maybe we should not release the tension so soon. And Pragnana plays Knight B3 for that reason. I said D5 at first. You said D takes E5. But he says, no, let me wait on that. D takes E5 now a threat. D5 can still be played if you want to go for it, unless Black takes on d4, but in taking on d4, that a7 pawn becomes a much clearer target. Yes, uh, I'm honestly loving the move knight b3. It's very much in my spirit. Okay, rook d8, clearly intending to stop d takes e5, but how does Prague react to it? Great question, because d5, knight b4, still very unclear to me, as the knight can capture the bishop on c2 or that pawn on a6. So he plays d5, invites the knight up to b4. The cameras are just a split second behind the post. But knight a5, Peter, I love that move. Yes, eyeing the c6 square. That's the weak spot in black's position. And he, Plague will be targeting the knight on b4 with something like queen d2. And if that black knight will capture on c2, then the c6 square will be an eternal problem. So it looks like a great decision made by Johann Sebastian Christian. We just saw it on the camera. It was already played on the board. Bishop to d7, covering the c6 square, ignoring the a6 pawn, also hanging the a7 pawn. But if bishop takes a7, the a6 pawn probably will be gathered by a rook a8 maneuver, and I don't think you get to keep it. Yeah, that's the feeling. But uh, white also has some knight b7 jumps somewhere. Probably it's premature because rook d8 will be a double attack on the bishop on c2 and some tactics with knight takes a6 using the fact that the knight is loose then on b7 yeah one needs to be careful here and look at that bishop b1 knight takes a6 the responses we're seeing right now and i think for prognana he's trying to figure out do i play knight c6 now and you saw him raise his hand then he took it back but knight c6 looked very tempting instead he actually drops the knight back to b3 aiming for a6 and a7 Yes, but we have bishop c8 defense on the board already, repeating once. Prague definitely will not repeat another time. Knight c6 already on the board. Takes, takes. Okay, he took the knight on a6 rather than the bishop on c6. So an interesting choice there. I think the knight would have slid into c5 had the bishop been captured and the pawn on c6 would have been straight. Now, a7 is a goner. The bishop on b1 will come back to d3 in the near future. So white should be slightly better thanks to that pawn on d5 restricting black's pieces. Yes, and the lovely bishop on e3. Clearly, white's knight will start a journey. Then another knight will come towards the a5 square. It's just a matter of time when we're going to see that. Such a great point by you. The knight can also go to b4, knight e1, d3, b4, and into c6. So you do have your knight rerouting. And the bishops for white, clearly better than bishops for black. The b5 pawn is loose. The light square bishop staring into a brick wall. The black uh, bishop on g7 staring to its own pieces. White has the advantage, but is it enough? Well, it should be enough in a classical game, but we are talking about blitz game here. The clock situation, controlling the clock with few seconds of the clock will be critical. Yeah, Johan Sebastian is giving up on the b5 pawn, but at the same time, trying to create some counterplay. Yeah. Wow, oh. bishop takes d5, e, d, e4. This is the Breyer spirit. Yes, what a find by him. And you could sense it. Like, he went bishop takes d5 with some emphasis. Now his pieces have life, so it's not a one-sided game anymore. We're about to see material even up. I would even go as far to say that because of the shift here, that Johan Sebastian Christensen should be feeling good about his chances. Exactly, yeah. This is uh, the psychological situation. Probably just play queen e8. But, uh, okay, one has to be super precise still. I like your suggestion, queen e8, just keeping everything defended. Uh, he, Oh, he, I think he grabbed his queen back to d8 and then put it back on d7. So he's not sure where to go. And he put it on e8. Okay, great, good. And look I'm at the clock it. situation. Johann Sebastian Christian down under 20 seconds. Prague at about 20 seconds himself. Both players undoubtedly nervous. And Prague knows he's looking across the board, but everything's defended. 
Yes, and if bishop e2, efc, bishop fc, which I believe had happened, then black can start rerouting his knight with knight d7, knight e5, start jumping. And he actually, bishop e2 takes takes. Queen e5 was the choice. Aiming at the b2 pawn, the d5 pawn is a bit loose. The bishop is stuck on f3. Peter, I have to say, I prefer the knight over the light square bishop in positions like this. Yeah, there is so much dynamic. There is so much to play for. And Praganda down to eight seconds. Going after the b4 pawn. And Johan Sebastian Christian under 10 seconds himself. He needs to find an idea here. The b4 pawn can't be defended. He brings his knight back to e8, it looks like. He wants to take on b2 after the trade on b4. Yeah, but this is slightly passive. Takes, takes, queen takes b2. The pawn on h6 is hanging. That's the problem. Oh, wow. but do you see that? At first, Prague was going to go queen a4. And then he saw that what you said, the h6 pawn is loose. Extra pawn for white with the bishop pair. Yeah, very unfortunate for Johan Sebastian that in this time scramble, he, he blundered that pawn. But still, he's trying to set up some fortress. Knight is heading. Really good chances here, I think, to for Pragnon to win and stay at 5 out of 5, even if the evaluation bar is towards the center. Yes, uh, especially with this time control, White cannot really blunder anything. He will keep on improving his position. King f3, h4, g4, somehow breaking. Yeah, King f3, g4. That will be the break. It's You need to create a pawn that White can target. Right now, the pawn structure is solid for Black. You are down one. The knight on a4, it's hopping around. Back to c3, it goes. And look at Pragnanda. He can't give up his dark square bishop for the knight because the game would immediately be a draw. Yes, okay. Now at least Black got some setup, but bishop c2 putting pressure on the f5 pawn. That's a problem. Well, the king went up to f6, it looks like, just protecting the pawn. And oh, oh, look That's at this. The bishop wrapped around with check, winning f5. Yeah, stellar technique by Pragnanda. He's done everything correctly to this point. It's still not that easy, though, because the pawns are split. And so if black is able to blockade, then you would have a chance to survive. But I think the F pawn and the H pawn, because they are split, precisely because of that, they can distract some of black's pieces. Yeah, everything is protected. There is no way also stopping the F or H pawn, no matter which, which one Prague prefers to push. And Johan Sebastian Christian, he shook his head. He's not happy uh, with his play in this game. But Pragnananda and all his fans should be thrilled. Is What a great game by him. Here comes the H-pawn. The bishop slams on g5. Peter, I just don't see how black can possibly stop them. Yeah, not at all. And uh, Prague actually plays it very professionally. He does not want to touch the f4-pawn just to make sure that black's knight is limited on c4. He's not able to jump to e5. But probably seems to be getting a little bit nervous. The moves are trickling in. There was h6 check. The king went up to g6. It looks like the white king slid into e4 and went back. So hopefully the moves, they come on in uh, because they will have to catch up with the players. Uh, maybe we just zoom in on the players if we can because the board is clearly not catching up. Oh, and there it goes as soon as I ask for it all at once. Yes, quite a lot of action. Nothing really changed. Uh, Prague is marching with his king just like he has done against Vahidov in the rapid section, it's all over. It is all over. You can see it on Johann Sebastian Christensen's face. Uh, the White King went to c6, took on d6. That was a great reference that you made there, uh, by the way, with uh, Prognana infiltrating. And here we have a close-up on the players. The last moves are being made. Oh, you see Prognana's like, where are you putting the bishop? I don't know. <laughs> yes. Yes, it's, it's important to clarify, yeah? Not that suddenly then this bishop appears on two different or even three squares. And it looks like a queen is about to appear. <laughs> Look at Prognana. He grabs in his hand, takes a knight, wins the game. Prognana stays with a perfect score, five out of five. Yeah, wonderful technique. Uh, very nice, very nice play. On the other hand, Johan Sebastian also with this bishop takes d5 trick. He was back in the game, uh, but then he blundered that h6 pawn, and Prognana wins another game. And Prognana with the big win. He is at a perfect score. Uh, let's try to see what other results are trickling in as well. But the game, the round should be nearly ending at this stage. And we see that Magus Carlsen beat Rajbov with the black pieces. Artemiev wins with white. Uh, what game are you bringing us to here? Which draw is this? Well, no, this is actually already finished. It's a draw. I'm trying to bring up some live action. Duda against Morsin. Uh, Duda has has probably won, yeah, because uh, White is actually winning the bishop as well. 
It's All funny, right. Peter, that White would be winning probably without the Rook on A1, but I just noticed <laughs> that White also has that extra Rook for good measure. Exactly, yeah, that kind of helps to make it clear. <laughs> yeah, all the games have, yeah, basically all the games have ended that I can see. Please tell me if you see something else. Uh, let me look through the list of games. It seems most are done. Uh, well, that's what happens at this late stage of the round. It seems that, yeah, the, the game we saw, it went nearly a distance and uh, most games are finished. Yes, I was trying to pull up some miracle finding one extra game, but apparently these... Uh, hang on, is this oh. game now on or did it finish? Whose game is this, uh, Peter? This is uh, Daniel Darda with the white piece against Jakub Simon. Okay. From Poland. I, the... You know what this reminds us of, right? It's Fedoseev yes. and Nihal Sarin, but the pawn is shifted two squares to the left. That's actually uh, usually good news to not have a rook pawn, but here... There's a lot of checks against the Black King. It's move number 107. Yeah, that's when we are joining in. It's it's complete craziness because I feel that this could be practically winning for Black. Something like Queen F to Queen G3, setting up some checks the same way like Fedoseyev has trigged Nihal. Wow! And then what? it ends in a stalemate, but it's White <laughs> who gives the stalemate. How on earth? What happened here? I got scared. Like, what just... Also, what was White's last move? Wow. No, no, it was... Ah, okay, it was a beautiful... No, come no. on, no, it cannot no, be. No, 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 Queen F4, the Queen could take it. Yes, exactly. No, you have there's to, no way. You have to give Queen F2 check. Yeah, that's the spirit. Or Queen E3 or Queen E2. Literally anywhere except for Queen F4. Yeah, wow. But, but how on earth? First of all, there was an F pawn. An extra F pawn <laughs> for black. <laughs> Mamma mia, this is crazy. <laughs> Queen G's. Ah, that was the problem. It was white to move and kept on checking. There was no way to hide. And then eventually the F pawn got lost. And wow, Black's king is getting boxed in. King F3. Queen D1 check. King takes F2. One would think, okay, that's it. Now, blow is guaranteed. But we have seen some craziness. Queen F, no, it cannot be. No, no, this, no, there, this is some transmission no error. Yeah, no yeah, way. This, because if you show Queen F4 once again, just to make it extra clear for everybody, that when the Queen goes to F4, King takes F4, that's a stalemate. The white uh, Queen takes away the black King squares. But if you took on F4 with the Queen instead, that frees the G1 square to the black King, and then it's simple checkmate in just two moves. So. Uh, I think it has to be a transmission error. We've seen that happen before with Goryachkina against Lakno, the H-pawn going to H4 when it really went to H3. So I think uh, the blunder didn't occur in this game. Yes, I think that what could explain that after the game, the players discussed that, you know, there was this check which was not a, not a stalemate. <laughs> well, Magnus Carlsen, he's winning against Teimo Rajabo. He remains in the hunt. Artemia, perfect. Well, Kirov and Dubov drew their game. Pragnananda gets the win over Johann Sebastian Christensen. Duda beat Murzin. And Anish Giri, he drew against Amin Tabadabai. Anish, he needs to win this World Blitz, not just to get a World Championship title in his name, but to make his way to the Candice. So he has a good start, but other players are winning their matchups. The Pamashi wins the Black. Report wins a Black. And we saw a host of other players jumping up the leaderboard. We have two players. At five out of five, Artemia versus Pragananda will be a forced pairing. And then we have four players with four and a half. Dubov, Duda, Vokidov, Carlson, and then we see Johan Sebastian Christensen leading the bunch with four out of five. Peter, so many great names at the top of the standings. Yeah, absolutely. I'm already looking forward to this uh, amazing matchup between uh, Artemia and Pragnananda. I want to see that. That will be epic. It will. I think everyone wants to see that. So many Prognana fans out there. And I hope there are many Artemia fans as well. Such a great player. And in the Women's World Blitz, we have more decisive games. But perhaps one that will be surprising. Ju Wenjun loses with white to Gune Mamadzada. And Alexander Kostenia continues winning, beating Ju Jiner with the black pieces. Valentina Gunina, she can't be stopped either. She's on a roll. She beats Anna Matnadze and Paulina Shuvalva. She takes down Katarina Lagno. Minara beats Leiting G. And Vivisar Asabayeva, the reigning 
the defending World Blitz Champion loses to the current World Rapid Champion in Anastasia Bodnaruk. So can we get the two for two double gold for Anastasia? That would be truly amazing. That would be truly amazing. That, that would be unheard of. I think you normally the double is there for Magnus Carlsen, otherwise you can't really imagine anyone else taking it. And we see perfect 5 out of 5 scores for 3 players, Mamadzada, Kostenyuk and Gunina. Then the next batch has 4, so there is some separation between the top of the standings and the chasers. Ju and Jun in that bunch along with Anna Badnadze, but right now a full point lead for the 3 players at 5 out of 5. Peter, uh, we continue to see fighting chess. Yeah, that's what uh, the Blitz World Championship is all about. Dramas, uh, mistakes, brilliant moves, uh, f not flagging, but incredible time scrambles. It's non-stop action. We've seen blunders, we've seen brilliancies, we've just seen the beauty of chess unfold in Samarkand, Uzbekistan, and there's more to come. So we are going to take a break, but when we return, it's the next round here at the FIDE World Blitz Championship. Etrixar Lay Vuga refers to what kind of chess? Bughouse chess? <laughs> I don't know, I have no idea. Who defeated Viswanathan Anand in just six moves? The Bonaronian? That guy. What opening did its Hufu refute in Bog Champs 2? Or the London, either the London, the Stonewall, or the Copycat. Three answers. Who was the number one rated woman in 1984? I don't know. Pia Cromling, Pia Cromling, Anna Cromling's mom, of course! Who is the only player to have won a World Cup while not representing an EU federation? Okay, who is it? And how could I get that wrong? He's a famous f***ing legend! There's a lot Danny doesn't know about chess, but there are some things you do need to know. Danny's new course for Chessable covers everything you need to know in just two hours. Check it out for free today.
We are back in Samarkand, Uzbekistan for another round of action at the World Blitz Championships. Every time I see this scenic, I am just in awe of the beauty of this historic city. This was a main part of the Silk Road. Such history, such rich history from this beautiful location in Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan, the winners of the latest chess Olympiad. I'm Robert Hess. Alongside me is Grandmaster Peter Lecco. All of the excitement happens over the board. That, that beautiful city is the backdrop. Peter, we've seen some great blitz thus far. We still have so many rounds left ahead of us. Yeah, yeah. It's just uh, the event is heating up. We have been seeing players run away with uh, perfect scores, but uh, so many other players are also there hoping for their chance and so much action ahead. Talking about perfect scores, there's one player who had a perfect score, though not in this World Blitz Championship. It's Ali Reza Faruja, who's been on his run to the candidates, and it seems like he has been successful. He scores a perfect 7 out of 7. He beat Gadakomsky along the way, the FFL, the legendary Gadakomsky. And, well, this has been a tricky chapter in FIDE history because there are rules in place about a single rating spot for a single rating list not taken over the course of a whole year. There were some matches that were organized at the last minute. There were other tournaments uh, that were organized pretty late in the day with super strong players. So I have to say, Peter, this has been rife with controversy. And I think that this could have been prevented if stricter regulations were in place. But I will say that Ali Reza, he gave it his all. He played for that rating spot instead of sitting on a rating he, he couldn't do that. He played. And so I feel like we have to incentivize people to play, to compete, to try to win. And so Alireza did what he was allowed to do. But I acknowledge that the matches in particular that were organized with the sole purpose of getting him to the candidates, there is a bit of a cloud of suspicion over those. Well, I'm a very big Alireza fan. I'm happy to see him in the candidates if he qualifies. Uh, only that, yeah, the way how it happened was uh, was not to, to my liking. I would have much rather have seen him here at the World Rapid and Blitz and be covering his uh, incredible games facing Magnus Carlsen and all the others rather than uh, playing against much weaker opposition. And I think he would have rather uh, played in the World Rapid and Blitz and he probably could have if the rating were calculated over the course of the year because he had a much higher rating than the other people he was jockeying for a position with in Wesley So and Lenier Dominguez. So just a single rating list, it encourages farming. And we already have talked about uh, in previous shows about you know, 0.8 rating points uh, being the minimum, but then it was taken away. So you gain zero rating points in some games. I, I think there's a lot to figure out here but we will leave that conversation for another time. Uh, I do I want to congratulate Alireza Faruja for making his way through the candidates, it would seem. But we are going to focus back on the Blitz World Championships that we have at the moment because it's great to see perfect scores. It's great to see uh, players who may not be household names score some great victories. And on board one, we have Magnus Carlsen against Shamsidin Bokidov. So there was a Vakidov matchup. Now there is the Vokidov matchup. Uzbekistan can be proud of their players who are trying to take down Magnus Carlsen. And on board two, which is really board one, Artemia plays Pragnananda in a matchup of perfect scores. Yes, and then there is also Daniel Dubov against Jan Shishtov Duda. Two incredible blitz players, Jan Nepomniachi facing Denis Lazavik, a name that you are probably very familiar with on the chess.com scene. Denis Lazavik is a beast, and he proved his might in the Champion Chess Tour Finals. He beat Maxime Vashelagrav in an Armageddon match, and here we see Carlsen against Vokidov. Peter, and you're in your home country, that's got to be nerve-wracking, and here we see Hans Niemann with the white pieces against Anish Giri. So, uh, this is not on board one, but these players have four to five, so they're in striking distance. Yes, absolutely, and there is also a camera on them. We also have Alexander Kostenyuk taking on Valentina Gunina. And Kostenyuk and Gunina, these are uh, people who have played each other over many years, have uh, been teammates on the Russian national team, although now Alexander Kostenyuk plays under the Swiss Federation. And Gunai Mamadzada on board too. She's in the tie for first, and she's playing Zhu Jiner. So the clocks are started. We see Gunina uh, responding to Knight F3, and we're going to get a quiet start to this game. It's going to be potentially a King's Indian attack. 
Yeah, this is some kind of a surprise because I recall Alexandra being a very dangerous one E4 player. Maybe because she plays Valentina and they know each other so well, she prefers to play a solid strategical game instead of her tricky openings. It's a solid start to this one. And we actually just saw Kostinik take this pawn on D5. And Black takes, E takes D5. So instead of keeping the structure symmetrical, and the knight has committed itself to D7, if you take with a C pawn, you want to get a knight in C6. But I like this pawn chain for Black. It's aiming in the direction of the king side, so that's where black should focus her pieces. Yeah, normally white is going after black's light squared bishop with some h3, knight h4 ideas, but uh, black has not yet committed the knight to f6, so black is very flexible. I wonder how white wants to justify her stuff. Okay, knight goes to f6, so white can after all go against the light squared bishop. And sometimes you can... And knight h4, I was going to say, play that before pawn to h3, and that's what Kostanyuk chooses. It's given a question mark in this position. And look at Black's play. Very solid. You're not doing anything spectacular, but all of your pieces are in natural squares. Meanwhile, there's a queen on d3. Not necessarily the best square for it. The knight on h4. I don't like this construction for white. It feels like it's artificial. Yes, and the point was that with the bishop on d6, Usually that bishop is on e7. I think this is the big difference and why I was saying that black's play was very flexible. Uh, white had to play the move rook e1 in order to try to chase that bishop because if she would have done it earlier, then after bishop h5, g4, knight takes g4 would have been possible. h takes g4, let's not forget black's bishop was still on d6. Then after queen takes h4, g takes h5, it have resulted in queen h4 to h2 checkmate. That was the problem. And that's why the rook move, rook e1, had to be played. And look at this. g4 attacks the bishop. Knight e4, the response. The queen on d8 is opened up on the diagonal towards that knight on h4. So, Peter, I'm liking black's position because white has committed a lot by pushing the pawns in front of her king. Exactly. If you can't get that bishop, and uh, it seems to me like black cannot just fall back with the bishop quietly to g6, oh. it looks very promising for black. And look at the knight retreating to d6. Perhaps not the uh, most aggressive move, but those dark squares, as you're pointing out on the king side, if you trade on f5, the queen comes to h4. And I think that white should be in serious danger. Yes. The only good news is if white is able to get e2, e4 in, you get some kind of a harmony. But uh, now the knight c4 move was also hitting the bishop on d2. So Alexandra retreats the bishop all the way back to c1. And now if you take on f5, I guess the queen can take back. So we see the queen. It lands on f6. Valentina gently playing all of her moves, but they come with purpose. And you're showing e4 as a possibility. Yeah, the black pawn on d5, it's overloaded, protecting the knight on c4. Exactly. The queen on d3 is not doing perfect. It makes perfect sense. Yeah, doing an excellent job hitting the knight on c4. I feel like the worst part of this uh, game, this opening has passed for Alexandra. Black might be perfectly fine, but now it already it also makes sense from White's perspective. Suddenly White has a plan, a purpose, some uh, free squares, some room for her pieces, and the queen just parks itself on h4. And that rook on e1 is under attack, and it moves up to e2, but here comes the second knight for Black. I still prefer Black's position because her king is safer. Yes, exactly. And knight f6 is such a lovely move, especially in a, a fast time control in a blitz game. Knight h5, knight h4 create problems to your opponents. That's exactly what you need. White needs to burn time. And now b3 weakening something. I'm counting. Is bishop takes c3, queen takes c3, knight d6 eventually possible using the pin? Yes. And she starts with knight d6. I like that she uh, keeps the tension between bishop and knight. If e5 is played, both knights are under attack, but bishop takes knight on c3, queen takes, and that pin is there. So knight takes f5, as you're highlighting. Yes, this is what I have been worried about. It's not only the pawn, but also the squares. Black already has a lovely square for f5. The other knight can also join the party. Yeah, okay, takes, takes, and then we're going to see knight h5. Peter, even if you gave white a C pawn, let's say, to even up the material, black is still better because of the control of the dark square. So it's much more fun to play this for black regardless, but when you're also material ahead, it's too much to be true. Yeah, it's uh, basically completely winning for black. 
Also, the clock situation, Black is not done to last couple of seconds. She still has almost one and a half minutes. And Rook E6, a Rook left going to G6 next. The White King is in danger. And for Black, you have all the time in the world because you have a light square bishop and all these weak dark squares that the knight's coming to F4, the queen could come to G3, a Rook to G6, H3 is going to fall. Uh, this is over. This is completely hopeless. Yeah, it's uh, strategically better for Black. Black has the initiative. Black is uh, up the material. You can even just follow it up with Luke A8, Luke G6, but you might even not need the Luke on A8 to join the action at all. And White hardly has a move. You've highlighted it like a Tetris piece, but unfortunately there is no puzzle to solve for White. There's nothing that's going to fix her position. Uh, all the squares are weak, and she's also down on the clock by quite a lot. Yeah, she knows that it's completely lost. She will play Queen D2, I believe she has played the move. <laughs> Queen D2, and I think Rook F8 was played by Valentina, making sure there are no back rank checkmates. So taking extra preca precaution by putting her rook next to her king. And it seems that the move was played king h1. That's a very sad move to choose. Knight f4, rook to g6 or h6. How does white survive this? You can't. Rook h6 is You stop. can't. Yeah, you can't survive. Ah, rook h6. Okay, just to throw me. I was already highlighting rook g6 so many times. But look, h6 make perfect sense. Knight f4 going after the h3 pawn, creating checkmating ideas. I have to say, though, knight g3 to f5 was the choice going after the d4 pawn. I do like white's position a little bit more now than I did before. It's still losing. I'm not going to dismiss that. But at least your pieces are a bit more active, so it gives you some hope. Yeah, you did not get checkmated at once. On the other hand, look at this. Yeah, g6, knight g7, oh. very nicely grouping. Also, Black's mysterious looking rook f8 works to perfection. It was a great prophylactic, sensing that there might be action ahead on the f file. And Valentina is an extremely kind person, and she is moving her pieces uh, quite gingerly here, but she's not being nice in this game. She is just controlling everything up a couple pawns. And now she's been moving her queenside pawns to freeze whites in place. D4 remains a target, a weakness, something that uh, white has to passively defend. Yeah, it's a hopeless position. Okay, two pawns in an endgame, plus in this structure, black knight. Black's knight is just perfect. The weakness on D4, everything is in black's favor. Love that move, though, B4 by Kostanyuk. It's the only move that gives her a chance at some counterplay. And it seems that, wait, I'm looking at the camera. It seems like white is putting pressure on this B7 pawn and the black king has jumped out into the open going in the attack. Wow. So, okay, we, we are waiting for all those moves to, to appear. Here they come. Yeah. All right. Okay. Nothing really changed. Black is just too dominant. The look on E7 is wonderful protecting and attacking at the same time. And it's two pawns to the good for black and knight d4 just played by Gunina. She might just checkmate Castenia with the knight and the rook cutting off the white king's access. Uh, there could be a checkmate even if she doesn't rush her pawns forward. Yeah, she can just choose whatever she wants. The knight on d4 is very powerful. Look at that bishop on b7. Okay, now it's transferred back to g4. And we see a rook trade. I'm looking at the live camera feed. A rook trade was offered and declined. I mean, Kostenik still has some chances because if Black fumbles and loses a pawn here, the pawns are going up the board a bit. But if you can't push them anymore, perhaps it gives Kostenik a chance. Yeah, I feel like it's kind of a miracle already that uh, Kostenik is still in the game and she's able to fight. But... Uh... Nevertheless, it looks completely winning. Be careful, knight e3, bishop f3, checkmate. You can lose the game. And that's why she dropped her knight back. Great call by you that there are some checkmate ideas because the black king was sandwiched in, squished by its own pieces. And now, Kostanyi is going after the loose g-pawn. Black is pushing pawns forward. So if you don't get those pawns to the other side quickly, maybe white has an outside chance with the rook pawn passer. And there has to be a checkmate here. Yeah, also the pawns are marching. So bishop e6 attack the rook on a2, rook h2 played, put it on a dark square, exactly. 
And there's the Black Knight. Checkmate is on the, the first rank. And now the Rook and Bishop are under attack. This could be resignation. You see Kostanek looking. She gives up her Bishop, but it's just Checkmate on the next turn. Oh. Yeah, okay. It's over. Resignation. Valentina Gunina is perfect in the Women's World Blitz Championship. She beats Alexander Kostanek, her longtime uh, teammate, compatriot, and friend. So a win for Gunina there. And let's uh, move on to some other games that are still in progress. Yeah, let me try to pull it up. Yeah, Magnus Carlsen has won his game. Artyom has beaten Pragnananda. I don't really see any top game in the open section, which is still uh, in progress. Anish Giri taking down Hans Niemann. Lot of, lot of action. Jan Yapomachi beating Denis Lazavik, but I don't see any... Ah, maybe Vajabo's game? If you can find a game that's ongoing, do take us there. Is this their Rajbov game? It looks very one-sided here after Knight D1. In fact, yeah. Black just won a piece, so it probably was a resignation that wasn't registered on the board. Exactly. I feel the same way. Nestor Wagons Injic is an open game yet in the system. Let's take a look. <laughs> it does not even it. open. Okay. Yeah. It does not even open. Yeah. Okay. They don't want us to see, to see their game. But let's uh, then... Take a look at the results that we have had. Magnus Carlsen, he wins his game. Artemiev, he remains undefeated, beating Prognananda. A draw between Dubov and Duda. What game is this that you just pulled up? This is the Artemiev Prognananda final position. Oof. The Rook on G4 is lost. Yes, it's basically check, almost checkmate, but it's a, it's a winning construction. King H8, Queen takes H5, and then the Rook is lost. But counting also the material, white is two pawns up. So it, it looked like it was already a completely winning position. And I'm looking further down the standings. Yanda Palm, she beat Dennis Lazovic. Richard Report held to a draw by Johann Sebastian Christensen. So Magnus is ahead of Johann Sebastian now, but JSC continues a good run. So here are your results. Magnus wins, Artemiev wins, draw on board three. Nepo, a draw on board five. And Anish Giri beating Hans Demon with Black. We saw a draw between Tabitha Bai and Alexei Serrana. Arvind loses to Gukesh, so compatriots square off and Gukesh gets the upper hand. Denis Makhanov continues to make waves, holding Maxime Matlikov to a draw. Sanan Shigiro beats Sidipov. And we have Andrew Hong, a Blitz specialist, well known online. He loses with White to Yu Yi, the bronze medalist from the World Rapid Championship. And last on this graphic, but certainly not least, Maxime Vasilegrov wins with black over Tigran Petrosyan. So we've had some great fights. We watched Gunina in the women's take the lead. It is Artemiev in the open. Six out of six and only one player at five and a half. Peter, are you excited for our next round matchup? Absolutely. I want to see it. I have tremendous uh, respect for Artemiev. Of course, tremendous respect also for Magnus Carlsen, but I believe Everybody has that. Everybody knows Magnus. But let's give credit to RTM. You have six out of six in this field. Has just taken down Pragnanda as well. And RTM defeated Magnus Carlsen in a match in the Champions Chess Tour. He's not afraid of him. He can beat him. So we'll see that clash in the next round. But the Women's World Blitz also has a leader that has not dropped even a single half point. So as we look at the results of the previous round, the round that just concluded, we did watch Valentina Gunina win with the black pieces over Alexander Kostenyuk, and other results have gone uh, and been decisive. I don't see a single draw if we pull up the results from the last round of the Women's World Blitz. Uh, we saw that Zhu Jiner won with the black pieces as well. So many decisive games. Here are your standings. Gunina, 6-0. And look at this, Peter, all the way down from second to ninth place with five points, a full point of separation between Gunina and the Chasers. Yes, so far Gunina has been very impressive. We have only seen one of her games right now against Alexander Kostenyuk. It was very impressive. Uh, very good time management, very nice uh, kind of opening, not preparation, but setup. Yeah, she's playing a system type of position where she feels uh, satisfied. All her pieces went to the perfect squares, and basically Alexandra had no chance in that game. No, she did not. And uh, Zhuzhiner, Kostenyuk, Mamadzada, Badnerok, Anastasia, 
uh, you know, she is there in the hunt. She won a gold medal. I'm not calling her greedy, but Peter, I think she wants more. She had a taste of victory and now she can't stop. Yes, and actually we also had the privilege of seeing her in action yesterday already in the Blitz playoff. Yeah, she was playing very quickly. I think this is her strategy. And in time scramble, she was very impressive. Maybe it's not fair that she got that playoff in because not only did she win a world title, she got ahead of the game with Blitz. She got uh, to test her hand and her speed was really incredible against Humpy. So it's great to see Anastasia continue her winning ways. There's still so much fight left today and tomorrow. We will take a break, join the players and uh, getting refreshed, maybe get a stretch in. And when we return, it is the second half of day one in the World Blitz Championship. So much action yet to come. Do you know about Nobel Prizes? No. Over 50 members of the Athenaeum have won Nobel Prizes. Bertrand Russell, Winston Churchill. Rudyard Kipling, have you heard of? Uh, you're too young, you don't know all these people. Tactically, I'm quite, I'm still quite strong. I can still, re you give me a position in the paper white to play and win the first move I think of is usually the answer. Um, I think I'm quite good at the weekend games, but I'm not sure about my weakness. This is the, mo I think, the most expensive library in the world after British Museum. Oh. This is the Darwin chair. Have you heard of Charles Darwin? Darwin is chair. Yeah. They play between each other chairs. Can I go up the stairs or am I not allowed? Do you want to go up the stairs? I've never been up the stairs. Let's go up the stairs. This is high. What's this thing over here? It's an old thing for parcel posts. So if you have to send a parcel, you wait. You put the parcel in one and you put the weights in the other. And when it balances, you know the parcel weighs four pounds or um, so many grams. I think the optimal age for playing my first chess would probably be when I'm somewhere around a teenager. Mid thirties is probably the be the people reach their reach their strongest, and um, so at age seventy nine, I'm probably a bit past it. <laughs> oh, see, that's interesting.
in the heart of Central Asia lies the ancient city of Samarkand, Uzbekistan. Landmarked along the Silk Road, the spirit of the past still echoes through its ancient buildings and monuments. But today, modern-day warriors from all corners of the globe descend on this historical place, each vying for four of the most coveted titles in chess. And a handshake, Magnus Carlsen gets the double. Before the calendar's turn, the year closes out with six days of intense battles. He flagged! Brilliant strategies and unparalleled excitement. He's blundered! Magnus has made a new queen and now it's a huge turnaround. Will the experienced prevail? Or will a rising star defy expectations? Let the games begin. This is the 2023 FIDE World Rapid and Blitz Championship, and it starts now. see Samarkand, Uzbekistan once more. Hopefully the players get outside and take a tour of the city. It looks marvelous. I saw players before the tournament began stretching their legs, going on long walks, enjoying the scenery. But now all of their attention is on the chessboard of 64 squares. I am Robert Hess. Alongside me is Grandmaster Peter Lecco. We are heading into round seven of the World Blitz Championships. Peter, we have one perfect score in both of the tournaments. Vladislav Artemyev in the open, and we saw Valentina Gunina. She just looks like a force with a perfect success six in the women's world blitz. Exactly. So far, both of them have been dominating the field, winning very nice, high quality games, not really giving any chances to, to their opponent. The point is that normally, okay, why I'm highlighting this, that this is blitz. Yeah, it's so many times you play this up and down game and then suddenly maybe with luck or thanks to time, you are winning a game. So far, I feel like they have been dominating their opponents. And now the big question is, knowing that Vladislav Artem is up against Magnus Carlsen, how will that domination continue? That is the eternal question. Many players have fallen at the hands of Magnus Carlsen, but before we dive into that, let's first dive into the standings. In the Women's World Blitz, we've discussed how Valentina Gunina is the only player with a perfect six out of six. And Peter, if she keeps winning, she already has a full point between herself and her uh, nearest competitors. If she keeps beating them, she could run away with this thing. I know it's early and you're gonna say that, but a full point only six rounds in, She's going to be hard to stop if she can't be taken down quickly. Yeah, we know that Valentina is extremely strong. And uh, when she starts winning, she has these streaks. Yeah, she can just keep on winning games after game. She has the class. And uh, yeah, the big question on the other hand, yeah, one point advantage. Yeah, it might look big, but it only takes just one loss. And then many, many bunch of players might be catching up to you. Then the nerves come to play. Then you get really nervous. So there is still so much intrigue here. And Gunina gets the white pieces against Gunai Mamadzada on board too. Divya Deshmukh, she's white against Alexander Kostanyuk. So Indian fans will be happy what they see on not just that board, but also board three because Harika Dronavali, she is in the mix. She takes on Umida Omanova. So we have so many great matchups. Anastasia Bogner, the uh, current, the recently crowned as of yesterday, a women's world rapid champion. She's on board four. And I just want to make note that you said that Valentina, she's a streaky player and that's true. She can win every game she plays. But as you also said, that if you lose a game as a streaky player, sometimes that can cause you to collapse. So I do think it's important to find that right balance of playing aggressively for a win and stability. And that's why I really like the way Gunina played against Kostenyer. She didn't do anything that was hectic. She put all natural moves all strong moves and she was very composed yes absolutely even that move look at it yeah that mysterious look move just shows that she had this perfect vision she had the calmness not running after trying to deliver even a checkmate she knew exactly that this game with simple measures with simple logical natural moves is won and finally she converted it in a long but but clear end game into a win and we see on the second page of the pairings, Vaishali on board 12, taking on Mugzul. And we have Gary Fulina, who she keeps making her presence felt in the women's 
Grand Swiss, yet in the rapid, and even until the very last round, she had a chance, and she's taking on Anna Matnadze, Humpy Canero takes on her patriot of Rakshita Ravi. So many Indian players have found their way towards the top. Bibisar Asabeva, she's fallen a little bit. She started uh, perfectly, then she's lost a couple games, but she's right there. You know, she gets back to a winning streak. We, we may see her crowned the Women's World Blitz Champion for a third time in a row. Unlikely, because there's so many other players doing well, but it's always possible when we're talking about Bibisara. Yes, I think also last year we have witnessed some incredible comeback by her. It wasn't obvious at all that she's going to be able to keep her title. She has done it with a furious finish. It's still so many lines to go. Uh, you always have time to come back. There are 17 rounds in the Women's World Bliss Championship. And as we venture on over to the Open, there are 21 rounds and we've only completed six of them. So there definitely are chances for everyone on this page. And I'm just gonna start at the bottom because I see in 20th place, Maxime vachel Legras with four and a half points. He's a former World Blitz champion. So he's in the running, but up at the top is Vladislav Artemiev. Six out of six, he's going to face Magnus Carlsen who has got five and a half. And then we have a cohort with five points. Pragnanda, Duda, Nepomishi, Giri, Shigirov. What a performance from him. And Gukesh, all with five out of six. I just want to highlight Shigirov. And not just because he now plays on the Hungarian flag. And I know that now he's a countryman of yours. But he is somebody who has been at the just below the top tier of elite chess for a long time. Now 2,700 plus. Doesn't get as many invites as maybe fans of his would like to see, but he's five out of six here. He beat Fabiano earlier in the tournament. He's super strong. Yeah, he's very strong. I think he also recently played two uh, good tournaments. One was in Sharjah, and the other one was uh, the Chennai Masters, gaining tremendous experience. Yeah, and playing these events, you, you can keep on improving your level, get all this experience facing the very best players in the world. And he's been... A trainer for Anish Giri, lost to Anish Giri in the second round here, beat Fabiana Caruana. So Shigirov, he is playing well, and we are getting word that the round seems to be delayed. It's possibly due to an appeal. We will keep you all updated, but the players, they're not in the playing hall. So we don't have the pairings in the open. We are going to take a break to figure out what's going on. Please stick with us. There's so much more left here in day one of the FIDE World Wars Championship.
back in Samarkand, Uzbekistan. It seems like there's a problem. A dispute has come about in the latest round, the sixth round, as apparently, from what we're told, someone tried to press the clock, it didn't register, they lost on time, and they immediately appealed. So, Peter, has this ever happened to you before? This seems like a situation that could delay the round quite a bit. Yeah, it could delay, and it's kind of one of those very unpleasant situations, yeah, that uh, you can't really fault anyone a part of the technology. Yeah, that's uh, that's kind of crazy because if you are playing a game, you are playing a blitz game, you are done to your seconds, then you want to make sure that the clock is properly working. And what's the unfortunate part here is that for Yu Yang Yi, who was the beneficiary, the recipient of a win on the clock. It's like he did anything wrong. He just made his move. His opponent tried to return the move and the clock malfunctioned. So it's an uncomfortable place to be. And you would think in the position that they had, you and I looked at it, it's still plenty of life left, though the eval bar sits in the middle. Black was up a pawn. You don't want to give someone a half point, not at the world championship stage. I mean, this is a situation that I, I don't really know how you properly resolve it if indeed the problem does not stem from either player. Exactly, yeah. We don't know the exact news. Uh, looking at the position, it seems like black is a pawn up, but it's a very special construction, so it's even not so easy to uh, play a good move. Okay, good move is something like bishop g8, but all these knight jumps, there are so many things with a couple of seconds. If the game is uh, resumed, then of course now the players had time enough to figure things out. Yeah, It will be a completely different scenario than if the game would have been non-stop in action and that's why i feel for both of them because for andrew hong if he indeed made the move and he pressed the clock and for some reason it didn't uh, turn to the other pawn the person's time his opponent's time then what can you do but for you Yang Yi, you're up a pawn you're going to press for a win no matter the time control so i just don't know uh, what the proper resolution is and i feel for both parties the technology has to be perfect in a world championship arena you can't have malfunctions and uh, we don't have all the details so we don't know uh, what exactly is to blame here but what we can see and what we do know is they are delaying the seventh round and i don't know how you resolve this conflict yeah it's a good question when we first saw the the camera feed then we have seen a very big gathering around that table now that gathering has been uh, kind of resolved maybe there is a solution to the problem i don't know we are waiting for updates and that position is quite simplified so it's a bit different but could you imagine if it was complicated and someone really did hit the clock it didn't register but all these other people are surrounding them you have to make sure that uh, for fair play and screening that nobody is you know saying oh you actually have this winning tactic if the play continues i i really don't know what you do in this circumstance uh but i guessing that the result is likely to stand just because i don't see how you overturn it you, you can't just give someone a half point and it's really just unfortunate and it can completely mar what has been so far a fantastic tournament so these are our standings after round six vladislav artemiev at the top magnus carlson will try to take him down a notch as they will face each other and daniel dubov leads the pack with five points out of six but all those players that you see with four and a half points they're right in it, not just for any medal, but still for gold. Yeah, for sure. Even the players behind, yeah, it's, uh, we, we have been talking about, it's uh, about 21 runs. If any of the players gets this flow and starts winning games, besides all these top top guys who are facing each other, they automatically gonna slow down. Yeah, it's just impossible to keep on winning every single game against uh, top players. So there might be some completely dynamic, some new name might appear that we haven't even had on our radar yet. Yeah, it's impossible to win every game, as you say. Though it seems sometimes that Magnus Carlsen wins every game that he plays. He has been nicked for a half point by Vakidov earlier here. But what an amazing year Magnus has had. 2023, he just won the World Rapid Championship and he has many titles to his name. And as you see from this card, he's played 2748, 2748 games played, not quite as high as his rating. He's won nearly 1900 of them, and he's gained 212 rating points. He's the highest rated player in chess.com history. Uh, his current rating is just six points behind that record that he set, 3372. Peter, he does it everywhere. Bullet, Blitz, 
classical, rapid, online, in person, on the moon, in the stars. He just can't be stopped, it feels sometimes. Exactly. That's that's the incredible thing, yeah, that he's not specializing on any one, two, three, four disciplines. He's the best in all of them, uh, dominates the field no matter where he plays. It's it's incredible what a fantastic player he is. And what a fantastic win over Daniel Nerdiski in a bullet game. Danya was 34-47 at the time. We know how quick and skilled Danya is. Lovely commentator and great person, great friend of ours as well. And you can check out your year in chess on chess.com. So it's not just Magnus who can see what he's been up to. You can check it out yourself. So uh, we are going to figure out what's happening in this World Blitz Championship. Uh, we're being informed that the player, Andrew Hong, says that he made a move. He pressed the clock. He got the increment. Everything was fine. A couple seconds later, it, he said... I flagged. So I don't know what happened during those few seconds. Either the clock malfunctioned or he pressed it back. Andrew Hong was saying about his appeal versus Yu Yang Yi. He wrote the appeal. Unclear what happens next. It's not clear when the next round will start in the open section of the World Blitz Championship. The women's pairings, they've been out. They probably are ready to play. So there's this holdup that's impacting many people. And actually, live on the floor in Samarkand, uh, the television... It uh, looks like NRK, the Norwegian TV, they're covering this. And you can see them discussing what's happening, bring it to their audiences. So cool to see that there are reporters live on the scene trying to figure out what's going on. Yes, I think that also while we are waiting for all this to, to be clarified, we might get a chance to look at some games that we missed out. For example, we haven't really understood or, or have seen how Artyom has beaten Pragnanda also. We missed out on Magnus's win. Which game do you want to start with? You know, Peter, I leave it up to you. I feel like you know, whatever player that you think that should get the focus, I'm happy to go there. So Artyom, you have always a good call. Yes, Artyom and Pragnanda, they both had five out of five. And let's just take a look. What kind of struggle was this? RTMF trademark style, playing a quiet opening, making sure that it's going to be a strategic battle. Yeah, this is a Rati. In fact, it turns into a reverse Grunfeld. This is modern chess. There are so many move order finesses. E6, castles, takes, takes. We're not going to be commenting on, the, on every single move. But let's just appreciate the structure change that happened here. It's all very much in the Grunfeld spirit. E4, D4, C3, E5, C, D, E, D. This unbalanced... Uh, stuff the bishop on g2 usually that's a g7 bishop and knight a3 was played all this maneuvering it, it was a very interesting maneuvering game it was for a very long time quite balanced but typically this rtmf kind of balance keeping all the tension uh, making sure that it's gonna be a very big fight and the long fight and it was, in fact, a good position for Pragnananda. He started going wrong around here, where the material is even, the pawn structure is not symmetrical, black has a bishop pair, and look at this move. It's such an Artemia move, queen to d6, and here is really where Pragnananda went wrong, because queen takes d6 is a move you don't really want to play as black, because then you invite the knight in, b7 is loose, but maybe you have to slide your rook over, rook f to e8, protect your queen. That way, when you recapture on e7, your rook preemptively defends this pawn on b7, because in instead of playing in this kind of manner, he moved his queen out the way. He didn't want the queen trade. He was worried about it. And Peter, after queen f6, e5 was played. And now that bishop on g2 that you're mentioning, it sees the whole diagonal. Yes, it opens up, but still the, the game was very level or very dynamically balanced, I would say. But suddenly, yeah, here, knight takes b6, a takes b6, rook d1. Nothing clarifies yet. Suddenly also, black has tons of action along the a file, but none of this happened. Rook a d8 was played, queen c7, bishop g4. Look at this d pawn. That's, uh, that, that's kind of a guarantee for counterplay. Rook d2 d3 black is going for bishop e2 what a total madness and we are talking about the blitz game i can assume that the players were both down on the clock at this stage already and this is actually really illustrative of the point we make day after day and we see magnus carlson and uh you know norwegian contingent they're talking about what's happening 
Magnus in a good mood, smiling, uh, but this delay continues in the open after an appeal was made. So we will wait and see how long it will take for the appeal committee to resolve this. I really hope there's a public statement being made so that we can learn more from FIDE, uh, the organizers of this event. But I just wanted to point out this position, uh, Peter, even um, though Black has his past pawn on D3, it's what we keep talking about, compensation for the material. How do you prove that compensation? You have a passed pawn, but the position, it's not clear. White is aiming at B7 as well. The Nike coming to C5. It's one of these positions that no matter what the engine says, and here it does say white is better, it's just very difficult for black to play and prove that you can keep up. Yes, exactly. And uh, there was also one problem. First of all, white was able to cement the pawn on E5. And look at this, the next couple of moves were decisive after bishop e2, white followed it up with rook f2. And there was a very nice little detail. The knight is falling back to c1. It's always so easy to miss a move like this. Knight, knight moves backwards are the easiest. And now the bishop is hit, the pawn on d3 is loose. The construction is getting uh, broken up. And the rest was just method of technique. Look at this, all the liquidation. White ended up being two pawns up, the walk in the park for RTMF. And I like that conversion there, taking away all the minor pieces, two pawns ahead, your king is perfectly safe, despite the fact that the pawns are extended quite far. So a nice conversion for Artemiev. It wasn't a clean game because earlier on it said Black was doing well, but it's a very Artemiev-like position where he poses problems that are not easy to solve. Yeah, and okay, it's a blitz game. Of course, when you are playing against Pragnalanda or you play against one of the best players in the world, you cannot dominate right from the start. It all comes down to keeping the tension, keeping your nerves, and of course, also the ability to handle the clock situation. And I think Artyom and Duda, two players that come to mind who are used to and are very familiar playing with just two seconds on the clock and still completely, quietly, chillingly playing. <laughs> it's a good way of putting it. And uh, you know, while we do have a moment, if we can bring up the game between Yana Pamshi and Dennis Lazic, Yana Pamshi took down uh, the teenager from Belarus who played so well, fought so admirably in the Champions Chess Tour Finals. Um, on move 34, uh, you know, this was a King's Gambit, so we had a lot of excitement. I don't know if we have time to go through all of it. So first of all, props to... Uh, Jan for playing the King's Gambit, always exciting. But after White's 34th move, Rook came up to uh, D3. This is very messy. The Black King is in trouble, but you saw the Elobar was favorable for Black. Now all of a sudden the King's in trouble, and here's where the sort of losing move was played. It's Bishop to B4 for Black, I think, is the only thing that saves you. You stop the check before it gets there, and if I go Queen to C5, you allowed the check to happen. The rook on g6 slices across the sixth rank. It saves black some time and helps defend the king. So a very difficult move to play. All of these moves are hard with no time on the clock. But queen c5 just walked into rook b3 check, and your king has nowhere to go. Going to a7 allows queen b7 mate. Going to c8 allows queen to e8 checkmate. So you're getting mated no matter which direction. You have to give up your queen, and it was smooth conversion for down the palm machine. Yes. Uh, that's that's it uh, with a couple of seconds on the clock clearly bishop b4 would have been a sensational save all of a sudden the rook protects kicks the queen away then black screen is ready to jump back to c5 go after the a5 point most probably white would have played queen a4 anyway and rely on this rook b3 threat it would have been still very exciting Maybe bishop takes a5, queen takes the two blacks, just gathering a bunch of pawns. But yes, an exciting position. And if we have time, uh, there, while well, this one, it did allow Yana Pamshi to get back towards that metal contention. The game between Magnus Carlsen and Vokidov, that was a game where um, Magnus got the win. But in fact, just two moves before the end of the game, Magnus was slightly worse. Vokidov was pressing. And at this moment, when Magnus brought his knight back to c2, it was a, an unforced error from Vokidov because the king walked to the wrong square for black to play rook takes b2. Because look at this, Peter. He simply forgot that after rook takes b2, knight takes d4, you can't take on f2 anymore. Yes, I don't know what he missed, or maybe he just missed that the two rooks are hitting the rook on b2. Yeah, he was already so happy thinking about, wow, I can take down the great Magnus Carlsen. And 
just one uh, lapse of concentration can lead to a total collapse. What a blunder. Black had everything under control. All the pieces beautifully placed, the weakness on B2, and then suddenly stepping into this uh, crazy blunder. Could have just traded knights and still been happy, but instead blundering on the second rank because the king walked into the knight's path and there was a check there for white. So just to show that even these super strong, talented youngsters, they make mistakes too. It happens to the best of us and all of us. So Magnus, he doesn't care how he gets it done sometimes as long as he keeps winning and he will play Artemia. But and we still have nothing to let you know about it seems like we have not had a resolution so we are going to try to figure these things out hopefully we can be in touch with someone on the ground and we will be back after this short break we apologize everybody for the inconvenience for the delay it's not up to us but we do hope things are resolved asap we will be back shortly to bring you more information and hopefully round seven of the world blitz
the heart of Central Asia lies the ancient city of Samarkand, Uzbekistan. Landmarked along the Silk Road, the spirit of the past still echoes through its ancient buildings and monuments. But today, modern-day warriors from all corners of the globe descend on this historical place, each vying for four of the most coveted titles in chess. And a handshake, Magnus Carlsen gets the double. Before the calendar's turn, the year closes out with six days of intense battles. He flagged! Brilliant strategies and unparalleled excitement. He's blundered! Magnus has made a new queen and now it's a huge turnaround. Will the experienced prevail? Or will a rising star defy expectations? Let the games begin. This is the 2023 FIDE World Rapid and Blitz Championship, and it starts now. Oof, this one's still anyone's game. Who will recover? Oh my gosh, what, what just happened? The evaluation she... bar is just turned all black. Wow. What? <gasps> what? Queen what? takes GF5. He can oh. sacrifice his queen and win on the spot. Oh. Oh. oh, what a oh move. My oh my God, will Magnus Carlsen find this? Queen takes GF5. We have to this show incredible. this. That's a checkmate entry. Wow. He doesn't oh, find it. Oh my God, he missed it. That is shocking. Magnus Carlsen missed a checkmate entry. And now Magnus uh, Carlsen, yeah, yeah. look at that. <laughs> he's seen it now. And he's you can see, oh, oh my God. Wow. Fabiano Caruana famously had a 7 out of 7 start at the 2014 Sinkful Cup. He also challenged Magnus Carlsen for the 2018 World Chess Championship title. How does a player get there, you might ask? For Fabiano Caruana, it is feared opening preparation. He is a theoretician like no other. In this 2016 game from the London Chess Classic, Fabiano Caruana demonstrated how deep his opening preparation can go. With the white piece against Hikaru Nakamura, Hikaru sacrifices a knight temporarily with knight takes g4. After Fabiano takes this knight on g4 with his bishop, Hikaru looks to win back the piece with e5, hitting the queen and the knight with his pawn. But Fabiano Caruana was a man on a mission. He says, you're not going to get your piece back. I'm going to sacrifice my queen on f6. And after the bishop took the queen, he puts his knight on d5. The queen slides back because under attack as the bishop of d8. And he plays knight f5, getting two pieces for the queen, but with a dominating positional advantage. He went out to win this nice game and just a great demonstration of his excellent and deep opening preparation. I was born uh, near Paris uh, and I've always lived uh, either in the suburbs with my parents and my sister. Yeah, I grew up like in a, you know, in a house uh, with garden, you know, normal neighborhood. Maxime Vachelagraf was introduced to chess when he was just five years old. My father taught me the rules and basically everyone in the family started playing for for a year or two, but then, uh, then it was all, all me. <laughs> At six years old, after only one year of playing the game, he showed signs of being an exceptional chess talent. I won uh, my first uh, French championship under eight that year. Say Paris Rapid and Blitz. And then I continued playing, continued winning these youth events. Uh, when I started getting medals also, uh, uh, with uh, competitors from all over the world, it was clear uh, I had the chance to to go further. I have pretty good intuition. I'm very resilient, uh, normally speaking, so I always try to create some trouble uh, for my opponents where, when I'm in a bad shape. Then I'm very good at spotting uh, quick tactics. Besides from being a top 10 chess player, Maxime has been able to study and get a degree in mathematics. This way I could socialize, I could um, keep on getting, having a life outside uh, the chessboard and it also felt more secure to have uh, a degree to rely on uh, should I stop uh, playing chess. Well, I've loved playing chess from the start, so for me it's all about the, the game, so the 
playing part so I, I'm not so fond of studying and uh, of course it's necessary but uh, what I like is playing games, uh, having fun, you know, even playing a blitz game, being able to trash talk a bit, uh, to, you know, be very casual and then of course the competitive part where, you know, I, I want to win the game, I want to to be the best uh, player I can be and to, to, beat, uh, to beat everyone basically. Magnus Carlsen, the world number one, multiple time world champion and winner of the previous two editions of the Champions Chess Tour. Magnus has played every opening under the sun. He even has a variation of the Sicilian named after him. So after e4, c5, Magnus started playing knight c3 a few years ago with the idea that he could open the center immediately by playing d4, actually going against conventional chess wisdom of developing the white queen very early. But the whole idea here is that after the queen gets kicked away, she's happy to step back. And for example, if black continues to develop normally, white just creates a fianchetto, gets the bishop to a nice diagonal, and later castles on the queen side. Actually a very aggressive opening, not technically part of Magnus's style. Magnus's real recipe for success is that he adopts his strategy according to the opponent. He's able to do anything with a very universal style and if you get him in the endgame, there's no chance. He's perhaps the best endgame player of all time. And you can go and check out some of his ideas, some of his thoughts on the endgame in his chessboard courses.
Welcome back to Chess.com's coverage of the FIDE World Blitz Championship. I'm Robert Hess. Alongside me is Grandmaster Peter Leko. Peter, we've been here for a while waiting to hear what is happening on the ground in Samarkand. Still no pairings up for the seventh round of the World Blitz Championship. And funnily enough, because Yu Yang Yi he couldn't understand some of the arbiters, they had to get women's world champion Ju Wen Jun to help translate. I mean, this is just a situation that does not seem to be resolved, and I don't know when it will be finished. Yeah, we hope for a good and fair solution. We don't know exactly what that solution should be, but uh, yeah, the show has to go on. I also feel for the, all the other players as well, waiting. This is one of the most awkward situations. Yeah, in the middle of the day, you feel like you might, after six uh, game of blitz, getting your rhythm, then you have a, almost an hour break. It can just kill your tournament. What has been the appeal or the situation that in your career uh, was maybe something drawn out like this? Do you have any recollections of uh, having to wait for quite a while to see a situation unfold? Yeah, absolutely. That was uh, in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, 2017, when that shocking uh, episode happened between Ernesto Inarkiev and Magnus Carlsen. Yeah, that uh, uh, Inarkiev had a claim that he wants to win based on illegal move or, or some complete craziness. <laughs> and finally, because first the arbiter has given him a point, then afterwards, of course, it was overruled. Then Ernesto was studying the FIDE handbook there. It was a very strange episode, finally, after a long, long procedure. I also remember that we've already seen it three times. I was facing the very young Andre Yesipenko at that moment. And uh, we had a pairing with Yesipenko. We sit down. Then there was a new pairing. Then again, back to Yesipenko. It was a very weird story. Did you end up playing Yesipenko in the end? Was that your final opponent? Yes, it was, and it was a very strange game because uh, I played slow, I got a winning position, then uh, be because he blundered, then I blundered back just when I saw that game is over, and then we both kind of felt like relieved that the game is over, and hopefully the next round will be already back to normal. Well, I will hope, and I'm going to keep my fingers crossed, that this gets back to normal soon because it's also, uh, for the players, not a great situation because... If I'm not mistaken, if I'm doing my time zones correctly, in Uzbekistan, isn't it nearing like seven in the evening? So if this continues to be delayed and there are six more rounds of blitz to be played, how are they going to get this done? Are they going to play until you know 10 p.m., maybe even midnight? Well, depending how long this uh, break will last, and we should also hope that we won't be seeing a repeat of this situation. Yeah, you, you can never rule it out. This is why we need adjournments again. This is where the old guard says, let's get adjournments because they made the pairings even when games were unfinished. So uh, I really hope that this situation does not take an eternity because for the players, it's not fun for them. For Artemiev, who was in rhythm, right? He won six straight games. Now you have to sit around waiting. Uh, you might lose that momentum and start getting tired. In fact, sitting around for a while can be more exhausting than playing all these games. Yes, exactly. It's uh, quite nerve wracking. Yeah, you know that you are facing Magnus Carlsen with the black pieces. That's kind of, uh, I think, pretty obvious. Uh, not, not entirely, okay. But in any case, he will be facing Magnus Carlsen, that's for sure. And uh, then how do you feel? Yeah, not that you are overthinking. We have been seeing, luckily, Magnus Carlsen enjoying uh the company of his uh, countrymen just uh, you have to find a way how to deal with this situation if you get angry if you are getting upset that can cost you dearly so somehow finding a positive out of this awkward situation is probably key to success and there is something to mention that preparing for blitz your opponents often play random things so it's not like you can trust their typical classical repertoire so while we have a few moments. Why don't we just show the end of this game between Hans Niemann and Anish Giri. Uh, we mentioned the results. It's a needed victory for Anish. He needs to win the World Blitz Championship. I think in clear first, unshared first place for him to make his way through the candidates. So Anish won with the black pieces against Hans Niemann. Uh, it was an end game that looked level, but in the end, Anish came out on top. 
Yes, and it's a very interesting moment and very instructive moment. I feel like uh, when we look at the position, Hans Niemann is trying to create something. At the same time, Anish's last move, I believe, was bishop c7 to b6. Yeah, let me just... Uh, yeah, there we go. We have the board. So yeah, last move was bishop c7 to b6, eyeing that e3 pawn, which was slightly weakened by White's ambitious play of pushing the kingside pawns forward. Black is relying on some rook d3 ideas, hitting both of the weak pawns. Okay, white can always answer it with rook c3. One could argue, why did I select exactly this position? Well, take a look what happened in the next couple of moves. It's uh, really incredible. a5, the first sign of, okay, putting that pawn on the dark square. If white will be able to be active, then it makes sense. Otherwise, it can be a potential weakness. Take a look, rook c3, protecting against rook d3 threat. And now comes the true mastery. Yeah, we have been praising Artyom. Yeah, we have been praising Magnus almost in every single game. What an endgame technique. Look at this regrouping. 96 to d8. Small little move, but with a huge impact. If Black Knight lands on c6, it hits the bishop and targets that vulnerable a5 pawn. So Hans reacted very naturally by using the opportunity to trade the dark spot bishops. Bishop c5 takes takes. The knight lands on c6. Very importantly, it stops white of reaching the d4 square with the knight. Then white would get stab stability. Now we see that those pawns are kind of isolated. So Hans is trying to solve the problem by four sequence of moves. Knight c3, rook d2, knight d5. A mistake, a miscalculation. But take a look what happened next. Rook b2, knight c7, rook takes b3, and knight takes a6. That was the defense uh, Hans was relying on, that b takes a6, rook takes c6, thank you very much. And here, clearly, both players were down to seconds, because otherwise, Anish would have spotted the devilish knight d4 check. Yeah, let's just put it on the board. Knight d4 check, the king moves somewhere, doesn't matter, and then the knight goes back to e6, hits the rook, and the knight is lost. Black would have won the game. Luckily for Anish, he did miss this opportunity, but the way how he continued, rook a3, it was also pawn up, knight c7, rook takes a5, and after some adventures, went on to convert this. Such an instructive moment because it's about pawn placement in these positions that look completely even. You have to see where can I create problems? What can I attack? That pawn push to a5, it clearly backfired for Hans, but uh, I think we're getting word that on site in Samarkand, the pairings, at long last, are out for round seven. So Magnus Carlsen gets the white piece against Vladislav Artemyev. Anish Giri, we just saw that endgame win over Hans Niemann. He gets white against Jan Napomshi. Jan Shistov Duda against Sanan Shigirov. Pragnananda, despite that loss, still in the top four boards, plays against Daniil Dubov, Gukesh on board five against Report, and Bolidar Mirzin against Yu Yang Yi. So it seems that the win for Yu Yang Yi was upheld uh, after all of that talk and going back and forth. Yu Yang Yi, he gets the win. He plays black against Volodar Mirzin on board six. So I hope that the players will sit down shortly as we are nearing 7 p.m. in Samarkand. And there we see Anish Kiri and Jan Napomishi. It looks like Jan is laughing to himself a little bit, but Anish is focused. Yeah, Anish, I think, uh, yeah, Anish is very focused. He has just won a game. Jan also winning in a King's Gambit. Uh, I think what uh, Jan is probably uh, feeling happy about that, wow, all this weight to be black against Hanish Giri? Wow, the, uh, why did I deserve that? <laughs> it's not uh, the easiest pairing that you could ask for, but it is Blitz Chess after all. And here we see more players are getting seated. That's Sanna Shigirov with the black pieces. He is adjusting as, them as we see players do. And his opponent is Jan Chistov Duda, the Polish Grandmaster who completely shines in the quickest of time controls. In classical chess, he's stalled, stagnated quite a bit after his World Cup victory. And here we see in the women's section, Valentina Gunina, she is in first place, gets the white pieces, and she's playing Gunai Mamedzada. So this is going to be a very important clash for the Azeri player. Back to the open is Pragananda taking off his lanyard. He is facing off the sweater wearing, oftentimes in Balenciaga, Daniel Duval. Yeah, a lot of action ahead. Incredible pairings. 
Yeah, it was worth waiting for it. I just feel like no matter where we are looking, we are treated to some incredible clash. And this is going to be our highlight matchup of the day. No, it's not Artemia versus the chair. Magnus Carlsen will sit, and I think he's coming. I see everyone looking around. There's the handshake. Magnus has appeared, and he gets the white pieces against Vladislav Artemiev. And Vladislav, he's dressed well for the occasion. If he can beat Magnus Carlsen here in the seventh round, he will be at minimum a full point ahead of the leaders. But with the black piece against Magnus Peter, you don't think about winning. You think first about stabilizing. Yes, absolutely. Anyway, it's uh, RTMF style to, to first of all just get a game, not think about the result, and then, ah, wow. Uh, Richard Laporte and Gukesh discussing the situation probably. Yeah, that uh, that's why we waited one hour to face each other. And you see them adjusting their pieces as they do, getting set, putting their knights in the correct direction. I like to have my knights facing forward. Peter, what about you? No, no. I'm basically sidewise, but slightly forward. Yeah, that uh, I don't want to be too aggressive towards my opponent. But I show that, yes, I have some sign of ambition. Okay, you don't reveal your intentions, at least not at the start of the game. I see Sagar Shah moving his tripod, uh, his camera there. I guess it, that wasn't a tripod, but I see a couple there. So the cameras are on the players. Can't wait for the action to begin. There's Report and Gukesh. It seems like the players, they just want the games to start. They're tired of sitting and waiting. Yes, they are sympathizing with each other. Yeah, one really feels like they don't fight against each other. They just sympathize because they have been in this awkward situation together. Uh, however, they have to forget about all this. They have to put that behind and be very focused right from the start. And Magnus Carlsen, he's smiling still. So uh, he's going to have to focus on the chest once more. As you said, you can't take a move off, especially not against Vladislav Artemiev with that boa constrictor style. Th these players do play similarly. And I mentioned earlier in the show that Artemiev beat Magnus in a match in the Champions Chess Tour in one of the events. So Artemiev, he's not afraid of Magnus and he shouldn't be. Yeah, he's not afraid of anyone and the against against any situation. I, I know this, he can have, yeah, there is the handshake, E4 on the board. What I wanted to highlight that sometimes he has like four seconds on the clock, his opponent has one minute. And if he believes that he has slight chance to continue the game, he continues with two, two or four seconds also to play for a win. And that's sort of tricky for players to manage because they often think, oh, my opponent's in time trouble, let me punish them. But Artemiev, Grishuk, all of these players, so good with just a few seconds on the clock. And both players here playing very quickly. In fact, Magnus has more time than he started with. What do you make of the opening here, Peter? Do you think it's more Magnus' style or Artemiev's? Oh. Well, it's, it's kind of uh, very funny that Magnus normally never allows the marshal, but he felt like, okay, against Vladislav, let me try. Will he dare to play d5? Vladislav took a little time. He paused for like 10 seconds. But nevertheless, he opted for d5. And Magnus declines the, the marshal. He does not take the pawn. He does not take the sacrifice. He goes d4 himself. This is quite an unorthodox way of fighting the marshal gambit. I like it, though, because it's forcing Artemiev to think. And Magnus, when he's ahead in the clock, he often punishes you. So we see a isolated pawn for white, that d4 pawn. For black, you have this kind of backwards pawn on c7, which has a knight in front of it. So there's good control of squares for white, but there is the weakest pawn on the board for white, the isolated pawn in end games. That will be a problematic piece. Well, it's all about uh, how to develop your pieces. Yeah, I believe that if uh, black is comfortably getting out, then it's all fine. The big question is, can you play the, the desired bishop g4 move, for example? Yeah, can you pin that knight? But what are the consequences? Atyame goes for the solid bishop f6. Magnus blitzes out the move knight c3 instantly. That's the whole point of white's play. I wouldn't take that knight. Because if knight takes b takes c3, the d4 pawn is defended. And white has more pawns in the center. And that bishop on b3 stares across the diagonal. But if I don't take on c3, I don't know if I believe in bishop e6. Sometimes there are even exchange sacrifices in the square. But more uh, pertinently, knight e4 is coming. And that knight will reroute itself. 
Wow! And actually, ATML has gone for Knight XC3, Beat XC3, Bishop F5. He plays in the Petro of Spirit. I do feel like this is very much a Petro. It's not a Marshal anymore. He wants to play Knight A5, hit that Bishop, eventually follow it up with C5, or just trade the light squared Bishop if Magnus is uh, going back to C2, which would be clearly very good news for Black. White has to be energetic in order to make the maximum out of this position. And they say you need plans in chess, but I'm worried about the slow plan. And it's not on the board, it's on the clock. Look at Artemiev's time, Peter. He's down to about a minute, 15 seconds, compared to Magnus's two minutes and 40 seconds. I, you just can't give that much extra time to Magnus, perhaps unless you are Artemiev. As you said, he can play so well with no time on his clock. Yeah, exactly. I think that uh, for Artyom, mean, it's very important to get his type of positions. And if he gets them, then he's not afraid being low on the clock. Yeah, Magnus goes bishop a3, trying to hit that rook on f8 and trying also to give Black the opportunity to think, yeah, please burn some more time. Do you include the move knight takes b3 or do you go rook e8? Finally, rook e8 is on the board. Queen d2 played by Magnus. Okay, but I'm not liking what Magnus is doing. I can just take take and play queen d5. What's my problem? Magnus is playing for the clock at this stage. He's sensing that Artemiev, he is a little bit too methodical in his approach, but it is a good position for Black, as you mentioned. We saw the trade on b3, but no follow-up just yet. It took him a few seconds to play queen d5. He has enough time, Peter, but I'm just getting concerned that if every move he's spending three seconds instead of responding instantly, that could get him in danger. Maybe, but I'm I'm having this feeling that if we would ask now, we would have the chance to ask uh, Vladislav, how do you feel about this? He would say, yes, I'm happy with my situation because with the black pieces, I had a perfect, I have a perfectly normal position against Magnus. The clock I will handle somehow. But look at this, the queen went to f4. Can you take on b3? You have to calculate it. And it looks like instead of taking Artemia moves back bishop e6, it is a good move. It keeps everything under control. The c7 pawn at some point will be vulnerable, but for now b3 is more important. So I think Magnus, he can try a move like b4, which is super ugly for his dark square bishop. But I don't think you want to take on c7 and allow queen takes b3. That looks like it plays in the black's hands. Yes, uh, absolutely. The, the b3 pawn is very important. It's all about the light squares. The c7 pawn is also typically in the pattern of defense, not something that Black really worries about if he gets the control of the light squares. Also, not to not to forget about Black's queen side majority. Yeah, with uh, with some a5 ideas, and there you go. That's why Magnus plays this ugly move before to stop a5. Yeah, at least. See... Yes. Sorry, Peter. I was going to say you could see him shake his head. He didn't want to play that move, but he felt he had to. Yes, and that's the point. Yeah, after Queen BC, he also has to fall back with his king, Queen to C1, protecting the Bishop on AC and the pawn on the other hand. The Knight is ready to be re-employed. And there we see, do we gonna see a repetition of moves? I think Magnus should be happy with a repetition because his position is bad, but Artemiev's clock is not so good. So here comes the Queen back to B3. Magnus doesn't really have a choice besides Queen C1. His Bishop is under attack, as is that pawn on C3 but maybe he will move his knight. So he wants to put Artemiev on the clock. So if queen c1, queen d5, as you said, knight d2 becomes a possibility. Well, knight d2 was my idea to kick the queen out, but that's why Artemiev also plays the move queen d5. Knight d2 can be met by bishop g5, for example, pinning that knight. Yeah, and that's it. Repetition of moves, shake hands, draw agreed by repetition. Art Artemiev is too darn solid. What a classy player he is. He was never in trouble on the board. The only thing to note was his clock, but Magnus did the professional thing. You're not just going to win a game because Artemiev has 19 seconds. Two seconds are added with every move played. Artemiev, he plays a lot of bullet online, tons of blitz. So they're going to discuss the position maybe a little bit, but a fair result. Yeah, I think uh, this art with which he can be very happy. I also see that Anish Gidi against Jan Yepomachi has already ended a draw. Let, let us go into the Pragnananda Dubov game. I'm pretty sure that there we should have tons of action. Come on, please update the system. <laughs> oh, it seems like not only are there delays, there yes. are relay issues, and there we have oh. it. So great to have this game up to speed. And, oh, this is a messy position where taking the knight on e5, that surprises me. Yeah, but knight d3 was an issue. It's not a happy choice. Clearly not a happy choice from white side. 
And Prague is down to three seconds if the clocks are correct. Uh oh, can't be in this kind of time trouble against Daniil Dubov. And Queen H4, the Queen is infiltrating. That black rook can slide away from E5. A bishop should land there. And whoa, what was that? It seemed like a sacrifice on H3. Wow, the bishop c8 and then bishop takes h3. That that's what no rook g5 f4. Knight of ah, three. Sack on f3 here, and then after g takes f3, queen takes h3 check. Yes, that's very bad news. By the way, there are also all kinds of tricks. But how where is the killer blow? You need to get that dark square bishop involved in if I'm seeing this correctly, the black... And you play bishop d4. Exactly. Bishop d4 takes rook c2. And then rook d2, queen g3. What a stunner. And that's the, there is the resignation. Fantastic play by Dubov. Look at this. Bishop d4 check. The bishop has to be captured. Then black enters with the rook to c2. You have to protect. You don't have other choice than to protect with rook d2. And then queen g3 check. Picks up both rooks. And black wins the game. What happened? How did the game finish? I think he just resigned. That was ah, a it was resignation that's, spot. Yeah. Wow. Ah, yes. Even in fact, black started with queen g3 check to stop any queen f2. Okay. Brilliant play, but we have no time to deal with this. Let's move on. Duda, Duda against Yugilov. And we're going to try to pull this board up. Yanches of Duda playing against Sanan Shigirov. Shigirov with the black pieces right now. Uh, the board is not updating, so we hope that... Oh, there it goes. As soon as I say that, we get it. And no time for either player, it seems. But Black has a huge advantage. Black is just crushing through. Yeah, checkmate is coming with Queen H to check. After Queen E5. No way of stopping that. And resignation. So we see Jan Chisabduda give in. And for San Shigirov, I feel like people don't know that name yet. They are going to continue seeing it as he beats Duda. He already beat Fabiano Caruana, and now he's up to six points out of seven games. Well, so let's continue the journey. Yeah, the woman, Alexander Kostenyuk, we are jumping to the woman section. And let's see the players. They are scrambling along. It looks like we're in a queen endgame of some sort, but there is a bishop for white on b2 and a knight for black on c6 so a very active king for black but an extra pawn for white yeah we are waiting for the system to upload and well we just see the players quickly making moves i see a black king on a4 and a black queen on c2 so much progress being made by the black force make king b3 i bring the king in even more yeah white is pawn up yeah white is activating the king but black will have tons of checks Already, there's a check on c6, and that's game over because the king would wow. have to step into a square with a knight would fork the king and queen. Wow, exactly stepping into this uh, king h1, queen c6 idea, and then the fork is coming no matter where you go with the king. What a terrible turnaround! And it's just because the knight can go from color complex to color complex. The bishop was stuck on the dark squares in the f3 square. The knight was going to hop right in, steal the queen and the game. And look at that king on a4. You don't see that every day, Peter. But I think that's really what won Alexander the game. Yes, exactly. It was hiding beautifully there. And then the queen was giving all the checks. Obviously, white should have been better, objectively speaking. But in time table, knights are very dangerous. What a win that was for Kostenyuk on board two. We did see Valentina Gunina win with white on board one. And now we've switched back to the open section. That was the game between Shigirov and Duda. What game? Uh, what games are still going? Yeah, I'm trying to find Barat against Raunak Sadvani. Is this still in progress? Okay. It could be. It looks like... A extra pawn for white but not that clear with the black king trying to go into g4 yeah but look c5 check look e5 that should seal it on the other hand i believe that something is wrong with the transmission oh that has definitely been a theme so it looks like white should have a win with rook c5 to e5 and ah, but it's in progress look at this it's still in progress. <laughs> but what can black do i mean you have to play rook e8 and the c pawn can even sacrifice itself 
yes to clear the way it looks like a win okay we can try to go king h6 king g7 king f7 but it also runs into f5 and here here come the moves all happening at once so white just pushes the c pawn and black is not in time because the black rook has to stay put and then the white king can just venture forward yeah that's it a very big win for barat subramanian who continues to impress us he does and so does johan sebastian christensen i'm looking at the standings right above our faces here and magnus carlson in fourth place six out of seven and then johan sebastian christensen the top five and a half scorer by tiebreak so he's in uh, that joint standing along with yana pomshi and anish girian oh my goodness what a final position that is yeah look at this yeah this is the checkmate that johan sebastian delivered to arjun i guys see incredible he has checkmated gukesh and he has also checkmated Arjun Aligaisi. Incredible. So I think he's gained the respect of India, but also probably their hatred. He keeps beating some their best players. So Johan Sebastian Christian took down Gukesh in fine style, beats Arjun Aligaisi by checkmating him with uh, a mate on C7. Well done by the Norwegian player. And all eyes are on him, especially if Prague Nanda faces him. They're going to be like, no, leave him alone, not Prague too. No, no, no. Prague already has beaten him. Yes. Yeah? So. Oh, yes. Prague <laughs> yes, in, in that great uh, strategical battle. So at least someone managed to stop him. Okay, so uh, we see their results. Magnus Carlsen drew against Artemiev, Anish Giri, and Yana Pamshi a quick draw. Yachisov Duda lost with the white pieces against Salon Shugirov. Pragnana lost with white against Dubov. We saw the conclusion of that game. And Richard Report, he makes Indian fans unhappy because he takes down Gukesh and Volodar Merzin. I mean, this kid is so solid. He made a very quick draw against Yu Yangi. I won't blame Yu Yangi, probably dealing with a lot of emotions after the appeal. But Maxime Vasher Lagrav doesn't wait for anybody. He wins again. JSC, Johan Sebastian Christensen, Alexei Serrana, Nihal Sarin, Salem Saleh, and Alexander Rachmanov all score wins to head on up the score group. Wow. Yeah, it, it was a very special round after this long break. We could see also in, in Magnus did not perform according to his standards. Uh, Artyom was playing rock solidly, a uh, little bit slowly. That's true trademark of him. But uh, I feel like Magnus was at some point just playing too much on Artyom's clock instead of paying attention to details, which usually he does much better. Well, Artemiev, he stays in the lead with that draw. He staves off Magnus Carlsen. And we saw many decisive results in the Women's World Blitz as well. Uh, so for Valentina Gunina, she keeps her lead. Uh, she is playing amazing chess. So she was not deterred after the uh, appeal and the long wait. So we are going to head to break when, when we... Oh, before we head to break, actually, the women's section, I was mentioning Valentina Gunina's victory over Gunai Mamanzada, and Divya Deshbrook saw her lose, unfortunately, to Alexander Kostenyuk. Harika, though, now the Indian fans have something to cheer as Harika wins against Umina Omanova. Bodner, Peter, I, I, she can't be stopped. She wins again, this time with black over Zhu Jina. She wants a second gold medal. Yeah, unbelievable. What a fighting spirit. We have been admiring her her fighting spirit throughout in the rapid section and in the playoff against Hampi Connelly and she continues to deliver. Okay, so we see Alexander Goryachkina. She is trying to work her way back. She wins against Nergil Selimova. That was the Women's World Cup final. And we see Mugunto. She wins. Ju and Jude held to a draw against Teodara Injac. Uh, Bibisara Asabayeva. She's winning again. So a very streaky tournament thus far for Bibisara. And Lea Garifulina. She was a win away in the rapid from time for first place. She lost the final game with Gunina. She takes down Matnadze. Meanwhile, Mumzul beats Vaishali. So it does seem, based on these results, that many of the Indian players, they struggled in the seventh round. But it's all Valentina Gunina right now in the Women's World Blitz. Behind her, Trail Kostenyuk, Harika Jonavali, and Anastasia Bodnaruk. So uh, we have four players who have established themselves ahead of the pack, namely Valentina Gunia, who is seven out of seven. Yeah, unbelievable. The big question, who will stop her? Will at all anyone be able to stop her? At some point, every streak should come to an end. 
but uh, Valentina is still hanging on to it. She's hanging on and she's playing super well. We'll see if she can keep that pace up. Scorching Hot is her play and the city of Samarkand is delighted to host the World Rapid and Bull Championship. All the players, they step away from the boards. We will step away from you for just a bit. When we return, it's more action from the World Bull Championship. Do not go anywhere. My name is Elwood Dawson. I'm from Chicago. I'm Sika Blackman. My name is Roberto Beza, Jr. And what I want to share is I love tacos. Tacos and chess. So, yeah. With the chess program, really, even chess in general, like on the deck, you, uh, you kind of lose yourself. You don't really think about your case. You learn to think differently. You know, you strategize more. I sometimes come out uh, 7.30 in the morning, I'll probably play until lockup, you know, so it makes my day go by faster. It's competitive, it's a lot of trash talk, it's, it's, it's crazy, you know, like the chess players, we got our own little circle, you know, and all of us play each other, we talk trash about who be who, who garbage. Yeah, I never play that dude again, he garbage, I never play him, but yeah, it's real competitive. Looking for a new way to learn chess? Meet Dr. Wolf, the ideal chess coach and companion. Play against Dr. Wolf as he explains everything step by step, points out strategic ideas, and alerts you to your mistakes. Train with him and go over your past mistakes until you master them. Choose from over 35 lessons created for all skill levels. No matter your level, everyone could use a coach. Download Learn Chess with Dr. Wolf for Android or iOS devices today. Have a friend or family member who loves chess? Gift them a Chess.com membership today and see them take their game to the next level. You can choose a gold, platinum, or diamond membership for one month or one year. Want your gift to arrive on your friend's birthday or on a holiday? Gifts can be scheduled to arrive up to 90 days in the future. All premium plans include an ad-free experience, unlimited puzzles and lessons, and unlock all bots. Go Platinum to add unlimited game review or Diamond to unlock insights and coach explanations. Give the gift of chess today.
We return with round eight of the World Blitz Championship. We have a soul leader in both the Open and the Women's World Blitz. It is Vladislav Artemiev and Valentina Gunina enjoying their environments. The sun has set on this day in Uzbekistan, but the play continues uh, from the tournament hall. On this day, it is going to be the first of two in the Blitz Tournament. I'm Robert Hess. Alongside me is Grandmaster Peter Leko. Peter, we've had some fun fights. We've had some kind of quiet draws, but with just a couple games left in the women's and then still uh, five more left in the open, do you expect to see players take it easy before day two or to give it their all as we near the end of the day? I think the players will give their all because you just can't slow down. You just can't really believe that uh, with some draws, you can stabilize your position. There are so many players behind you trying to capitalize on such strategy. And besides also psychologically, yeah, if you are not willing to fight and there are still plenty of games to go, I don't believe that you can just slow down mentally. And some of the players yeah, in the Rapid, they were taking some quick draws. We actually have seen that in the Blitz thus far, Anish Giri, Yana Pamshi, and some other games. But as we look at some of the matchups, we go to the second page where Barak Subramanian, he takes on Alexi Serrano. That's such a fun matchup where we know the top players. We've seen Magnus Carlsen, uh, but look at these ones as well. Poor 10, Hans Neiman against Pragnananda. You have Patsulaya against Gukesh, and we have an all-Indian clash. Arvind against Vidit. So as we now get back to the top boards, I'm just excited, Peter. All of these matchups are mouthwatering. Yes, Zyugilov against Magnus Carlsen, Daniel Dubov against Artemiev, Jan Nepomniac against Salem Saleh. A very special match there. Uh, Bosa, Grunfeld specialist, but now it's Jan playing from the right side. Interesting which opening it will be. Rapport against Rachmanov. Sniha Sadin against Maxim Vashilagraf and Johann Sebastian Christiansen against Anish Giri. Clash of styles there. Oh, a complete clash of styles. And all of these matchups are exciting. Nihal Sarin against Maxim Vashilagraf, a rematch from the Speed Chess Championship. And there is Sanan Shigiro getting the white pieces waiting for his opponent to sit down. And Magnus Carlsen typically shows up. All the cameras flock on over to him. But in the background, we see more players shaking hands as the next round is set to begin in just a few. That's Yana Pamshi with the white pieces. Salem, your friend, Peter. He gets black and it's good to see him on the top boards. Yes, absolutely. But two of my very good friends, yeah, Yan Yapomiyashi and Salem Saleh facing each other. And we see there Valentina Gunina scooting in with the black pieces as she is taking on Harika Dranavali, not a player that you want to take for granted. A strong grandmaster from India, a hero of her country, and somebody who can strike and beat Gunina if she is not on her A game. So Kastenyuk against Bonner on board two. And then we start to see some uh, interesting pairings. Munguntul against Narva, Bibisar Asabayeva, taking on Goryachkina, Lakno, Ushenina. And we have Mamadzada against Deshmukh. So, a lot of great action on these top boards. Yeah, absolutely. Harika also, I think, has the speed. And we have Johann Sebastian Christians and our camera chatting out with Anish Giri. And there's some smiles, some laughter. But for Anish Giri, there is so much at stake. I'm assuming he's trying to avoid putting too much pressure on himself. You can't just will your way to first place in the World Bliss. But Anish, if he gets that title, he does get a trip to the candidates. Yeah, it's amazing what an opportunity it is for Anish after all. There is still a possibility, there is still a chance. Yeah, And as long as there is a chance, and he's very much in the mix, he's playing incredible chess. And uh, yeah, Johann Sebastian Christian then showing that he's feeling comfortable being among the big boys. Yeah, He was chatting there with Anish. Very nice to see this. And look at these two. They're talking, I don't know about what, uh, maybe about a previous game, but it's good to see friendly conversation on such a big stage because uh, Harika Dronavali, she saw her compatriot in a long time. I don't want to call it rival because they are on friendly terms with Humpy, but Humpy was on this very board where she lost that final playoff game for the Women's Rapid Championship. Yeah, and now we see Alexander Kostanyuk waiting for Anastasia Bodnaruk. What an incredible journey uh, 
Anastasia is showing us here, winning the Rapid in the Blitz playoff and now also playing a fantastic event in the Blitz section as well. And she was the first international master to win the Women's World Rapid. What an achievement for her. She cried in just pure joy. And that was great to see. I mean, all of that energy that she put in, she had to let it out. She expressed it with tears. But what an accomplishment for her. And if she can add another medal to her trophy case, uh, it would be completely unheard of, unexpected. But what a triumph for Anastasia. But these two players right here, Valentina Gunina, Harka Giannavali, they don't care about the feel-good stories of other players. They just have to focus on their chest because if Valentina wins again, I mean, she may seem invincible. Yeah, eight out of eight already taking out uh, many of your direct uh, opponents, concurrents. Uh, that would be a giant step forward. But for the moment, Harika Dronvali is playing with the white pieces, very determined. Look at the concentration. She knows what's at stake. This is a very important game. Gunina looks pretty chill. Uh, for somebody who's in first place as the target on her back, uh, she has been playing calmly but super well. I've been very impressed with her play. Uh, Peter, I think one of the biggest compliments you can say about Gunina is she can win at any time. She's an aggressive player, but sometimes that's also been her downfall in tournaments where she goes on these huge swings. It does seem her style and the handshakes are there. The first move is about to be played. It seems like she's adopted quite a solid approach for this event. Yes, she goes for the Slav, uh, but now Harika, instead of going GC for the Reti setup, prefers a different one. I even don't know what, what to call this. It's, uh, it's a very special kind of structure. And we see an early capture on F3. The queen takes back. And white has what we often consider the two bishops advantage, but what black will do is put all these pawns on light squares to say, yes, you're the only one with a light square bishop, but you're not going to have an open diagonal. Yes, uh, it will most probably be a Slav structure. Of course, in order to call it a Slav, White will have to push the pawn all the way to d4. Now we have seen Gunina pausing a little bit because she had the opportunity to push d5, d4 herself, but she does not want to get distracted. Sticks to her setup. It's a good choice because she also could have played e7 to e5 if she wanted to gain more space in the center. Uh, but now we have that Slav. I believe d4 was just played. And you have the party hat from b7 to d5 and back to f7, the triangle pawn structure. It's a super, super, excuse me, I just mixed super and solid at the same time, but super solid position for black. How do you crack this if you're thinking about it from Harika's perspective? Well, I feel like, oh, bishop d2, I wanted to say that knight d2 would have been kind of natural, but then black would have played knight e4, forcing trades. That's why the move bishop d2 was played. However, the two bishops advantage is gone. Black remains solid. Yes, white has a little bit of space to rely on with the d4, c4 pawns, but eventually white be also seeing some queen e7, yeah, queen e7, e5, or d takes c4, e5, transpose, uh, transforming the structure. It looks very solid for black. I want to keep our attention here in this positional battle, but I just want to note that Dubov versus Artemia was a draw in three moves. The players, they didn't even try to have a combative game. They wanted a little bit of rest. We, I've already spoken at length how I feel about draw offers. I don't blame the players. I blame the system. But it is sad when players can just agree for a draw without playing a real game. But this is very much a real game, Peter. Now that all the black pawns are in light squares, are you starting to like Black's chances? Because I am. No, no, no. I'm I'm still with White on the other hand. I was not sure if I want to break with uh, E4. Is that the right break? Because now the D4 pawn might become a bit vulnerable. Okay, Bishop F3, White is clearly hoping for some D4, D5 break, seeing that the black screen is uh, pinned along the E5. Yeah, the queen sidesteps immediately. I typically like these positions from the black side just because I feel like the bishop on f3 still isn't operating in a useful manner. And as you're pointing out, look at how easy black's plan is. And wow, white decides to strike with d5 just to liquidate. All the pieces get traded off on d5. I think we will see handshakes and a draw for her. Well, white is relying on this extra tempo that she has already created Luft with h3. Black is still missing that, uh, that move, but... The position is so symmetrical. Black should have time to open the, the window. And I'm just curious if they will continue this game. And, and when Black makes Luft and the king doesn't have a checkmate, uh, 
problem, then I think it's completely even. And rook d8 doesn't actually threaten the queen, though she moves the queen back to e4. Don't blunder queen e8 checkmate. And the draw is agreed. Yes, that's it. Now black would have played the move g6 and have everything under control. And that's just a well-played game. When uh, these strong grandmasters play like this, a handshake is a natural result with a draw in the piece because there was just limited material. Everything uh, was protected, but they did try. And once Harika said, okay, I've got nothing. Let me just simplify and make that draw. And look at this matchup. San Shigirov with the white pieces against Magnus Carlsen. Uh, Magnus really wants to get a victory because he'll join Artemiev with seven out of eight. But Shigirov would like to win too. And then he can join Artemiev in that score group. Yes, exactly. And look at this. Zukido's up on the clock. He has the A file. The look is ready to invade. Look B8 is criticized by the computer. Also, Bishop F4 could be a move targeting that look with the tempo. Eventually, White's look is entering. Magnus in some difficulty here. I think Magnus wants to play c5, which is why he put his rook on b8. But your point is well taken. Bishop f4 kicks the rook off of the b file. And if black has to play b4 at some point, you've given all the light squares. And the white king would like to make a mad dash to the c4 square. Exactly. Yeah, if black pushes b4, he has to make sure that he will be also able to push c5, c4 before white gets something like this in. That would be terrible. But now I do feel, yeah, G5 tempo. And then, okay, the G5 pawn will have to be guarded before black pushes C5, C4. But it's just a matter of time. Long-term weaknesses for black. Because even if uh, C5 is defended for now, it's on a dark square. And he plays C4. He gives up the G5 pawn. So that can be captured at some moment. But be careful. Black is actually trying to threaten a pass pawn of his own. I think white now needs to sit and think because you can go wrong. Yes, absolutely. And the justification is that if black would have spent time to defend the pawn on g5, then white could now simply take, take and use that extra tempo of bringing the king to d3. Everything would be beautifully protected. Black would have all the weaknesses. So Magnus understands this very well that he has to create counterplay on the queen side as quickly as possible. He caught Shigirov off guard. He paused, took on c4, and then went rook a2. I have to say, I love that decision because the status quo favors white. You have the healthier pawn structure. Black's pawns are scattered. b4 and d4, isolated pawns. Great backup there from Sana Shigirov. Yes, and the game is very easy. He has a clear vision of what to do. That's also very important. He has the upper hand on the clock as well. So a combination of good position, and the very difficult one for Magnus to defend, plus also time advantage for Zugirov. Zugirov is Magnusing Magnus. I mean, this is really a classy game thus far from the white pieces. And the king goes to d3, d4 is under attack, b4 is a target. The rook on a2 will be free to move. White has everything under control. Now it's a matter of can Magnus withstand the pressure? Yes, and the problem is that b3 is met by rook b2, pinning that rook. So Magnus is not able to get rid of that weakness. Ah, but he just made move f6. I saw that on the camera feed. And if the king takes on d4, there is rook d8 check ideas with bishop c5 to follow. So you have to be uh, careful in some of these positions from the white side. Also, after king d4, b3 does become available because there's a rook check on d8. So if you want to liquidate, that might be an option. Yeah, I feel that I don't want to touch that uh, d4 pawn. On the other hand, okay, what do we do? The rook has to kind of stay on a2 if we want to stop b3. f4 played. Yeah, okay. f4. G takes, takes f4. And now all of black's pawns are isolated. So I like that decision from Shigirov. Even if the engine criticizes it a little bit, I think it was a smart try from Shigirov. It's, it's an interesting try in any case. But uh, why is the, the system not updating? No, it's just what's going to happen. The relay from the live sites, unfortunately, is uh, not always up to speed. But we see that B3 has been played. So the pawn D4 was stolen, Peter, but we don't have much material remaining. Yes, and look B2 is now met by a look B4 check. Intermezzo, very important. And if Magnus is able to trade those pawns, then he should hold this. It looks like rook b2 was met by rook d7 check. So either way, he got out of ah, okay. uh, the pin and then he traded on c2. Yes. Yeah, and okay, rook takes c2, king f7. And this should be holdable. 
you know, the pawn can go up to g4. Uh, you can just try to trade rooks at some point on c7. But I could see on the body language, Magnus, uh, he doesn't look like he is the least bit dis disturbed or bothered by White's position. Yes, he knows exactly that he was in so much more trouble than this. At the same time, probably Sugilo is anyway very happy. Yeah, Magnus even goes for the rook trade. The bishop endgame also looks like a draw. And that was a funny time for the chat to flash that Magnus will win when he has no winning chances whatsoever. But uh, here we see that it's king, bishop, and three versus king, bishop, and two. And yeah, Magnus does draw these for breakfast and hopefully for dinner because it's late in Uzbekistan. Yeah, bishop e1, hitting the pawn on h4. Of course, white pushes the pawn. Yeah, the moves are coming in way too quickly. The point is we are not really missing out on any action. The, the moves are quite standard going back and forth. There is no breakthrough. Nope, because the only way to try to break through is to trade off more pawns. And uh, if all the pawns are gone, and even if White's up a bishop, a draw is agreed, the handshake was there. So Shigirov, he proved that he should be on these top boards. He wasn't worse for even a second against Magnus Carlsen, but Magnus, even when it looked uncomfortable, he was still able to hold. Yeah, and let's get inside the Nyanya Pomachi Salem Sale game. What's happening I here? I think I see a rook for white and a bishop for black. So an extra exchange for Yana Pomchi, and there's a resignation because the rook is kicking the bishop about and the pass pawn would determine the game. So Yana Pomchi gets a very important win. Yes, we can see the disappointment on uh, Salem's face. Nice to see the players discussing it. Uh, Jan clearly enjoying it. He has won a very important game. And you see Salem, uh, you know, he may be talking about what just happened, but he's probably kicking himself a little bit. He was on that stage near the top, but he did suffer a defeat. And Yana Pamshi will happily take that full point and march forward towards the top of the standing. So what game is this, Peter? This is Hans Niemann versus Pragnananda. It looks very good for Black. Pragnanda is about to win. No defense here possible. The G3 pawn is also falling. Looks like endgames have not been Hans's friend, Peter, because we saw the game against Anish, where Anish had the black pieces, and now Pragnanda stealing pawns all over the place, and the result is in a win for Pragnanda. Yes, it's a resignation. Let's try to find something. Richard Rapport against Rachmanov. Is that game on? No. Richie wins. A very important win for him. Barat Subramanian against Alexei Sadana. Is that game still on? Let me try to load that game up. Lots of games finishing nearly simultaneously. Uh, the playing hall still has a number of participants there. And so uh, with Magnus Carlsen drawing his game, Artemiev making the quick draw with Dubov, it seems that Vladislav remains in first place. And I don't think anyone caught up to him. Yeah, basically that quick draw, yeah, we don't like those quick draws, but it's, it's perfectly understandable. Uh, unfortunately, the game is not loading. Some technical error happened. Okay, let's take a look at the standings. And we see Artemyev. He has seven points out of eight games. Dubov, Nepomishi, Giri, Shigirov, Magnus Carlsen, Richard Report, all with six and a half points. So uh, we see players, they're bunched up from second all the way down through seventh. And Pragnanda, with that win over Hans Niemann, gets to the six-point score group, a full point behind Artemyev. Yes, and this is the final position of Jan Sebastian Christiansen against Anish Giri. What an important victory for the dream is still alive. Anish is fighting. Anish is definitely fighting, and he's playing some great chess. He beat Johan Sebastian Christiansen. The Norwegian hopeful has suffered another defeat, but still having an excellent event having defeated uh, Gukesh earlier in the tournament, as well as Arjun Aragaisi. More results are in. Uh, Sidipa beat Duda. Wow, what a run for him. Yu Yangi drew another game. I'm actually starting to wonder if Yu Yangi, who won the earlier game, if he was the most rattled by the appeal. I haven't actually looked at the game, but his quick draw against Morzin, and now another draw. I hope he is doing okay uh, psychologically. But Levan Patsulaya with the upset there, Peter. He beats Gukesh. Yeah, wow. Okay, that's uh, that's insane. Because Gukesh is so strong, but somehow a part of winning many games, he's also losing quite some. 
uh, he doesn't yet get that feeling that I'm completely invincible. But uh, okay, uh, what I'm having here is exactly Yuanji's game against Alexander Shimanov, which end in a draw after White has played the move B to B3. I understand what you are what you are signaling. Yeah, Yuanji hasn't been the same person ever since that appeal. And look at this position. I mean, it's not one where you see, oh, it's an end game like the Gunina versus Haruka game. There is nothing, no life left for players of that caliber. But here, there's so much uh, left that's untold and will not be because the players did agree to a draw. I don't blame the players. I actually really feel for Yu Yangi. It's uncomfortable to be in a situation where you may feel you won a game by means that weren't just your own play because the clock uh, stopped working. But the appeal was denied. Yu Yangi got that point. And so it is now in the past for. Uh, the results at least and speaking of results let's talk about the women's world boots championship we watched Valentina Gunina hold a draw against Harika on board one Peter Anastasia Bodnaruk I mean she is the talk of the tournament she won the rapid and can, if you could pull up the game we will show that uh, after looking through these results here because Anastasia Bodnaruk she beats Alexandra Kostenyuk with the black pieces and even two moves before the end of the game it didn't look like she was going to, but she continues to outlast her opponents. Well, look at this. This is a completely shocking defeat and one has to feel for Alexander Kostenyuk. Getting checkmated like this with Queen F8, it's a horror for any chess player because she had been, we don't know what happened before, but definitely here she is on the way of victory. There is no way of stopping that deep on. What happened here? Checks, checks. Okay, the queen, king is hiding, trying to hide there. Yeah, there is some safety. And here we go. After d7, queen before check, it just looks like it's one move away. White from queening. So white, white does not want to put the king in front of the pawn. She plays the move king e8, which is a horrible blunder because of queen f8 checkmate. Insane. What a shock. And actually, if the king went to d8, there would have been the same checkmate, but just uh, taking a move longer because after king d8 instead, the queen goes to b8 first with check, forcing the king back to e7 and queen f8 is mate. And so if you don't touch your king, the engine says you're winning the game. If she blocked with the queen, the only other legal move, she's winning. The queen, yes, can give a check on the e-file, but the black king, excuse me, the white king will run away to a square like d8 and then wrap around and you will be able to promote. Yes, exactly. Basically, what kind of checks we are dealing with? Queen A check, we can simply play King C7, Queen A7 check, King C8. Okay, still the battle goes on because King C8 is met by Queen A check and Queen B8 can be answered by Queen C6 check. And when you have little time on the clock and it's not exactly trivial, it's always very tricky. Clearly, White is winning after Queen A7. The best way is probably to play King C6 and after Queen A check, Simply king b6, for example, d8, queen is a threat. And after queen d8, you can pick up the pawn or you can also just play the move queen c7. I think that's the most professional move. Kicking that queen away and after queen f6 check, you just hide that king somehow. And eventually, for example, let me give some more checks. And we are hiding it on c8. And finally, after queen f8 check, we have d8 check ourselves winning the game. So it was a winning position for Alexander Kostenyuk, but woulda, coulda, shoulda, Anastasia Bonnerke gets the win. And if you look at the standings, clear second place for her. It's unbelievable what she's been able to uncork in Samarkand, her best chess of her career. Uh, this is remarkable stuff from the international master who is a great player here in, in her own right, but this must go between her wildest dreams and expectations to be just a half point from the leader this far into the tournament after winning the Rapid, I can't even talk about another player, Peter. Gunina's in first, but Bodner, she continues to shine. Yes, absolutely. But what comes to my mind, I feel so sorry for Alexander. I hope that she will be able to be mentally strong enough to overcome this. We, we have been there. We know what it means. It's such a shock that I don't know how she will recover from it. And we've seen this in day after day, players experiencing heartbreak. There was Humpy Canero yesterday. We saw Vidit Gujarati, just complete despair after losing to Fedoseyev. So it's going to happen. Blunders happen in Blitz Chess. Blundering checkmate in one like that, not something you see every day. So we do wish Alexandra well. Hopefully she can recover. And while she takes the time to try and do that, we will also 
bounce for a little bit, but when we return, it's more from the World Blitz Championship. You don't want to miss this action. It's been a lot of fun and it will continue to be, so don't you leave. Another one of the VIPs from the Chess Kid National Festival. We have the OG Papa Bear here. I am Danny Wrench, and he's going to be starting a very innovative concept. What do you got? Yeah, I'm going to be facing off against Women's Grandmaster Jennifer Shahadi in our first ever Puzzle Bee. We've actually been excited about doing this for years, and I think it's going to become something special. So solving puzzles against Jen, let's go. And what Danny doesn't know is that we actually have a new prize. We have a golden Peshka. We've been working on this and the winner gets this Peshka. I wanted to hold that guy. Oh Whoa, God. yeah, it's real gold. What is it's, going it's, on? It's real gold, my friend. Was this in the budget? I don't know. So it's worth a lot. Come find out who wins the very first golden Peshka. Anyone who has played even a small amount of chess, especially online, is familiar with the concept of an opening trap. We've all fallen for one at some point or another. In many cases, a failed opening trap will leave you with a terrible position, but not always. We've compiled 10 opening traps that are not only guaranteed to work, but if your opponent doesn't fall for them exactly, you'll still have a decent position. Number two, Legal's Mate. This opening trap, if your opponent cooperates, can lead to one of the most beautiful and famous checkmates in chess. Named after Sire de Legal, it dates back all the way to the 18th century. It occurs in an Italian game, and in this position we play knight c3. Black might play bishop g4, pinning the knight to white's queen, and we can play h3, forcing black to make a decision about the light squared bishop. If they retreat with bishop h5, this allows the brilliant knight takes e5, where a free queen is offered. If black takes the bait and grabs the queen, can you spot the famous mate in two? That's right. Bishop takes f7, king e7, which is forced, knight d5 mate. So, if our opponent does not take the queen bait, is this a dubious position? Not at all. Black's best response is knight takes e5, allowing white to win the light squared bishop with queen takes h5, and after black takes the bishop on c4, white can win the piece right back with a queen check on b5, picking up the knight on the following turn no matter what black's response is. White is up a pawn with control of the center, a great place to be out of the opening.
The players are all smiles as they await the next game, making jokes about not having a watch and knowing what time it is or when the games will begin. But I'm Robert Hess, alongside me is Grandmaster Peter Lecco. We hope you are smiling while watching this great chess. And if watching isn't good enough for you as this lightning pace World Blitz Championship is well underway, you can get involved. So if you're looking to put your bullet chess skills to the test, compete in tomorrow's Community Bullet Brawl Arena and win Diamond Membership. Anyone is eligible to throw their hat in the ring and prove their speed chess prowess. All you have to do is join the community club on chess.com and register for the arena. Use the command CBB in chat for all the details. We'll see you in the arena. And what we'll see next are the ninth round pairings of this World Blitz Championship and the Women's World Blitz Championship, where in the women's section, we have our sole leader, Valentina Gunina. She started with that perfect seven out of seven, held to a draw, if you will, in that eighth round. But now she plays Anastasia Bodnaruk. And Peter, that's a great matchup. It's going to be a fun one. But I could see the player at the end of the day. Maybe they call it a day early. What do you think? Will we see a fight or potentially Anastasia trying to protect her spot in the standings? Yeah, I don't know. I don't dare to speculate. Uh, it's the women's section. They normally are fighting like crazy. Uh, we have been seeing Anastasia playing very quick chess, fighting till the very end. Yes, she was very happy to and lucky to have survived this previous game and even delivering one move checkmate to Alexander Postenyuk. That might actually influence her, but I don't really see that being a quick draw. And we see Anish Giri and Daniil Dubov, they're talking. Uh, they look like they just want to play some blitz chess. Magnus Carlsen on board one against Barat Subramaniam. Vladislav Artemi really on board one, but Magnus just gets to sit there because he's Magnus Carlsen. Uh, Vladislav plays Jan Napomshi, and this behind the pairings is Anish Giri versus Daniil Dubov. And for Anish Giri, Peter, this could be a big opportunity for him. I know Daniil Dubov is super tough, but Anish needs to keep winning in order to make the Candidates tournament. Yes, uh, this is a very tough pairing for both sides. Uh, both of them super dangerous. Anish needs to go all in in this championship. He, he needs to win it. That's the only aim that he has, apart of playing great chess. Otherwise, you can't even get there. And we have liftoff. Yes, we see the players. Uh, they're still smiling. The hands are sh shaken. And E4 is played. And we have a king's pawn game and an Italian. Wow, yeah, because Dubov is famous for going for the bishop e7 setup. Anish says, okay, go for it, please. I'm happy with it. Anish gains space. His last move was a queenside rook pawn going forward. Now they're having even more moves come onto our screens. And this structure it reminds me of uh, the bishop's opening, but instead of a knight capturing the bishop, it was the bishop trade. Why has this clamp in the center? Wow, it's insane action. Yeah, that uh, the players are blitzing it out in bullet mode uh, i feel like i should be happy with white with this lovely bishop on c1 against black's bishop on e7 on the other hand dubov's strategy is to set up a very solid position and then just rely on his quick play and see how is white at all breaking through and it's black who decides to strike on the king's head with the move f5 it's a double-edged move that rook on a3 if it can successfully swing on over to g3 we could be looking at an attack for white, but with that rook capturing the f5 pawn, maybe it's an attack for black. Both sides have their chances here, and I will say that that pawn on d5 could be a little bit tender at some moment, so you need to keep your eyes open. Yes, and the point being that, of course, white can protect that pawn with c4. However, then we see the main idea of black. Black has already set up a fortress position. Yeah, c4 played. Sooner or later, you had to protect that pawn. The knight usually should be transferred to e4. That would be the ideal square. But then suddenly black has bishop g5 trading the bad bishop. So it does look like Dubov knew what he was doing. Bad bishops defend good pawns. Black's pawn structure is super healthy because a pawn chain is as strong as its base pawn. And the pawn on c7, almost impossible to get to in this position. So I love the setup from Dubov. And he seems very comfortable, but he is lacking in space, Peter. That's the one bit of bad news for him. And that's why he regroups and he reroutes his knight over to g6, very likely. Yeah, well, Anish actually played the move g3, indicating that he wants to go king g2. He knows anyway I'm going to transfer that knight. But against Daniel Dubov, weakening your king side, knight h7, look, af8 
to follow. Now bishop g5 will happen after knight d2. The knight still will get to e4, but it does seem likely that the minor pieces will trade. And the pawn on a4, let's not forget about that. The queen on d7 doesn't just aim to the king side. It aims at the pawn a4, and I need to show back with the pawn on e3. The engine is not happy about white's position. Yeah, usually I'm mentioning that I'm loving that knight on e4, but this knight is not there forever. Black is very comfortably able to to change that, to trade that with knight f6, maybe even first include a move like queen f5, but then white has queen g4 trading queens. Okay, that's a good resource for white. White is really hanging on, but barely. It does not look like fun for Anish Giri because black controls the only open file. The f file has both black rooks on it. And we see queen f5 played. I, I don't see a move besides queen g4. If you move your knight away to c3, that black knight comes into g5 and that looks problematic. So queen g4, I think what Dubov will do, Peter, is trade queens and then play knight g5 to give himself the f2 square? Or is that not exactly. work out the way I want? No, I think it works out to perfection because after knight g5, you will have the rook f2 intermezzo move. That's the key. And then you get the, you infiltrate with the rooks and you get the upper hand. And that's what has given Anish Giri pause. He is in huge trouble right now. He can't move his knight away. I think he'll get checkmated. The black knight comes into g5. You might have to play g4 just to protect your h3 pawn. And then queen f2 check anyway. Uh, your knight is going to be in trouble. The second rank is black for the taking. This looks ugly. Wow. And here we see, and look at Dubov's clock situation. He has basically blitzed out all his moves. Yeah, this is his strategy. Finally, there was nothing else. Anish has to go for this horrible endgame. But you know what's the worst part about it is he went down this horrible endgame and took a lot of time just to play these moves. So knight g5 right now. Uh, this should allow black to intermezzo, and then the black rook will be free to run around the second rank. But wait a second. But he goes what? knight f6. Wow, that's a surprise. And I think Anish is kind of relieved. On that end, it's still unpleasant, but it's much better than before. Yeah, Brook F1 loses for white, I'm pretty sure. So uh, trying to trade off all the rooks because of your bad pawn structure, those double isolated G pawns, you can't get away with Rook F1. And that's why he slides up Rook E2. He's covering all the squares. Peter, it's an open file, but you can't easily pile up more pressure on this G4 pawn. Yeah, it looks very ugly. However, Black has all these ideas like going E4, Rook F3, eventually breaking with H5 getting access to the weak pawn on g3. It's a horrible position. Great point about h5, because I was wondering what's the actual threat of rook f3. h5 is a huge threat trying to get after the g3 pawn. So is king h4 the move here for white, stopping h5 with the king? Yeah, maybe, but yeah, Anish plays the move king h4 out of desperation. There, were, there was no other move to be played. Down to 29 seconds, seconds almost two minutes. What an incredible performance by Dubov, just playing so quickly, putting pressure on the clock. And he went king h7, so maybe h5 is still in the air. And so for Anish, he grabs his rook, plays rook to g1. That's a defensive move. White really wanted to play like b4 and get some activity for his rooks, but white is sitting so passively here. Yes, white is completely passive. I'm expecting some rook g5, king g6, eventually h6, h5 break. I also would love to put that pawn on e4 just in case, making sure that I fix everything. I just don't see a plan for white. I think white is playing like rook a1, rook g1, rook, you know, back and forth on a yo-yo string here. There's no other plan. Yeah, the big question is, will do be able to find the breakthrough? Anish is hoping that the answer is no. And Dubov says, no way I can't break here. Yeah, rook g5, I think, played. These types of positions are so frustrating because black is clearly better, seemingly on the verge of winning, and yet the breakthrough not so obvious. And wow, rook g5 and the rook back to f6, it looks like was black's latest move. Is there some kind of king g6 pawn h5 idea? Yeah, that was my idea, but actually Dubov just wants to go after the g4 pawn systematically. Hmm. So on one hand, you've gained material. That's good for black. But what the downside of all of this play is that now white suddenly has ideas. In fact, if we speed up 
to where the players are. The pawn on g4 has been captured. Now rook takes b4 for white and a5 at some point. Pawns are getting trade off. It's bad for white. That's clear. But maybe there's some hope. Yeah, the moves came in in bunches from being behind. Suddenly he jumped ahead. Uh, apologies to everyone. Unfortunately, it's out of our control. But this game may no longer be completely out of Anish Giri's control uh, because he should make this move. In fact, I see on the camera, he's split a5, b takes a5, rook b7. So if we can speed up here, uh, this black rook has gone to g4, rook takes c7, rook takes h4 check. Uh, I know we're just trying to catch up as best we can. And there was a capture on, uh, you know, rook g4 check was thrown in and then taking on e4. So lots of liquidation happening. I'm sure the moves will come in in more spurts. But the point is that uh, there has been simplification here and white is trying to hold on by trading off as many pawns as possible. But he's two pawns behind. Two, two pawns behind. This is uh, not going to be easy. But what is the cleanest way for black? Because we know that look and games are completely crazy when sometimes being two pawns done, you can still hope for a miracle. And I think we just saw Anish in the camera. He stole a pawn. So maybe let's just zoom into the players because the board uh, continues. Well, now it's catching up as soon as I say to zoom the players. But there are these split pawns at advantage for black. And white lost his pawn in the process. So uh, Anish geared down two pawns now. Yes, this should be should be lost, but okay, the game is still on. As long as you can fight, you you still feel that you might have chances. They are waiting and for the moves to appear. Maybe let's just zoom in. We we will be losing all the action like this. Yeah, let's try to zoom in. And yeah. we see here the players. They are going at it. Black has pushed the pawn all the way down to a3. Anish using his rook to cut off the black king, but I don't think that's going to pan out for him. Yeah, not at all. King h5, g5, g4, king h4, and then you're going to give a check on the second leg and it's it's game over. And for Daniil Dubov, I mean, he had so much time in this game. It felt like he wasn't even thinking, just playing on instinct, but his instinct was more or less perfect throughout most of this contest. Yeah, but I'm surprised. Why is he not satisfied with... Okay, he gives the check, king g3. He and pushes a2, a2 and, and then the king walks over to b5. Very systematic approach. And now it's simple. And he, he's hovering over his g-pawn. The white rook can't take it. And said he just brings his king on over. And that's what you were yeah. calling for, Peter. That even if white takes the king side... Oh, he's... Look the, before he's... check. Oh, oh wow. Oh and no. Anish has this rook, rook b5 check. We're going to see queen versus rook. Did you see Anish look at him? He's like, do you really know how to win this game? And this is not that easy to perform without so much time on your clock. Yeah, but uh, Dubov has enough. And of course, he is. There is oh! checkmate. <laughs> checkmate on h1. Anish, you know, he was in a lost position regardless, but walked in to mate in one. Yes. Wow, that's of course a great finish for Daniel Dubov. A very important victory and a heartbreak for Anish Giri and all his fans. It's true, especially because Vladislav Artemyev drew against Jan Napomshi. Magnus Carlsen, he won his game against Barat Subramaniam and Maxim Vasher Legrav. He is roaring back. The 2021 World Blitz champion beats Zamsaran Sidipov. And meanwhile, Nihal Saran scored a victory of his own. So uh, the results are coming in. Lots of decisive games, as we expect in Blitz Chess. And we see some of them here. As mentioned, Nihal gets the win. Maxim, an important one for himself. And we just saw Dubov take down Anish Giri in this latest game. Peter, any live chess still going on? I don't know. I couldn't find nothing was really loading up. But I would like to highlight Nihal Sarin winning a game now. And he's coming. He's already on board six, so he has won quite a lot of games, but we did not see him yet on the top boards. Very happy because he's a blitz wizard. Now, Pragnananda, he wins. And we talk about Niall Sard. Now, Pragnananda, fellow Indian teenager, beats Levon Pantelaya. We saw a draw. Yu Yang Yi, another draw. I, I haven't looked at the game. Uh, maybe it was a hard fought battle, but I just feel for Yu Yang Yi. I do think that that appeal really uh, harmed his chess. 
and Artemiev in first place, but tied now with Magnus Carlsen after nine rounds. Both players have seven up points. We see a tie with seven points all the way down to eighth with Nihal Sarin. And actually, I think Daniil Dubov with that victory, he also has seven and a half. So he joins Artemiev and Carlsen. Yes, all the big boys up there. Very interesting to be following this event. I also believe that Dubov, I think Dubov's victory was not yet counted, or is he really only six and a half points? I can't really believe that. No, no, he's at seven and a half. So uh, when uh, yes. the standings will update, he will be in a tie for first to third. So not just Artemiev Carlson, but Dubov joins their ranks. And in the Women's World Blitz Championship, we entered with Valentina Gunina, a half point ahead of Anastasia Bodnaruk. And well, I, we're going to end the surprise. Valentina Gunina, she remains in the lead. So she wins her game against Anastasia Bodnaruk. And look at this, Peter. Eight and a half at a nine for Valentina. Nobody within a point and a half of her. Yeah, unbelievable power performance from her. Eight and a half points out of nine in this field against this competition. Incredible. One and a half point lead. But we talked about this. Yeah, you can never relax and there will be tons of pressure on her. Yeah, she knows exactly that this is a golden opportunity to win the the, the world title she has to she has to remain calm i don't know how you do that maybe you just enjoy that you are playing such a good chess that might be a great advice but we want to see her continue because this is fantastic well valentina gunina will not continue playing today nor will any of these other women because nine rounds are up it's nine out of 17. they get to eat dinner at just 8 10 in the evening in Samarkand, whereas in the open section, they still have three more rounds to play, Peter. So Valentina Gunina, hats off to her. She is playing so exceptionally well. And do you think that she's going to rest easily tonight? Or do you think that you start feeling the stress before you're able to sleep? Yeah, this is what I was trying to highlight. Yeah, that, uh, yeah, she has played a fun wonderful chess, but the tournament is not over yet. But once you score eight and a half out of nine, you feel like you already deserve the title. Yeah, you have done something incredible. So she needs to calm down, have a good sleep and have enough energy for tomorrow. And when you score so many victories, you're often beating players who are in that chasing pack. So we might see pairing Samara where she's playing people two plus points behind her. But that remains to be seen. It's another day of Blitz tomorrow. We're going to get another round of Blitz after this break. So do not go anywhere. When we return, it's round 10 of the FIDE World Blitz Championship. We have a three-way tie for first. We'll see if we get any clear leaders as the day continues. We'll be right back. about your New Year's chess solutions but don't know where to start? Don't worry, we've got you covered in your year in chess. This new feature brings you every stat you need. See your legendary streaks, check out your global passport, and tally up those wins. Relive your greatest triumph and all the unforgettable moments that defined your chess journey in 2023. Check it out now at go.chess.com slash year in chess. Look at that chess kid subtle branding sticker on the table. I Dan forgot. Danny played this against me and he won, so I'm yeah. sure you're in good hands. Yep. I think it was an accident. I think I was <laughs> I think I blacked out for those first two games. <laughs> I don't know, are we in my prep? Yes, if, you're prepped. If we're in my prep, I'm, I'm really scared because you... He's you moving with such confidence. He, he doesn't seem concerned whatsoever. It's like, <laughs> it's like really concerned. It's extremely concerning. I don't understand. This is secret prep. Your prep? My prep? Actually, I think, yeah, this is actually prep. Or maybe I just figured it out. 
Or maybe it's a block. <laughs> this, um... this is not my prep, actually, but like. So I have an option to take that one. I want to Wait, Tony, is this legit prep? I have a suggestion, Tony. Why don't you take none of my punts? I just take none of them? Just not, just don't take any of my punts. Okay, I won't take any of your punts. Okay. So deal's a deal. Um, I'll first them to be taken. Um, wow, this is actually crazy. By this position? No, actually, yes. Yeah, it is. Like, actually. Okay. I mean, this prep is playing off. Wait a second. Uh -huh. Wait a minute. Yeah, this was what I was fearing when I actually You guys are play playing this a little too focused here for me. <laughs> are we supposed to be like more goofy? Supposed to. Kind of a D7. Why did I think about that move? Like I mean, that? this is all prep. I mean, look at this. I watched a video the of you today uh -huh. before I was coming here. I'm really sorry. And was it was a about a Magnus destroying everybody, yes. right? Were you inspired? And he, yeah, I was inspired. And he hanged the pawn, or not hanged, he sacrificed the pawn in the opening, mm -hmm. first game. Um, and he sacrificed the pawn to have major counterplay. Okay. And I'm inspired by this. So I'm doing exactly what he did. But you're giving me way more than... Am I mated? Yes, you are. Am I really? <laughs> yes, you are. Oh. Wait a second. Wait. Oh my god. Yes, you are. I think I'm missing my wallet. It's not a good thing, everybody. Yay! <laughs> Yay! Everything wow. worked out. <laughs> <laughs> that was, that was that an was, epic that was, game. What are we doing? We, 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 can't, we can't be awkward. We gotta, oh, yeah. just, there you go. We're gonna be one of those like epic, like, oh my gosh. That, that was, was so casual. So that, <laughs> that was just like. This whole time I was like, ah, oh, my king is safe.
In the heart of Central Asia lies the ancient city of Samarkand, Uzbekistan. Landmarked along the Silk Road, the spirit of the past still echoes through its ancient buildings and monuments. But today, modern-day warriors from all corners of the globe descend on this historical place, each vying for four of the most coveted titles in chess. And a handshake, Magnus Carlsen gets the double. Before the calendar's turn, the year closes out with six days of intense battles. He flagged! Brilliant strategies and unparalleled excitement. He's blundered! Magnus has made a new queen and now it's a huge turnaround. Will the experienced prevail? Or will a rising star defy expectations? Let the games begin. This is the 2023 FIDE World Rapid and Blitz Championship, and it starts now. The sun was out when the games began, but now it is getting dark in Samarkand. The Women's World Blitz Championship is done for the day. Valentina Gunina leads with eight and a half and a nine, a point and a half ahead of her nearest competitors. And in the World Blitz Championship, we have a three-way tie for first, Magnus Carlsen, Vladislav Vertemiev, and Daniil Dubov. I'm Robert Hess, alongside me is Grandmaster Peter Leko. Peter, we are going to focus on the open section now as the women's is done for the day. Three-way tie for first, and I believe we are going to get Daniil Dubov versus Magnus Carlsen. Wow, I want to see this. We haven't really been seeing this for quite some time. Always we, we know exactly Dubov has been the second of uh, Magnus Carlsen in many of his World Championship matches. That's always a very big prestige duel among two very good friends. Yeah, it's not easy to play somebody you work with. And for Dubov, he's helped Magnus propel him to even higher heights. So we'll see how that clash goes. But I'll remind everybody that while the Women's Blitz Championship has ended for day one, you see the 29th circled on your screen. It should be circled on your calendar as well because that's today's date. We have the first 12 rounds of the Open. And tomorrow on the 30th, we will see rounds 10 through 17 of the Women's and then rounds 13 through 21 of the World Blitz. So lots of chess still ahead. Three rounds to go today in the World Blitz Championship. And it is a three-way tie. Artemiev, Dubov, Carlson. Shared first place right now, 7 out of 9, a great score. And Pragnananda, Shagirov, Napomnishi, Maxime Vashilagrov, Neil Saran, and Richard Report all there, just a half point back. So everyone still in contention that you see on the graphic here. Peter, there's so many rounds to go that I think all the players, they almost don't care about what the standings look like at this stage. Yeah, well, you don't have to care, but uh, you have to play your best. Yeah, that's the most important thing. You still have chances to bounce back wherever you are. Of course, not if you are too far away. But those players who played so well so far, they are carrying the momentum. Yeah, that's the most important. Yeah, forget about the score, but they are in good emotions. They have the energy. They have the vibes that it takes to keep on going. You need energy. You have to use all, mobilize all your reserves in the remaining three games. Well, we just talked about how Daniil Dubov will play against Magnus Carlsen on board two. Nihal Sarin, who has stormed back because we were talking on earlier today. That's quite rare when you're talking about a player of Nihal Sarin's character and caliber. He gets to play Vladislav Artemiev. Meanwhile, Jan Napalm, she plays Richard Report. Sanan Shagirov, who is just incredibly underrated in Blitz Chess. I'm looking at uh, the numbers 2569. Get out of here with that, Elo. It's going to go through the roof. He plays Maxime Vashir Legrave. And Anish Giri, he plays White against Pragnananda. So those are some of our biggest pairings. Peter, just no matter where you look, I say this every round, it's going to be fun and it's going to be difficult. Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, it's an epic, epic battle. All about stamina, all about carrying the momentum, feeling your opponent also, that what kind of strategy is the right one. We have seen Daniel Dubov playing very quickly against Anish Giri. That strategy worked to perfection, but Nagel Magnus Carlsen, will he stick to that or will he come up with a completely different approach? 
so many interesting angles here. And I'm trying to figure out what's happening in the background. It seems like Vidic Gujarati uh, is over there, Fabiano Caruana, it looks like Peter Spindler, Maxime Vacher, Legrave. They're just talking, looking up, and I don't know what they are staring at. I, we're clearly zooming out, trying to figure out as well. But something is going on in the playing hall, and the, the people have not sat at their chairs, which means the pairings, they're up, and that's how they find out, by looking at a screen. I hope their necks are okay. <laughs> yes, very much so. We know that the players are always changed. Ah, oh, wow. Okay, what is... Yes, so the pairings are there. There's always kind of nice to see this camaraderie between the players. We know exactly that they are fighting against each other, but when there is suddenly a small little break, then they are chilling and uh, supporting each other. I hope they brought their glasses because they have to crane their necks, stare, find themselves on board 14 or on board 4. But the players, they are getting set for the next game. And it's only the open section with games to play today. And Daniil Dubov, I mean, he's not messing around. The way he just won with the black pieces against Anish Giri, it was a solid approach from him to start. And then he outplayed Anish, caused some tactical problems, won material, and converted his advantage. Absolutely. But look at look at Daniel Dubov. He knows exactly that he's going to play board number one there against Magnus Carlsen. But, but when you look at him, you don't get the feeling that this is going to be game of the game of the day or game of the year for him. Yeah, this is a very important game. He's just chilling there, getting ready for the battle. Well, he yawned. He might be tired and there was a big delay for the players. But he's also faced Magnus Carlsen more than most because he is one of Magnus Carlsen's seconds. I imagine they played many blitz games against each other as preparation. And we see Vladislav Artemyev, he's in his chair. He gets the black pieces. Uh, but uh, these matchups, Yanda Pomshi, he gets white. All of them, uh, they're playing strong players. There's a handshake and I think a frozen camera. Oh, that's back in Swiss Report. Yes, luckily, I almost got a heart attack. Yeah, it's Richard Laporte against Jan Nepomnyashi. Also an incredible battle, two extraordinary gentlemen, chess wizards. Well, everywhere we look, we are treated with some incredible pairings. And Anish Giri gets the white pieces in this game. He just had white, so he lost with the white pieces. Now he plays Prague Nananda, and we see a handshake. Here comes Prague. So for Anish, he still has only one point back of the leaders. Sometimes you lose a game, your tournament's over. You can no longer win. So many rounds to go that for Anish Giri, he just needs to get over that loss to Dubov and try to take care of business against Prague. I think it's very important and very good news for him that he gets the white pieces. Yeah, often it's the case you lose a game and uh, you're going to get the most unpleasant pairing of them all. Well, the pairing is unpleasant because he's facing the brutally strong Pragnananda, but with the white pieces after the loss, I think that's, that's a good situation to win. And Magnus Carlsen in his chair, he gets the black pieces against Daniil Dubov. So Dubov wins with black. Now he gets white against the world number one of the reigning world blitz champion and the current two-time world rapid champion uh so he is just defending his titles hoping to get this blitz title too they're talking i don't know what about maybe they're actually working on the next opening to look at Peter. <laughs> well it it was kind of funny and now there is a smile from dubo's face what it was all about we don't know magnus was first surprised but and uh, yeah they are enjoying the moment <laughs> and now magnus just you know pointing around there. He's probably asking Daniil, what's it like to be on other boards? Because they make me sit here over and over again. Is the air better over there? Are you closer to uh, the refreshments? Magus only plays on board one. Yes, and now I think this is officially the board number one because both of these players are leaders and uh, Vladislav Artemyev facing Niha Sarin, who is half a point behind. So all lies now Magnus versus Daniel Dubov. I'm excited for these games because Daniel Dubov is extremely creative. And while he is a second, a trainer for Magnus Carlsen for his world championship matches, it can be uncomfortable to play against somebody who works in all of your openings. They know what you like the most. They know what you don't like. They've seen your opening files because they created them. So it's going to be interesting to see how Magnus reacts in the first few moves, what opening he deploys 
Yeah, absolutely. But look at this. Also, Jan Yapomiyashi is joining in to this discussion and Richard Rapport is also enjoying this conversation. And it's good to see that because so much was said when Jan was playing Magnus and Dubov was revealed as one of Magnus' seconds. And the players themselves have kind of said, I don't really see a problem. We are on good terms. So it's good to see uh, the convivial atmosphere, the players. They're just waiting for the games to begin. They're seated in their chairs. Let's go. Let's get those handshakes. We want to see moves. Yeah, and in fact, from the body language, I feel that they somehow sense that the game is not about to start. I'm pretty sure that no matter how good friends you are with the opponent, when you know that the game is about to start in five seconds or 10 seconds, you already automatically lean back. You try to get your private space to get ready for the game. The players are still not signaling this to me. And there is Pragnananda. There is Arjun Aragaisi. He takes on Alexander Injic and he gets the white pieces. So Arjun Aragaisi, he came in to these events, into Samarkand, with outside hopes of making it to the candidates. Those hopes have been dashed, but he has the white pieces, an important game. He can still win himself a World Blitz Championship title. And why not? He is such a strong player. He's got that uh, quick calculation. He has the speed because he plays online all the time. And I think he's looking at that board one matchup saying, I want to be there in the next few rounds. Absolutely. Arigais is uh, uncompromising, but now we are also seeing Niha Sadin. I'm very happy. Also a little bit tired, but uh, put that tiredness aside. We want to see you fight. And we know exactly that's what Nihal is always doing. So far, I feel very sorry for him. One of the main games that we have covered from him was that epic battle against uh, Fedoseyev, which he tragically went on to lose. I hope that uh, things will be different this time. You just mentioned Fedoseyev's name. We haven't said it once today. So he has not been uh, doing as well in the Blitz as he did in the Rapid. But we know that Vladimir is always capable. But Magnus Carlsen, the black pieces against Daniil Dubov, he looks restless. He clearly just wants to play the chess already. Yeah. And... At least already the moves are coming in our system. That means the handshake is about to happen. Yes. So D4, knight f6, knight fc, c4. Will we going to see a Catalan? That's the yes. big question, and we see it. So this is what Daniil Dubov helped Magnus Carlsen prepare for the World Championship. Exactly. In 2021. And now we see a capture on d5, a recapture of the pawn. Magnus seems to love this type of position where he can have the isolated queen pawn from the black side. And he doesn't mind it at all. While other people, they fret, they hate having isolated pawns. Magnus says, let's go. I'll get the activity around it. Yeah, he plays the Tarash. Yeah, so he turns a, a classical Catalan into a Tarash. On the other hand, we know exactly a Dubo from the black side was the one introducing the Dub of Tarash. However, that's with C takes D4 and Bishop C5, Bishop B6. That's a completely different spirit. And anytime you call an opening, the Dubov variation, you know that there's a lot to it. There's a lot of energetic play. And here, Dubov, he had his Bishop, both of them, and he brings is going to bring his Rook to C1. I think he, in fact, has he done that yet? No, just now, Rook to uh, C1 played. He's aiming down the C file, and he's just saying, if we're going to go into an isolated queen pawn position, and Black does finally take on D4, I was going to say that Black had to lead the charge. Well, honestly, I'm very happy with White's position uh, because it's a very natural position. Black has this isolated pawn. Clearly, Black will be trying to put pressure on the E2 pawn. I'm expecting the move Bishop G4. Yeah, on the board, yes. Okay, h3 to kick that bishop away. I say that was Dubov's latest move. And Magnus, has he not moved his bishop yet? It doesn't appear he has. And, okay, we see it on the board before we see it on the cameras. Bishop back to d7. Maybe he was calculating knight takes d4 first, but either way, he retreats his bishop. Yeah, but uh, it's not only that the computer gives a clear advantage to white. Also, to my eyes, it looks like a very nice kind of uh, Talash for white. All right, Magnus has provoked the HC move, but is this really such a big issue? White can always protect it with King H2. 
And it just prevents knight takes d5 for a move because if you start trading pieces on d5, the h3 pawn will be hanging. But king h2, as you're pointing out, it just defends that pawn that is in the bishop's line of sight. So will Daniel play king h2? He's spending quite a bit of time on this turn. He was so fast against Anish, and we see the uh, chat saying, 58% of them saying that Magnus will win if there is a decisive game. They think his chances are greater. But Dubov is really spending a lot of time before playing King H2. Yeah, finally, he opted for it. And I also feel that White definitely also needs the move E to E3, just securing that D4 square, also making sure the E2 pawn won't be hanging. But how complex and difficult this position is, we see that both sides are taking their time. It's not easy at all to find a natural move. No, because there's tension between these knights on c6 and d4. The d5 pawn is under heavy fire. Uh, if you want to protect d5, black can swap knights on d4 and then park the bishop on c6. But a bishop on c6 with pawns on b7 and d5, everything is anchored. That's the good news. The bad news is your bishop's really serving as a big pawn and it's not controlling a useful diagonal. Yes, that's very passive, giving absolutely free hand to the opponent here. Magnus goes queen a5, maybe hinting at some bishop a3 ideas, also protecting the pawn on d5, eventually preparing rook a c8. Well, the great way to stop bishop a3, which is such a good idea for black to try to carve out those dark square controls, be a3 for white, saying you can't take my pawn if it pushes to a3, because then the rook comes to a1 to pin the bishop. We could see queen sacrifices. I mean, a3 was just played in blitz chess. Sometimes people go for some speculative sacrifice with bishop takes a3, you know, rook a1, bishop takes b2. I don't think we'll be seeing that in this game. Uh, it looks a little bit too risky, but in blitz, anything can happen. Yeah, anything can happen. On the other hand, yeah, after AC, White is also threatening to go BC, B4. Yeah, so Magnus has to do something. He trades on D4. He looks very unhappy. I mean, we see on the camera he just took on D4, but before he did, Bishop takes and A3. Wow. Is... wow. So now, Rook A1, he has Queen C5 or Bishop C5, which is... Uh, Bishop C5 might run into some Queen F6. Queen C5, mm -hmm. I believe Rook A1... Queen c5 would be the move, yes. So Dubov takes on ac, but now Magnus has liquidated. He has, I think, succeeded in equalizing the game. Yeah, Dubov did not look very happy to play this knight takes d5 move. And now after bishop takes d5, a draw has been agreed. It is a level position. Uh, the bishop's likely getting trade off with black bishop e6. You can take b7, but you will lose b3 in the end. So they're just talking about what could have happened. But Dubov's, you know, just happy to make this draw to not get a worse position to save a little bit of energy going into the next game wow yes and the players are discussing this gives us a chance to move on to another game the game that uh, we might be getting up is Niha Salin against Vladislav Artyamiev that's where we, we're gonna jump right into Niha in in a better position but yeah there is the post-mortem between Daniel Dubov and here we have the live action in this game Okay, so this one is getting down to the wire. Such an important game because if Artemiev wins, he's in clear first. And if Nihal wins, he's in joint first. And whoa, what is happening on this board? Knight e7 check, a queen trade, and white controls the c-file. Rook c7 is tempting here. Peter, I'm looking at this position. I'm thinking Peter Lecco would have a field day, have so much fun from the white side. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. But there is also another idea of eventually trading everything down because white has a very active king. And this is certainly what Nihal is thinking about. He played the move king fc, g5, typical move. You have to grab space, create luft for your king. You know what move I would like to see is knight c8 at some point, just to try to keep that black rook hemmed in there. Uh, but I think Artemia just went rook a7. So white played g4 and Artemia have responded with rook a7. And now the knight has, in fact, gone to c8, and the black rook goes to d7, but the white rook slides up to c6. I think that a6 pawns in some serious danger. That's in a serious danger. On the other hand, black also had no right to stay passive, because if you stay passive, you're going to lose. So he certainly is looking for counter chances. He activated the rook to d2, I believe. Yes, he did. It was rook d2, rook takes a6, h5, and h3. And we see a swap of pawns on g4 now. 
White's up a healthy pawn. Uh, Black is going to have a difficult time defending knight d7, retreating, trying to go to e5, and the knight comes back to d6. Yes, this is very, very bad news for Artyamia. White is not only pawn up, but also the pawn on b5, f7 is hanging. It's a double attack. How do you create counterplay here? Well, he went knight e5 check, king g3, and then pawn to b4 was played, it looks like. And knight e4, rook d1, knight takes g5. We're just trying to catch up. Hopefully the moves do come in uh, from the venue in Uzbekistan. But after knight g5, rook g1 check, the king, wait, how does the king on f3? That That's odd to me. Somehow the king, oh, king f4, knight d3. King f4, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes perfect sense. Uh, Nihal still has enough time on the clock. It should be a technical win. Well, knight e5 check. Okay, we'll just go into the board. Look at that. A knight sacrifice on e6 because Black's knight was also hanging. Nihal Sarn doing what he does best. This is how he beat Anish Kiri in the chess.com global championship in rapid chess. He just played these fine technical games. He's up two pawns right now, Peter. Yes, and this should be a technical. That's why I was so happy when we saw that Niha finally appeared on the top boards. We know exactly that he's capable of taking down anyone. And that knight is on h8. Knights in the rim are dim. A knight in the absolute corner. I don't have a rhyme for it, but it's awful. And now it's trapped after pawn to f5. Yeah, complete domination. Two pawns up. Activating the king. This is what Artemia of Yuzhik does to his opponents. But right now, Nihal just pushing that B pawn. The rook at any point can slide to B8. Res resignation. Nihal Sarn is a joint leader 10 rounds in to the World Blitz Championship. Yeah, fantastic stuff from Nihal. This is what we love to see. Players are coming, fighting, taking down leaders like Artemia, who has little slowed down. And we talked about this, that taking those premature quick draws can actually backfire. And other players did take some early draws. Uh, Arjun Aragaisi did not draw his game. He draws blood. He wins with the white pieces over Alexander Injish. And so they're still seated in their chairs, maybe trying to avoid disturbing any of the players that are in scrambles. You can see the background there. That looked like Alexi Serona. Uh, so, so many players still going out of here. Uh, I don't know what game to pull up, Peter. So, if, yeah. if you find a good one, let's I, go there. I pulled up... Uh... Nepo Miyashi against Richard Laporte. It seems like Nepo is winning this look end game. Do we have pawns. life? Yes. Okay. The moves are coming in. B4, look B5. I was worried that things are stuck. Look at this pawn race. White is winning the pawn race because White has two connected pass pawns. Finally, White will sacrifice the look for the pawn, and the two pawns should decide the game. Setting up yeah. look before trap. Be careful. And that's why white took on b2 at that moment. But as you said, the pawns are too fast. You get a queen, the rook takes it, you get a second one. Yeah. And uh, Jan Yapomashi winning his game. Also very nice to see Jan in his perfect shape. A big victory against each other port. So Jan Yapomashi takes that report, joins the leaders in first place. Magnus Carlsen, Daniel Dubov drew, so it allowed other players to catch up thanks to Nihal Sarn's win over Artemio. So I see, still see some other games. Alexis Serrano playing as Denis Maknev, uh, for example. And I just saw Korbov and Barat Subramanian end in a draw. Oh, this is also a draw. Yeah, this is also a draw. Of course, you can get checkmated in the corner, but Black has no intention of going towards the corner. And then it's a draw probably already agreed. All right, All right. so... Most of our results are in. I did hear that there was an absolutely crazy game between Shakri Armamajarov and Aiden Suleimanli. So uh, if you just want to, we don't have to look at the whole game because there's too much to cover in that game. But the opening was just bizarre, berserk, wild. Use any adjective uh, you want, but look at this game at the start. All right, coming. Ah, this one, of course. Okay, this is a complete madness. This is a Trompovsky. Okay, let, let's just highlight. Yeah, d4, knight f6, bishop g5. That's the Trompovsky. d5, knight d2. And things are escalating right from the beginning. e6, e4. There is the pin. Bishop takes e5. e5 using the pin, but black is going for counterattack against the f2 pawn. And what white does simply ignores it all. e takes f6, bishop f2 check. King e2. 
Bishop take g1, apparently a mistake. Is it really a mistake? Okay, this is some computer analysis. Rook take g1, sacrifice. Okay, you have to eliminate. First of all, queen f2, check. It was a very big threat. Queen take g1, knight takes e4. This had to be preparation. Wow. What an amazing move that is. It looks like you're giving away a knight for free, but the point is that after the pawn captures the knight and f take g7, you're highlighting it before I can say it. The bishop is opened up along with the queen to the d8 square, and that would be a checkmate. Yes, incredible. So after knight e4, clearly black played something else. After knight e4, black played rook g8. All right, f take g7, rook g7, queen d2. First of all, we have to do a count. Black is after the <laughs> up an exchange. Yes, black's king is in some kind of a uh, danger zone, but also white's king is not nicely castled on the queen side. So this was a crazy madness. Uh, wow, queen c3 also. Okay, please take it away. Well, it's hard to figure out what's going on, but I was going to say the evaluation bar was at zeros. It said even, this is some wild lines, but look at the clock. Mamadir had more time than he started with. It was some kind of wild preparation, but hitting the bishop on c and the rook on g7. And I love that after pawn takes bishop, he didn't take the rook on g7. He said takes the bishop on c8 with check, because once that bishop falls, b7 is also hanging. You can grab that pawn uh, if you want it, but first... And this is what I love about the best players in the world. They don't just take the material while they can. He says, your queen is stuck outside of the play. The knight can't move. You can't stop queen takes b7. So let me first shut down your queen. Wow. Okay, this knight f2 is such a stunner. Boxing in the queen. Black's look is also pinned. You can't really develop. How did black keep on fighting here? Okay, knight c6, sacrificing the rook. Going for attack, king d6, takes knight d4, check, king e3. What a game this is! Knight f5, check. <laughs> the, the adventure continues. King d3, queen takes f2. Wow, who yeah. is better and why all of a sudden? It, lo it looks like the king went in the wrong direction, but you know, who knows where that king belonged instead. This is one of the most fun games I've seen, and it's black... Is going after the white king now. So I don't know how this turned once more. King c6, rook c1, a mistake. Um, ah, gave away the wow. knight. Yes, queen e4. What was, because it was clearly not a blunder. Black was counting on something, but bishop d3, finally white develops the bishop. And yes, black will not have time to capture that rook because the queen and the bishop combo will do some harm to black's king on c6. Wow, what a game this was. So many tactics, and there are going to be some mistakes along the way. The king is escaping, so more, more wow. mistakes to come. <laughs> wow, okay, so finally, in fact, it turned out that white won in a technical manner. That's, <laughs> that's kind of insane. Relies on some domination. And finally, the a pawn starts to march. The white king is actually quite safe over there on the queen side. So many white pawns are joining the party. And yeah, black could have taken that pawn on c2, but it probably wasn't sufficient. And uh, the mistakes continue, but I can't blame huh. either player at this stage. They're playing with no time on the clock. Yes, of course, it's, it's clear that white is in the driver's seat. The pawns are too strong. This is a cemented construction. This is total cemento. Black cannot touch it. That's very important in time scramble. You know, nothing can happen to you. Okay, black pushed f4. And eventually, white went on to win. <laughs> no, the <laughs> adventure didn't... continues. Okay. <laughs> it seems like it never was going to end, but it's clear that the yes. A pawn couldn't be stopped. And with promotion on the table, uh, there was nothing black could do. Wow, the most entertaining game of the year. I think that's pretty obvious. <laughs> and that was a, a really fun affair. The Both sides had their chances. The white king was in danger. The black king ran all over across the board. But when all was said and done, Shakri Mamajaro, who's made his entire career in sharp tactical battles, he his dynamic play paid off. So let's revisit the results 
from his previous round. We just wanted uh, to show you that game because it was electric. And at the top, Daniil Dubov drew against Magnus Carlsen. Nihal Sarn beats Vladislav Artemiev, catapults himself in the first place. Yana Palmashi joins that tie by beating Richard Report. Shigirov drew Maxim Vashilagrov. Giri drew Prognananda. And Arjun Aragaisi gets the dub against Alexander Inju. So uh, with these results coming in the way they did, we have four players in a tie for first place for the first time in a long time. In fact, the whole tournament. Vladislav Artemiev is not in first because he lost to Nihal Sarin. Yes, and instead of him, Jan Yapomiachi and Nihal Sarin are already tying for first place. What an epic event it is. And all these players on the left-hand side of your screen, all those with seven and a half points, Shigiro, Pragnanda, MBL, Arjun Ergaisi, Rauf Mamedov. Now, Rauf has been a long time Blitz superstar. You do not want to count him out in that score group of seven and a half. And he's Kiri, he leads the charge with seven out of 10. But we still have two rounds to go today. Magnus Carlsen, Daniil Dubov, Nihal Sarin, and Jan Pomshi in a four-way tie. We'll see what pairings are in store for round 11. But for now, we head on to a break. We join the players to stretch our legs, maybe get some water. Hope you do the same. I love that you're watching chess this holiday season, but please make sure you hydrate, you get your stretching in, because we will be right back. Come back soon, everybody. What's the best way to follow any chess event from the Champions Chess Tour to the Candidates, Speed Chess Championship, Title Tuesday, FIDE World Championship, and so much more? Chess.com slash events has all of the top chess tournaments played both over the board and online. Analyze and review games from the world's greatest players with live commentary, cloud analysis, opening explorer, and table bases. Find all the key event information, including schedules, prizes, results, news reports, player bios, tie breaks, and more. Even compete by voting for your predicted results. Explore chess.com slash events today on web or with our iOS and Android apps and experience chess like never before. Welcome to How to Reassess Your Chess, the fantastic book that was written by the late Jeremy Silman, he recently passed away, but he has left a legacy of the concept of the imbalances that he elucidates so very well. This concept is really a game changer. Once you hear it, you can't really ever get it out of your head. A 1500 player didn't like to just attack, 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 but Silman, beat it into his head. Listen, you've got to attack when the king is stuck in the middle of the board. Looks like he might be able to take it back, but he said, no can do. Black decided to play bishop to c3, dropping a queen sack on the board. What kind of move is that? We see a mate threat that cannot be stopped. And of course, if you take the queen, rook takes and mate on a stick. This is how Jeremy Silman's students play. Man, that's the kind of teacher you want to have.
the heart of Central Asia lies the ancient city of Samarkand, Uzbekistan. Landmarked along the Silk Road, the spirit of the past still echoes through its ancient buildings and monuments. But today, modern-day warriors from all corners of the globe descend on this historical place, each vying for four of the most coveted titles in chess. And a handshake, Magnus Carlsen gets the double. Before the calendar's turn, the year closes out with six days of intense battles. He flagged! Brilliant strategies and unparalleled excitement. He's blundered! Magnus has made a new queen and now it's a huge turnaround. Will the experienced prevail? Or will a rising star defy expectations? Let the games begin. This is the 2023 FIDE World Rapid and Blitz Championship, and it starts now. The lights are on in nighttime Samarkand. Some players, well, the lights have switched at just the right time and their chess is clicking. For others, it feels like darkness and they cannot find their way out. This is the nature of Blitz Chess in the beautiful city of Samarkand, Uzbekistan. I'm Robert Hess. Alongside me is Grandmaster Peter Leko. Peter, we just have two rounds remaining in day one, 12 rounds in total. We're a four-way tie. I feel like for some, they're ready for the day to end. For others, they're saying, hey, it's just getting started. I'm finding my rhythm. Yes, absolutely. It's such a marathon event and such a grueling format. It's a never ending story. Also with this appeal, the players stamina is tested to, to the maximum. One extra hour is added. The players might be relying just on breakfast yeah, and then they have to perform their best. It's insane action. And you have to make sure that you can keep your stamina, your energy. It's not easy. And Magnus Carlsen himself has said that this Blitz title may be the most valuable, the hardest title for him to win because of all of these games. Yes, more games favors the higher rated player, but you also get exhausted. 21 Blitz games in just two days. And we are enjoying it. We are loving it because we are treated to some spectacular chess in each and every round. We would love to love this event to go on forever <laughs> i mean i'm enjoying it i feel like we only have two more games today yes we are exhausted we are also tired but we are so we are having so much fun yeah i'm pumped i'm really enjoying this tournament the blitz games the pieces flying and sometimes people blundering checkmates in one like we saw anastasia bodner against alexander kostanyuk earlier but in the world blitz championship daniel dubov magnus carlson Yana Pomshi, Nihal Sarn. Those are the four names with eight out of ten. And just behind them are Temiev, Shigirov, Pragananda, Maxim Vasilogrov, Arjun Aragaisi, and Ralph Mamedov. And then there's a whole pack of players on seven points. And I want to give another shout out to Volodar Mirzin. Just like in the Rapid, he impresses in the Blitz. This kid is super strong. Yeah, he seems to have the total package. Yeah, but this we have also seen in his rapid games that uh, he takes his time and he is not intimidated when he is low on the clock. He played all those end games brilliantly with incredible perfection. It shows his fantastic skills. And Mersin has he lost earlier today against Arjun Aragaisi. He followed up with wins over Raunek Sedwani and Laurent Fresine. So Mersin, uh, Vokidov, you Pragnananda, Nihal. You got these teenagers just hanging about uh, doing their best and on board one we have magnus carlson and nihal sarden who will have to bring his best to withstand the pressure that the world number one uh, will uh, be bringing to this board and daniel dubov it's yana pomshi on board two i feel like there's often a storyline between those two players on the second board yeah for sure on the other hand uh, two years have passed we don't know what happened during those two years they might have become uh, best buddies they were anyway good friends <laughs> before that's why also Jan said that he doesn't see the problem uh, Dubov assisting uh, Magnus Carlsen in the World Championship match. And I saw that Alexander Ryazantsev was on board six. I haven't seen his name throughout the day, but he's climbing back. Shakar Mamajarov had that crazy game against Aiden Suleimani. He's black on board eight against Barat Subramaniam. Alexis Serrano against Shamsin and Vokidov. Svidler against Narayanan. Korobov against Maknev. And we saw Denis Maknev start the day with the win over Fabian Karwana. He still is 
afloat. He's at the top of the leaderboard. He's in the hunt, so good on him. And then Yanchis of Duda against Chidamburam. There's so many good matchups that even on the third page of graphics, we get matchups like you know, Dierbeck Yakubayev against Evgeny Tomaszewski. And Rodrigo Vasquez, I want to point him out. He's playing on Yu Yegi, but Vasquez, you know, he may be in his 50s, but he's long been known as a blitz specialist. Really good when the clock gets lower. Wow, very nice insight. Uh, one thing that I'm still missing, yeah, Abdul Satulov, uh, Yakubov, Veladi. Yes, I see that now. Yakubov is there on board 15. Certainly, the home crowd would love to see them challenging the the top players there on the in the top of the standings. But sometimes playing at home, that's also adds to the pressure. Yeah, it, the expectations. Everybody wants you to play well. You very much want to perform your best. And that uh, sometimes hinders the players. For sure. There's so much added pressure for players in their home country. And we are zooming into this person's face and behind it, the pairings. And that's how the players, they look to see what board they're on. I see there are Giga Kuparatse on board 47 and Haik Martirosian on board 46. That is how strong, how challenging this event is. That even in the 60s, you will find Grandmaster. I see Sambel Tersahakyan on board 64. So uh, that is a, you wouldn't be surprised, Peter, if Tersahakyan was on board four, but he's on board 64. Yeah, of course, anything can happen. Uh, Haik Martirosian took uh, medal last year in the World Blitz. He's a fantastic Blitz player, but the field is extremely strong and even if you are behind you still face very tough opposition so mounting the comeback is extremely difficult and we saw maxime vache legrave sit, uh, sitting across from anish giri they are not playing each other they were just having a friendly chat anish giri plays black against volodar murzin maxime vache legrave gets white against Prognananda. so uh, they get to play the teenagers not each other and we are waiting for magnus carlson to sit down and square off against Nihal Sarin, but there is Maxime Vachelegrau, the French with three names, the 2021 World Blitz Champion. He gets Prognanda with the white pieces. I feel like we've been sleeping on Maxime a little bit. He is right there behind the leaders. Yes, actually this whole uh, board scenario is very tricky because there's such a big uh, tie in all these uh, places that board number four or even some of the boards that we are not covering might have exactly the same point so don't be fooled there are so many players in the mix and for mbl taking on Prognananda, you pr need to make the most of your chances because draws in this kind of event often not good enough yeah you can afford a few of them but if magnus carlson for example uh, finds that form gets on a winning streak he will be difficult to catch you see fabiana caruana walking to his board bobby He's not having the best event. He's got six points, and his opponent is Hans Niemann. Yes, that's that's what we are talking about. This is the World Blitz. No easy pairings. What a principal matchup that, that is. With six points out of ten on board 23, Fabiana Caruana against Hans Niemann. Alexander Grishuk also with six points. Fedoseev. So some really big names of the chess world hanging about behind the leaders. Two points behind first place. But given that there are two more games today, and then there will be up to 21 rounds, they have enough time to catch up. So we are still here waiting for the players to get seated and set. Uh, the Is that Vladislav Artemiev standing there? I think it is. Yes, it looks like it is Artemiev. He has just got defeated by Niha Sarin. And we, we mentioned this, that he had that approach, that quick draw, maybe two quick draws, when you lose this fighting spirit and then you get challenged, uh, it's very difficult to get back to your A game right away. Artemio, he did suffer what was an unfortunate defeat for him against Nihal Saran, but a very classy game from Nihal, who is in great form at the right moment. And he plays the black piece against Magnus Carlsen. And there, Daniil Dubov with white, Yanad Pamashi with black. Uh, these two players, they have history. Uh, much has been said about it. the players themselves. They seem to be on good terms. They're talking right now. So I'm glad that everyone can see that because uh, once you know, outsiders get involved and say, oh, there must be something between them because Daniil worked with Magnus Carlsen. You see them talking uh, just normally. So I really am glad to see this uh, because it just shuts down that conversation. 
Yes, and on the other hand, despite the friendly chat, we might be seeing some brutal chess fought out. Of course, we have also seen the other side of Dubov who can play incredible chess. That's why we love to cover him. But sometimes these quick draws, strategical draws to, to gain some energy for the remaining of the games, but not only two more games left. I hope that he gives it all and no strategical draws will appear. And we still have not seen Magnus Carlsen appear at his board, nor is Nihal Saren sitting there, but we have Vladislav Artemiev and Sanan Shagirov. Shagirov just won't go away. He wasn't at the top by accident. He didn't just happen to sit down at the wrong board. This is a player who could win the World Blitz Championship. We see Magnus Carlsen, the reigning World Blitz Champion. He sits down, shakes hands with Nihal Saren. But Shagirov, I do want to highlight his successes thus far. This is not a mistake. This is not just a fluke. Shagirov could win this whole thing. Well, anybody can win. It's, it's just a crazy tournament. But now all eyes on Magnus Carlsen against Nihal saying, I want to see this game very much. Nihal has been super impressive against Artyamia with the white pieces. Now the big question, how he will handle the challenge of Magnus having the white pieces in this game? Oh, it will not be easy. I remember Nihal Saran, the 2022 Chess.com Global Championship. He made his way all the way through to the final. He beat Anish Giri in the semis. What a nice performance that was from him. But then Wesley So just seemed to be the antidote to Nihal Saran's style. Because Nihal, unlike many youngsters who just play for tactics sometimes when they're super young, Nihal's always been more of a positional player. So Magnus Carlsen is the best endgame player of all time. I feel like this could be a stylistically difficult for Nihal. Well, it also a lot depends on the opening. Magnus, I believe, will stick to his 1e4. So far, it served him perfectly well. And if it works, why should you change it? And I don't think you should. What If it isn't broke, don't fix it. And for Magnus Carlsen, uh, he's been playing around with some of his opponents. He's put a6 on move one, he plays b3, but you don't take Nihal Saren lightly. Nihal has been at the top of speeches for a long time. He's a teenager still, I think, but he has been playing really high level in the speech chess championship, beating Alexander Grishuk in long matches and Richard Report. And he's been a mainstay of the semifinals in previous years. So he is not to be taken lightly. Yes, I remember when it was 2020, uh, the Tata Steel tournament has concluded. I was there as uh, Vincent's trainer and there was the farewell party. And then Niha sat down to play two minutes blitz games and he sat down all night because the point was that whoever wins keeps on sitting. And he went on for like five hours uh, playing non-stop blitz against very strong opposition. Well, he's playing the strongest of strong opposition in this coming game. The hands are... Shake is there, and we see that looked to me like e4. And is that a Sicilian? Wow, Nidorf. Well, I don't believe that Magnus will be interested in going in for. Wow, no, he does. CD. Okay, let's go. Let's see a sharp Nidorf. Oh, I'm enjoying the start of this game. And Magnus plays rook g1. Oh, yes. Oh, I'm happy about this, Peter. We are going to yeah. see a g4 push in the near future. Well, unless Black plays the move h5, which can, uh, I think Anish Giri has played it against Magnus Carlsen. I have been commenting that game from the Champions Chess 2, but no, Niha goes knight c6. That's a surprise. G4 played. And it's a pawn sacrifice, because if you take on d4 first and then take on g4, uh, White doesn't have enough defenders over there, but you're wasting time. You're spending precious time with your pieces, and White will then castle queenside. So it's a pawn sacrifice that is justified. Yes, for sure. And we also see the evaluation bar jumping in White's favors after G4. Black plays G6. Wasn't it something that Magnus himself played against Jan Nepomniachtchi when Jan uh, was playing Rook G1 against Magnus himself? That, that does ring a bell. And, and that means that you've experienced with both colors. And that can be a good thing because you can sort of turn the board around in your head and think about what black strategies are but it also could have caused him some discomfort and then he's like let me try it from the white side so bishop e2 to my eyes is the most natural move for white but there may be a way for black to get out at some moment with the knight getting to f4 but i don't think tactically it works in this position yeah bishop e2 very tempting and magnus has played it 
targeting that knight on h5, that's an awkward piece. Of course, if black can somehow establish a control of the dark squares with knight f4 and e5, it would be great. But I don't see that really uh, realistically happening. Yeah, black could take everything. Then we are getting into territory I'm talking about and then follow it up with e5, landing the knight on f4, but the black pawn on d6 will be a big weakness. And the e5 pawn push is great on one hand because you gain access to f4 as you were talking about, but then it leaves the d6 pawn behind. So we see all of the pieces trade on d4. The rook on h8 is under attack, so e5, here it comes. And look at Magnus. If I'm seeing this correctly, he moved his queen, but... Oh, no, he hasn't moved his queen yet, has he? I thought he grabbed his queen, but it looks like it's still on d4. I'm thinking, do you go to e3, d2, or even b4, just to poke at the b7 yes. pawn? Exactly. Queen e3 was the thematic move, but if Magnus has already paused, it was kind of the clear indication. There it is. On the board, confirmed queen b4, knight f4, long castles. Look at that backward d6 pawn, and not only the pawn, white might also be able to transfer that bishop, bishop c4, bishop b3, protect everything, making sure that you have access to the d5 square, the pawn on d6 is falling. The opening was a huge success for Magnus. I'm glad you told me to look at the pawn on d6, because I don't think it's going to be there very long. The rook and the queen <laughs> are lined up against it. A black castles kingside, white just takes the pawn on d6. King e7 is out of the question. I know it saves your pawn for the moment, but your king is in the center, and all of White's pieces are aiming in that direction. So I would not be brave enough to play a move like that. And if that's the case, extra pawn for White, free hand in the end game. Yes, uh, that's why maybe even if Black does not, and Nihal gives up basically both pawns, but of course White can only take one. Please take on d6, so please take on b7, but let me coordinate my pieces. And Magnus and says, I want none of it. Well, Peter, I hate to take our attention away from this game, especially as it's heating up. We quickly need to go to board two, Jan de Pomsi with the black piece against Daniil Dubov, uh, because the result has been relayed as a draw. But I'm, if I'm not mistaken, when you pull up this board and show everybody what has happened in this game, this is the actual final position of the game. Look at what happened in this one. Look wow, at the but, they played. No, but be careful, because actually there is the certain danger that the arbiter can... Uh forfeit you for this i think it happened in in all times in something like in the 80s when two friends played like this they were given two zeros keep going just i want to show everybody how this game finished just move by move the knights just danced around and then they went to each other's starting square so the game uh, ended up being a draw and because uh, they agreed to it and you can of course, double forfeit the players for not playing, for not trying. But what I don't understand is when people make the Berlin draw, why is that any better by making a forced draw out of the opening? So it's not my ruling to make. I think that I would prefer to see players play. I'm always against the draw offer. I want to see fighting chess. I'm glad we're back to this game on board one between Magus Carlson and Nihal Saren. Yes, exactly. And we were discussing that uh, which pawn Magnus will take, the D6 pawn or the B7 pawn, all of a sudden... Who takes the first pawn? It is black queen takes g5. Did Magnus really blunder this possibility? Now he's very upset. And look at the clock situation. Magnus down to a minute, but Nihal only has 25 seconds. And when you don't take on d6 when you can, you may regret it. So the queen takes on g5. There are discovered checks against the white king, but bishop takes e6. It unleashes the rook against the queen on g5 as well. So knight d3's double check looks very powerful. But I don't think, oh, is this all happening? I don't think it actually wins black material. Yes, well, there will be also queen takes g1. That's, uh, but queen takes g1 doesn't seem good. Yeah, knight takes b4, of course. Yeah, this is correct. Queen takes g1 would have been a blunder since the knight is protecting the rook. All right. What do we see here? <laughs> Mass liquidation and white's pawn structure is better but black gets very quick activity. White stole the B. Where did the B pawn just go? Why did he sacrifice that? Yeah, well, he is relying on some activity. Besides, he only has 25 seconds. He, he does not have a chance to think. But he's about to lose his A pawn as well. And at this stage, the black knight jumps into D4. The A pawn is gone. Maybe we just zoom in on the board because uh, it seems like the relay is falling behind the camera. So if we can just look at the players here, uh, Black has taken a pawn right in front diagonally from the White King. But if we do a quick count, Black only has four pawns remaining. White seems to have five. 
Yeah, and uh, Nihal, down to 12 seconds. What do you do? Oh, he's going passive. I don't love the look of that because he could have taken an F2. He realized not but the quantity of material, but the quality of the outside pass pawn. So he has stopped the A pawn in its tracks. But Peter, I'm liking White's position. Yes, of course. Uh, the A pawn is, is extra. Minus taking his time. He feels that this is very important moment. Yeah, he goes A4. King F7, Nihal at least makes sure that he controls, he activates the king. He needs to get some activity. And Magnus, by the way, down under 10 seconds. So he's frozen. He needs to make a move. I would just play H4 or something like that. He gives a check on B7, and he actually grabs the H7 pawn. Yeah, but now Rook B8 is contemplating Knight B5. Okay, that was the trick. But how long you can hold on to this? Yeah, Rook E2. There is pressure Rook on the B2 pawn. Rook H6 goes after G6. So both sides will have their kings in some danger here. Wow. All the pawns will fall. Rook G takes G6. Check. Exactly. Ooh. Rook F6. Check. Magnus played it with one second left, by the way. Rook takes G6. So he's just giving checks to gain a little bit of time. If he takes the knight on B5, Rook... Oh, he offered a draw. draw. The draw is agreed. And it is a draw by position. So it's not like it was a draw for out of nowhere. Yeah, it was a perpetual check. Wow, what a save by Nihal. And this is what, what can happen. The players discussing the game. Magnus feels that he missed the chance. But his problem was that the rook on g2 was kind of passive. And with 10 seconds on the reach, you always, you, you need your pieces to, to play together. And uh, Nihal saved it. Great defense from Nihal. He didn't have much time, but he was able uh, to stop Magnus's pawn before he could get pushing. And here we have the game between Arjun, Eric Geisy, and Ralph Mamedov. A resignation, I think, from Mamedov there. So Arjun, he is roaring back into the mix here. He wins with the black pieces against the super strong Azeri Grandmaster. Yeah, okay. We have action in the Vashi Lagraf plug on the game. Let me pull that up. up. You said action, and then I think that it's a very close position, but opposite color vicious, Peter. And both have just seconds on their clocks. Oh, look at that maneuver. Rook a5, the pawn b6 was pinned. It's hard for our viewers to see. We understand that. Uh, we can try to bring up the board, but the players really have very little time remaining. So uh, what happens on the board may be less important than what happens on the clock. Yeah, objectively speaking, white has the advantage, but uh, who cares with uh, with six seconds on the board? You have to go with the flow. Oh, well, it looks like it's flowing in white's direction, stealing the d6 pawn. Now the queen on c2 is also open up. Rook takes g6, sacrifices are in the air. Wow. Yes, bishop d5 also. Oh, this is brutal. checkmate. Absolutely brutal on there. Must be an immediate check. Wait, no, he takes a pawn on h5. Does Maxime Vashir le Grau, but he's up several pawns, and there's a resignation, a win for Maxime. Wow. Okay, yeah, that's why you, you shouldn't be going down so low on the clock, because you can start blundering. Big victory for Maxime Vashir le Grau. King safety is paramount in Blitz chess. So Maxime with the big win. And who's still left? Is Artemiev against Shagirov? Are they still going? I, I haven't caught up with all the results. But there's report uh, he is still going as Ryazantsev. Oh, resignation. Yeah, but yeah, he just resigned. He got checkmated by Ryazantsev. Wow, what a story. Ryazantsev on fire. And Ryazantsev is better known as a trainer, but he's proving just like Peter Svidler does that it's not just what you see me do in my day job. When I get that wooden board out, I dust off the pieces, I can still play. Absolutely. No, he's, he's fantastic. Uh, this is a... Yeah, I'm trying to find the game in progress. RTM against Zyugilov. Is that game still on? Uh, that position that you brought up here, it looks like... Well, I, I don't know immediately why it should be game over. In fact, Artemiev wins, but the evaluation bar doesn't seem as impressed as the score would indicate. Yeah, it's only that uh, White has the upper hand, and then who knows what happened here. Clock... Maybe the clock run out. It's so much easier to be white. Probably that was the crucial detail. Talking about Peter Swidler, is his game still in progress against Nara Sunil Dut? No, oh. the game ended in a draw. Okay. Korobov against Denis Machnyov. Another chance. Another 
Dennis, uh, who, ooh, well, so there seems like also a draw. draw. Yeah, We've seen this draw. construction many times today, Peter. We just saw with Magnus and Nihal, just the rook check back and forth. Yes, there is no way to escape. Wow, okay, we see incredible action all around, but I don't think that we have any live action anymore. Okay, well, the results must be in then if the games are all completed. Dennis Maknev's had a great day. He started with the win over Fabiano Caruana, and he has continued uh, to play impressive chess with great results to show for it. So uh, we have just finished the 11th round here at the World Blitz Championship, and you see the results. Magnus Carlsen draws against Nihal Saran. Daniil Dubov and Jan Pamshi, they did a little bit of a four nights tango back to the, each other's starting place. They drew their game. Vladislav Artemiev, he beats Stanon Shigirov. Maxim Vashilagrov gets it done against Pragmanda. Arjun Ergeis, he wins with the black pieces. So does Alexander Ryazantsev against Richard Report. So, Peter, many fighting games there with decisive results. Yes, this is what we love to see. Yeah, that night tango there. Now we might be understanding what that chat was about, yeah, between uh, Daniel Dubo and Jan Yapomnashti before the game. <laughs> well, there are seven players with eight and a half out of 11, including Arjun Aragaisi, Nihal Saran, the youngsters from India, they're making their country proud. And then with eight points, Alexi Sarana, Ria Zantsev, Mamed Jarov, and then there's a bunch trailing with seven and a half. So Mamed Jarov, he's back. He played that really fun game against Sulemanli, and he's saying, I'm not just here to have fun, I'm here to win. Yes, exactly. I think also when you play such a game, that uh, gives you tremendous energy for the rest of the tournament. Yeah, you, you simply feel like, yes, I have succeeded with something special. Let me just enjoy, focus and give it all for the rest of the tournament. Very nice to see Shakriar in his best shape. Yeah, he has had an amazing career. Such improvisation, inspirational chess. And also, I don't really watch so much instructional material, but I did watch his video series on chess.com. So he was going through his best games, some brilliant ones. And he is a very modest person because the way he plays chess, whew, it's ever so sharp and ever so successful. Peter, how is your history against Mama Jarov? Do you find him a difficult opponent? No, no. I, I mean, difficult in the sense that, yes, he was very strong, but I always felt comfortable playing against him. I had quite a good score. I won a couple of games. He, of course, has beaten me as well. It was going back and forth, but uh, he wasn't a nemesis. Yeah, I always felt like, okay, this is a fight of equal terms and we both have our chances. I might have a slight plus score, but uh, all the games were really adventurous and hard fought. It doesn't surprise me. It's why I asked the question. Such a clash of styles. You're telling us that you love the, the technical phase of the game and not trying to uh, bring all the tactics out like Mama Jarv does, at least. Sometimes speculative sacrifices from him. Uh, but Mama Jarv, he's still in contention. He's not just somebody who used to play these brilliant moves. He still does. He showed us that today. So we are going to head to a break. It's the last one of the day because the players will return for the 12th and final round of day one here at the FIDE World Blitz Championship. Don't go anywhere. We have excitement yet to come.
you know about Nobel Prizes? No. Over 50 members of the Athenaeum have won Nobel Prizes. Bertrand Russell, Winston Churchill, Rudyard Kipling, have you heard of? Uh, you're too young, you don't know all these people. Tactically, I'm quite... I'm still quite strong, I can still... Re you give me a position in the paper white to play and win the first move I think of is usually the answer. Um, I think I'm quite good at the Rookan games, but I'm not sure about my weakness. This is, the mo I think, the most expensive re library in the world after the British Museum. Oh. This is the Darwin chair. Have you heard of Charles Darwin? Darwin is chair. No. They play between each other chairs. Can I go up the stairs or am I not allowed? You, do you want to go up the stairs? I've never been up the stairs. Let's go up the stairs. This is high. What's this thing over here? It's, it's an old thing for parcel posts. So if you have to, to send a parcel, you weigh, you put the parcel in one and you put the weights in the other and when it balances, you know the parcel weighs four pounds or um, so many grams. I think the optimal age for playing my first chess would probably be when I'm somewhere around a teenager. Mid thirties is probably the be the people reach their reach their strongest, and um, so at age seventy nine, I'm probably a bit past it. That's <laughs> mm, interesting.
the heart of Central Asia lies the ancient city of Samarkand, Uzbekistan. Landmarked along the Silk Road, the spirit of the past still echoes through its ancient buildings and monuments. But today, modern-day warriors from all corners of the globe descend on this historical place, each vying for four of the most coveted titles in chess. And a handshake, Magnus Carlsen gets the double. Before the calendar's turn, the year closes out with six days of intense battles. He flagged! Brilliant strategies and unparalleled excitement. He's blundered! Magnus has made a new queen and now it's a huge turnaround. Will the experience prevail? Or will a rising star defy expectations? Let the games begin. This is the 2023 FIDE World Rapid and Blitz Championship, and it starts now. We're back. We've got the green light to go ahead with the final round of the World Blitz Day 1 action. It will be the 12th round, and the players, they have been swinging at one another, sometimes missing, but with some decisive effect. I am Robert Hess, alongside me is Grandmaster Peter Lecco. Uh, Peter, we saw some great fights. We saw Nihal Sarn hold Magnus Carlsen. We also saw some... Well, funny behavior between Daniil Dubov and Yana Pomshi as their draw was a bit of a night's tour. Yes, it was funny. It was interesting. It was entertaining. I only don't know what the arbiters are thinking about it. It's one of those decisions that are tough to make on such a stage because they, it is within their power to make a ruling, forfeiting both players for uh, playing in this manner, clearly not trying to play for a win. Uh, we already talked about it. I feel like the Berlin draw players clearly uh, just making those quick draws. Maybe they're making a statement, are Nepo and Dubov. Maybe they just are having a little bit of fun because they were going to make a draw anyway. But no matter what, we do know that there is a pairing for next round between Magnus Carlsen and Yana Pomshi. These two have a very long history with one another. The 2021 World Championship uh, was played between them. So, Jan and Magnus, they're playing. But let's talk about the other matchups first. Peter, of boards two through six, which catch your eye the most? Well, of course, when we are talking about Jan Pomshi against Magnus Carlsen, it's very difficult even to look at the other boards because there is so much tension in that game. But yes, we have incredible matchups. Eli Gaisi against Artyom Yev. I'm also very happy that Artyom is back on the winning track after that loss against Nihal. Nihal Sarin against Daniel Dubov. Mamed Yelv against Maxim Vashielagraf. Okay, that's a big one. And then there's Alexander Ryazantsev against Alexei Sarana. And Alexander Indrich against Jan Chistov Duda. But as you said, I think the attention deservedly on Jan de Pomshi versus Magnus Carlsen because Magnus and Jan, they faced each other many times before, often with fierce battles. There have been quick draws, fire on the board, and sometimes, well, you'll see for yourself. Oof, this one's still anyone's game. Who will recover? Oh my gosh, what, what just happened? The evaluation she... bar has just turned all black. Wow. What? <gasps> what? Queen what? takes G5. He can oh. sacrifice his queen and win on the spot. Oh. Oh. oh, what a oh move. My god. Oh my god, will Magnus Carlsen find this? Queen takes G. We have to show this. That's a checkmate entry. Wow. He doesn't oh, find it. Oh my god, he missed it. That is shocking. Magnus Carlsen missed a checkmate entry. And now Magnus Carlsen, uh, yeah, yeah. look at that. <laughs> he's seen it now. And he's you can see it. Oh, oh my god. Wow. That was in the AI Cup of the Champions Chess Tour. So they're known for their play in Rapid and Blitz. There was a missed checkmate. It happens to the best of us. Uh, but no checkmates can be missed today. If you want to end the day on a positive note and be in first place, Peter, you can't afford to miss tactics like that. Yeah, definitely not. I think over the board, uh, when you feel your opponent, it's also much more easy to sense those moments. Yeah, because automatically you can't have that poker face on. We have seen uh, Jan was trying not to move at all. Only once the mistake has been done by Magnus, then Jan was showing like, okay, come on, how did you not find it? Just to put additional pressure on the opponent. His eyes were wide open and neither player is that 
their respective chair just yet. Jan Napomsi against Magnus Carlsen. There's Daniil Dubov in the background. Maxime Vasher Lagrave as well. And it seems like Maxime and Daniil, they're just chatting about something. There is Jan talking to the legendary Peter Svidler. Yeah, one can have the feeling like they just discussed what was this uh, fuss about? We just played something entertaining. Yeah, it's uh, what's the what's wrong with that? Important that it will not affect their play, yeah, because they need to focus, they need to concentrate. Jan Japomiachi against Magnus Carlsen, that's a big one. It's the matchup of all matchups. It was a world championship match, and it was the last time we saw Magnus Carlsen playing in the world championship. And Jan Japomiachi, he's faced a lot of disappointment. He's such a fantastic player, winning the candidates twice in a row. That is an exceptional feat. But at the World Championship stage, when he lost to Dingley Wren earlier in 2023, it was the utmost heartbreak. Yes, exactly, because it looked like he already has the match in the bag. Uh, game number 12, huge advantage. He's leading the match. If he seals that uh, game, he wins that game, he seals the match, Yeah, and uh, he becomes the new World Champion. Afterwards, after the missing chance on game 14, in the very last game, he again had a chance with the Black Pieces to win and decide that match. So I think that's very hard to forget and to forgive himself. And if I'm remembering correctly, Jan Napomji has been a silver medalist at the World Blitz Championship all the way back in 2014, I want to say. I'll fact check myself in a bit. But Jan Napomji, he's been at the upper echelons of chess. Daniil Dubov, he's talking to Maxime Brasilegrab. Maxime, a former winner of this event back in 2021. And Daniil, he won the World Rapid Championship in 2018. Yeah, what an incredible player players they are. It's uh, it's fantastic to follow their games. And also I'm loving this that despite that so much tension and so much at stake in the very last round, they are still kind of chatting uh, and, and chilling a little bit. Okay, you have to also find the way how you put the tension aside. Yeah? And I feel like in Dubov's case, communicating with someone, socializing is very much part of the strategy. And for Maxime Vashilograv, who faces off against Shakriya Mamajarov, maybe Maxime's like, hey, Daniil, you and Shak both have these crazy styles. We throw pawns forward. Can you help me in this line real quick? Come on, you help Magnus. You are his second. Be my second for a second here and help me out. Yeah, and then uh, Dubov made like this. Okay, I think you can handle it by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I will focus on my own game. Well, Daniil and Maxime have very important matches coming up. Daniil Dubov gets black against Nihal Sarn. There is Jan Napomshi waiting for Magnus Carlsen. These two are very familiar foes. They've sat across from one another uh, too many times to count. And for Jan Napomshi, he wants to make the white pieces count here, Peter, because as the handshake uh, is on our screens, you don't want to waste your opportunities with the white piece against Magnus Carlsen. You definitely can't afford a loss. But maybe he should push a little bit. Yeah, certainly. And it's also the character of Jan to try everything. Certainly he wants to challenge Magnus. And I say that if you already have to face Magnus in this tournament, and you have to if you want something, then uh, having the white pieces is a much better situation. Knowing uh, what Magnus is capable of, getting his type of structures right away with the white pieces, when he has the black uh, side, it's not so easy to get his own will work against the opponent. And Jan Apomshi, I think he's talking to Daniil and maybe Maxime over there. Uh, we saw those two communicating and uh, smiles, laughter. They're having a good time on the stage in Samarkand. And let's get chat involved here. Come on, let us know. Who do you think will win? Type Jan W or Magnus W in chat. Get involved. And Peter, I want you to get involved with this conversation because I have a question for you. You played in a world championship match. How long after the match did you still have preparation in store? So like, does Jan have something ready for Magnus because of their match from two years ago? Well, not necessarily exactly against Magnus, but in general, of course, yeah. Normally when you prepare for a world championship match, you are kind of two years ahead. Yeah, you make sure that you are so deep in the lines that are most probable from when you are building a black repair. Of course, from the white side, it's very tough because you don't know at all which opening your opponent will prepare, especially Magnus Carlsen, who can play any uh, opening. 
but the black repertoire i think that's the the most important and you work tremendously hard to make sure that the opponent is not able to touch you there and here we see magnus seated these two players they're just chatting maybe they're going over that opening theory with knights jumping around the board uh, <laughs> they're just having a little bit of fun and we hope to put that in the past because uh, you know quite frankly it was a bit disappointing that we didn't get a fight between such great players like Jan Pomsi and Daniel Dubov but they'll let the rest of their games uh, speak for their skill and their determination and here Jan Pomsi with the white piece against Magnus Carlsen uh, we hope to see a battle but for Jan, I think he wants it to be a little bit different than back in 2021. Well, the match started very well. Yeah, I feel like uh, Jan was dominating the first couple of games. He had opportunities, but then everything uh, was decided on this marathon historical game number six, yeah, which lasted past midnight. I think it never ever happened in the history of World Championship matches, even not sure if it ever happened in a normal tournament that's something like this, eight hours and plus, and over midnight, the game is still in progress. Well, in Samarkand right now, it's almost 10 p.m., so if we get any more delays, any more appeals, it might go past midnight. But this is the final round of the day for these undoubtedly exhausted players. Uh, they are playing 12 rounds today and then nine more tomorrow. Jan Napamshi, He's looking to the side, but soon the players will shake hands and we will have liftoff in game 12. Yeah, I can't wait to see the action. Will Jan stick to his usual E4 move? Or because lately he has also started playing D4 and then the Catalan. Yeah, there are so many possibilities. Jan is becoming more and more unpredictable. He is, and that's good for these top players. They don't want to be uh, a target. And Maxime Vashilogrov, he's in the background over there, but he's somebody who was criticized in the past for playing the same opening over and over and over again and not diversifying. So for these two, they can play anything. I do think that we will. There it is. There's a handshake. We have lift up, and we have a Karo Khan. Wow, a Karo Khan. So it's going to be Knight F6? Yes, Knight F6. Yeah, I could only imagine Magnus going for this. Jan goes for takes, takes, and bishop e3. Knight a6 mm. played. Wow. Elegant way of developing the knight. <laughs> also teasing. Yeah, please take. Because then suddenly there was a queen a5 check. And you recaptured the, the bishop like this. And that means because of queen a5 check, black can also play bishop f5 here. This is a, a thematic idea that you can try to trade light square bishops because of queen a5 check. Yeah, wow. It's very nice, yeah. Bishop f5, so it's not only queen a5 check against bishop takes a6, but also there is this idea trading the light squared bishops. <laughs> the geometry is beautiful for Magnus Carlsen, but the clock situation, not so great thus far. Yana Pomsi at three minutes, nine seconds. Magnus is the one spending his time, and he's on the move. He plays rook to e8. Yeah, castles bishop g4, so Magnus says, no, no, I don't necessarily want to trade pieces. He's pinning the knight on e2. On the other hand, for example, after h3, where is this bishop going? Okay, Jan does not even want to ask that question. Queen d2, knight c7, c4, occupying the center, making sure that black's knight is unable to reach the beautiful outpost on d5. But what, we talked about this in a game earlier. When you push c4, you could leave the d4 pawn in some trouble. So look at Magnus. He voluntarily takes this knight on e2, and Jan hasn't recaptured back, at least not yet. He takes with the bishop and f5. Here comes the black queen. Yes, uh, this is the whole idea behind that suddenly black has dangerous threats. Eventually, f5, f4, also now already it's a threat because of the hanging bishop on e2. Is white going to play g3, but then also there are ideas like just sacrificing the pawn, destroying white's pawn structure. I know it pained you to say the move g3 and it hurt me as well. I mean, g3, f4 for sure from the black side. You rip open uh, the white king because the bishop on e2 is loose. So for Yana Pamshi, he's now the one spending quite a lot of time. And I think that there have been results in some of the other games. I'll just quickly mention uh, Arjun Aragaisi against Vladislav Artemiev, a draw without a fight. Nihal Saran against Neil Dubov, a draw without a fight. Shakir Mamajara. But hang on, sorry to interrupt. Sorry to interrupt, but it wasn't Bishop takes c5 an option? Wasn't it a oh. wonder, c5? Oh my gosh. It looked like a miss there from 
Magnus Carlsen, bishop takes c5, take on d2, bishop on e2 is loose. Crazy, crazy. It, it's tiredness, everything, but okay, the game is on. We don't have time to analyze that position too much. There's also not much to talk about. It was a one-move tactic, which could have maybe won the game for Magnus. And it also explains some of the quick draws on the other boards. They're exhausted. They're hungry. It's like 10 p.m. in Uzbekistan. So the delays, the appeals, all of this stuff have been unfavorable for the players. But these two are still fighting. So there's a knight on d5, nicely centralized. The bishop on f6 aiming at d4. But as you're pointing out, a bishop for white can plant itself on d6 if black does not take it on f4. Yeah, and what a big miss by Magnus. And now we see that he might be in for some trouble if white plays the move bishop d6. Then white will be able to eliminate that knight on d5 and black is forced to capture with the pawn. That's uh, that's a terrible strategical position. White will have the majority of the queen side. And uh, how do you stop that? If you take on f4, then after queen takes f4, white will play b4, eventually push d4, d5. And again, he has an extra pawn on the queen side. This looks really nice for Jan Napomji. So it was a blunder that turned into a good position. Queen e7 from Magnus giving up the f5 pawn. He likely just wants to play rook d8 next, target this d4 pawn that's actually quite difficult to defend. I really love these kind of Magnus moments. Queen e7, uh, most of us would play g6 to defend the pawn f5. He instead plays queen e7 to connect his rooks and bring it to d8. Yes, but Jan was not interested in picking up that f5 pawn. It was much more important to protect the c5 pawn in order to be able to break Black's construction. d5, it's a wonderful situation to be in. Jan is also up on the clock with, with like 40 seconds. But Magnus will be putting up incredible resistance. After all, it's opposite colored bishop, bishop's position with very good drawing chances. That's true, especially if the material uh, gets off the board. But for now, uh, with obstacle bishops, you can get an attack going. And the black king, it's uh, safe, but the f7 pawn's in under threat. And b5, c6, white can actually create a pass pawn very quickly. I like the alpha zero, though, on the king side. Yes, h5, h4, Magnus is looking for counterplay. It's very important to signal to your opponent that it's not going to be the, uh, it's not going to be a one way traffic. Yeah, I'm creating chances. By playing h2, h4, eventually white will have to watch out for a well-timed f5, f4, breaking the king side pawn structure. And I saw Jan's king go up to g2. And the rook on d1 is very important because if the queen moves from c4, black might play f4 and queen e5 perhaps signals that f4 is an idea just to break down the pawn structure on the king side. Yes, and I think bishop f3 is a nice stabilizing move, making sure that I control everything and this pin and status code unclear situation on the d5 was, was not to Jan's liking. Now he goes b5, goes for your idea. He wants to push c6. Huge trouble, I would say, for Magnus Carlsen. Uh, unless he can get all these pieces off the board, he is worse. I see rook d4 is on our board. And now we see Magnus play it on the camera. Great move. You need to trade off these pieces. Yes, you need to. Yeah, the end game will be unpleasant. Uh, white is completely risk free, but black has very good chances. The big question is queen d4, bishop d4, and afterwards rook c1, c6. You don't want to put uh, the rook to c7, it would be way too passive. I'm guessing that some timely bishop b6 will be the answer. And I think that black can throw in, flick in the move f4 at some moment uh, because black's double pawns aren't helping. But if black can get f4 and uh, try to create a weakness, there will be a chance to go after some of white's pawns. And we see the pawn push forward to c6. A trade will happen. The bishop will slide back to b6. Peter, it looks like Magnus does have things under control now. Yes, exactly. This was the setup I was looking for that how can black be sure that he is safe? This looks like a very drawish construction. And so if Magnus Carlsen can uh, avoid that C pawn pushing any further, he will have everything completely under control. And he's getting his rook active. He is he potentially trying to play rook C5, rook C2 at some moment? Wow, but that's quite quite a risky strategy. I thought that he will just play rook E7. Oh, and isn't F7 dropping? But if F7 is captured, C6 falls. So uh, Magnus giving up F7. He's also ahead on time. Suddenly it's yawn down to 15 seconds. 
Yeah, but uh, what Magnus is doing is very risky. If f7 falls the g6 pawn, clearly bishop takes f7 is met by rook c2. Oh. Be, rook c2, be careful. A ah, draw offer, probably a draw offer with bishop f7. Yeah, because bishop takes f7, rook takes c6, and the position is completely level. We see that both players you know, had some inaccuracies, and they made some mistakes, and for Magnus missing bishop takes c Look at this, they're talking about it. Yes, yeah. c5, bishop takes exactly. c5. Oh, exactly. This is what they are talking about, uh, because the point was that black was starting to play f4 and the bishop on e2 was uh, hanging. So Jan was spending a lot of time. It looked like he find the solution to it, but no, crazy. And that was earlier on in the game, but uh, it was a one move mistake. And when Magnus didn't capitalize, Jan Palm, she was able to get the better side of this draw. So a well fought battle between these two. Uh, these players have such history between them. And let's move on to another game as Magnus Carlsen is being talked to. I, I don't know what about, uh, but uh, Magnus probably just wants to go to a restaurant. It is very late there in Uzbekistan. Yeah, wow, but this is the game is still on. Okay, this is the Duda game on, on our camera. The game that is on the screen, it's uh, the Vyazantsev game. Let me, yeah, this is the game we are dealing with Vyazantsev against Alexei Sadana. And Vyazantsev, he has been a pleasant surprise in this event. And look at this position with the white pieces. The evaluation bar is through the roof, but I would say chances for both given there are separate pass pawns, the E pawn and the B pawn. Yes, but the bishop on d4 is beautifully keeping uh, the b3 pawn in check. Okay, we see repetition of move. Look, this and look, take g7. But now black will have the h pawn. Yes, and we see the h pawn did go up the board. Let's just zoom in on the players because the board is not keeping pace with the quick play that we are seeing on the cameras. So let's zoom in to uh, Alexander and Alexi if we can. And that way we can just focus in on the players as they speed their way to the finish line. Wow, did you see uh, Vyazantsev have picked up the queen? And there you oh, go. He wins. He Fantastic. Gets it done. Alexander Vyazantsev is on an absolute tear right now. Yeah, incredible. Fantastic performance there. What a victory and what a winning streak. I think he must have won his last uh, four or five games. He's won, uh, he has won three in a row, but there was a draw before that and two wins as well. Look at Jan, is that Jan Chisav Duda? He looks very displeased. Uh, we'll try to bring up the live board. Let's remove the board uh, from the side view if we can, just to focus on the players, because that was the incorrect board. I see a queen going up and down, and Jan Chistov Duda has a queen and a bishop versus a lone queen. Yeah, but this is a dead draw. Yeah, this is, uh, of course, the players will keep on with the queen bishop. You have to try, but uh, it's theoretically an easy draw. Because you can't avoid the checks, and if you trade queens, well, then that leaves you without mating material a pause for injish if this black king can somehow run away and the bishop can block there could be some chances well then it's a psychological situation yeah but uh, it does not really affect the outcome of the game it's objectively a dead draw no matter what Ooh. but oh be careful almost lost on time yeah he was not paying attention to the clock there and now there are all these checks he's gonna have to zigzag his way back so king b5 Oh, it goes up to b3 because there was no check on b1. The black queen is on h7. Watch out for that. Yes, the queen is very far away, but controlling that important diagonal. Oh, I thought he blundered his queen, but the bishop can always block. These things get scary. Yes. And did you see the fair play there by uh, Injic? The, the piece fell down, and before pressing the clock, of course, he jadubed it. That's how you like to see. Very nice sportsmanship. Is he running out of checks? He has no more checks. So now suddenly it's black who could try to coordinate. Yeah, but on the other hand, you can keep the dark squares. Yeah, and look at this. The body language of Duda signals that, okay, I'm trying everything, but I can't make progress. There should not be progress if the white queen can give a check and hit the other queen. We can see them trade off. But yeah, the, the dark square control, it's like rook and bishop versus rook, honestly. Well, it's, uh, I think, much easier because there you can lose this one. You, you just can't lose if you are 
careful enough. And the bishop slides forward. The king steps up. Yeah, this is going to be a 50 move rule draw. So for everyone watching, if 50 moves are made without a pawn push or a piece capture, the game well, ends in a draw. It was, I just checked, queen takes a2 was the last move capturing that pawn was move 59. So we are just a couple of moves away, three moves away from 50 moves. On the other hand, the players don't know this. They don't. And actually, the white king it doesn't look the safest that I've ever seen, but it looks like Injic still has things under control. In fact, I think by now, probably it's already the 50 moves. Yes, certainly. So just by feeling, uh, Injic could potentially stop the clock and ask the arbiter that, you know, I'm claiming a draw for 50 moves rule. Maybe he should do it. And you see Duda say, okay, I got nothing here. It shakes his head, but the draw is agreed to. A good hold from Alexander Injic, the Serbian grandmaster. He makes the draw, goes to eight points out of 12 games. Wow. Whew. What a marathon game, what a marathon day. I see tons of draws, but also some victories. Probably let's take a look at the, the results. And you see that Injic and Duda, they're discussing the game still, but on board one, Jan de Pamshi, he made a huge error. It was a tactical blunder. Magnus Carlsen didn't take advantage of it. The game eventually ended in a draw. Arjuner Geisi against Artemiev, Neil Saran against Dubov, uh, Shakar Mamjarov against Maxim Vashilagov. Very short draws. But Alexander Ryazantsev, he gets a win against Alexei Serrano. So Ryazantsev is just full steam ahead. I think he's up to nine points out of 12 games. Incredible stuff from Ryazantsev. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, we just uh, checked out he has five and a half out of his last six games. Stellar performance. Very happy for him. He's a fantastic player and showing it here against the very best in the world. Kudos to him. And Yu Yangi made another draw. So after that appeal, it seems like he was not able to keep up a winning streak. Anish Kiri loses with white to Alexander Shimanov. Meanwhile, a draw between Sindarov and Svidler. Sano Shigirov, he lost to Artemiev. Now he's back with the win over Salem Saleh. Pragnanda loses with White. Volodar Merzin, I don't know how many times I have to say it. This kid is incredible. We talk about Pragnanda, Gukesh, Nihal, rightly so. We're talking about all the youngsters, the Busatarov. But Volodar Merzin, he just has impressed to an endless degree in Uzbekistan. And I have to add that I think in the rapid section, he has also beaten Pragnanda. So if I'm not mistaken, then he's two points. I mean, he's leading 2-0, their direct encounter. And players remember that the next time that they face off. And Bayou de Caruana, I see there on board 16, one with black against Nordirbek Yakubayev. He beat Hans Niemann in the previous round. So Fabi, suddenly he's right back in the swing of things. He's got, I believe, eight points, not on the graphic here because the tie breaks are worse than the others. But in first place, we have Dubov Artemiev, Carlson Napomshi, Maxim Vashilagrov, Nihal Sarin, Arjun Ergaisi, and last but certainly not least, Alexander Ryazantsev, an eight-way tie for first. Wow. It just shows that what an incredible epic day we're going to witness tomorrow. Yeah, Everybody has a chance. Eight players tying for first. So many players, half a point behind. Tons of players, one point behind. Fabi is coming. Wow. I'm looking forward to it. Really fun stuff. And with the players, I, I'm just recognizing that some of them who took these quick draws, Peter, the round tomorrow starts an hour earlier. So not only do they have to go find a place to eat dinner at this late hour, they don't get as much rest because the final day starts an hour sooner. And we see rounds 10 through 11 in the Women's World Blitz and rounds 13 through 21 in the Open. Now it makes even more sense why people would not really want to try so hard to exert themselves anymore. They need to find food and they need to find a good night's rest. Absolutely, because you have to be super sharp, you have to be fit. The most important preparation for tomorrow is get as much sleep as possible. Forget about opening preparation. Just focus on recharging your batteries because you're going to need that. And they played a grueling day, 12 games of blitz chess in the World Blitz Championship. There are nine games played in the Women's World Blitz Championship. It seems like so long ago, but Valentina Gunina, eight and a half out of nine, uh, one of the stars of the day. Peter, any final thoughts on 
what we've seen thus far and what's yet to come tomorrow? <laughs> well, I think tons of action, definitely. Uh, we, we see that uh, everybody is in top shape. Yeah, they are fighting. Magnus did not manage to run away with the tournament. So everybody believes and feels that he has a chance that motivates them. Wow, I, I can't really wait for tomorrow. It, luckily, it starts one hour earlier. Yeah, it's going to be a big challenge also on us. Yeah, we have to wake up even earlier. But for this spectacle, we are ready to do that. Well, I leave it in your trusted hands. You'll be joined by Jan Gustafsson tomorrow. I thank everybody who has tuned in each and every day for every single round, every single move, whether it's a brilliance or a blunder. We appreciate the support. The players, they're giving it their all in most of the games, at least, and they are providing us the entertainment that we all want. So thank you so much, everybody. It's been a long day, a long show. Peter, you're phenomenal. I will talk to you soon, but we say goodbye from Samarkand, Uzbekistan, until tomorrow, one hour earlier start for the final day of the World Miss Championship.